OK, Chair, you are now live. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. and uh, Welcome to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. I'm John Batchelor and I'm chair of the committee. Um, my vice chair, Councillor Halings, is not with us today, um, so I've asked Councillor Thane to act as vice chair for this meeting. Uh, so members, um, can I um, put it to you that you do you agree that this appointment is made by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Anyone against? Agreed. No, no one against. Good. OK, so Councillor Fain that will take um, the role of vice chair. Um, Councillor Fain, would you just confirm that you're with us? Councillor Peter Fain, Shelford Ward here and happy to act as vice chair. Lovely, thank you very much. We're supported along the top table by the following officers. Uh, there's Chris Carter, who's livery manager, strategic sites. Yes, we're doing a few things. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, next is, is Stephen Reed, the senior planning lawyer. Are you with us? Good morning, Chair. Mr. Reed. Thank you. And Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who will be taking the minutes. Yes. Are you with us, mm -hmm. Mr. Senior? Good morning. Right, thank you very much. I will introduce individual case officers when I invite them to speak. So just a few housekeeping announcements. Please make sure that your device is fully charged and switch your cameras and microphones off unless you're invited to do otherwise. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately and your camera. Speak slowly and clearly and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. The normal procedure at planning committee is to take recorded votes and we will continue with this tradition unless there is a clear affirmation. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. I will then ask committee members to speak into the microphone so that their votes is clear both to committee and to those watching the webcast. Members should respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. Committee members present. I will now invite each of you to introduce yourself. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Wait two seconds and say your name and the ward you represent so that your presence may be noted. Please remember to turn off your camera and your microphone after your introductions. So I'm John Batchelor, I'm committee chairman and I'm the member for Linton. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Good morning. Um, I'm Councillor Bradnam from Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Khan. Hello, I'm Councillor Khan. I'm the member for Histon, Inkington and Orchard Park. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Daunton. Uh, Councillor Daunton, I understand you're <laughs> substituting for Councillor Halings. Uh, I am. Um, Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Claire Daunton, uh, Fenderton and Fulborn Ward. Right. Councillor Peter Fane, please. Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dr Hawkins. Uh, Timmy Hawkins, Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ripeth. Judith Ripeth, Milton, Water Beach. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Uh, John, my camera won't turn on, Chairman. Um, Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for Foxton Ward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. 
Heather Williams, I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Nick Wright, member for Caxton and Patworth. Thank you very much. So I can confirm that the meeting is quiet. Um, if at any time members leave the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? So members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation of or debate about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. Um, that includes technical issues, I'm afraid. We have several public speakers today and I would just like to explain how uh, public speaking will work. This meeting is being broadcast live via the, book, the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that they are participating in this meeting. You are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of the images and sound recordings for webcasts and training purposes. You will each have three minutes to address the committee. When you start speaking, we will start the timer. Please ensure you switch the microphone on before you speak. When your time has elapsed, we will ask you to conclude your speech. Once you have finished speaking, we may wish to ask you questions. Please be concise in your response. If there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch by the webcast. Committee members are reminded that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only. And the process for this shall be as follows. I will ask if there are any questions. If you do have questions, please ask to speak uh, via the chat function. The committee can only consider planning reasons for or against the application. The committee cannot consider general observations about the development site. The committee cannot consider comments from public speakers made outside of their allotted speaking time. Therefore, request that those registered do not interrupt outside of their speaking time. Once the committee has heard from all speakers and planning officers, we will form views on the application. The planning committee will then vote. The outcome is decided by a majority vote. And in the event of a tie, I as a chair have casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure that they identify themselves and speak into the microphone so that the vote is understood by committee and those watching the webcast. Members are reminded that they should identify whether they are for, against or abstain when their name is called. Thank you. Now move on to item two, which is apologies. Um, Mr Senior, are there any apologies, please? I just I just had one apology from Councillor Pippa Halings and her substitute is Councillor Claire Daunton. Thank you very much. We then move on to item three, which is declarations of interest. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point. Categories of interest are listed on your agenda. Do we have any declarations of interest? Um, yes, Chair, I've got one. Right, that's Richard Williams. Yeah, um, a non-pecuniary interest in uh, item seven. I'm the ward member. For Whittlesford. Um, I'm also a member of Whittlesford Parish Council, so obviously this application has come up um, in, in that context or in those contexts, but obviously I will be considering the matter afresh today. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Thane, do you have any others? Chair, I just 
chairman as myself. Heather Williams. Oh, Carl and Heather Williams wanted to speak, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Just a non-pecuniary interest. I'm the local member for one of the enforcement um, reports on Arrington, which I request and obviously have been involved in it. But as it's not a decision making report, I think it's not, you know, not something of consequence just for the record. Thank you very much. And was there another one, Councillor? Martin, Martin Kahn. Uh, Councillor Kahn, yeah. please. Yes, I'm the local member for Orchard Park and I have um, been uh, meetings where it's been discussed with the parish council, but, but I'm approaching the matter afresh. Thank you very much for that. Is that everybody? All right, thank you. We therefore move on then to item four. Ken Winterbottom is now joining. Right. Uh, so we are moving on to item four, which are the minutes of three meetings. They are on the 27th of July, 26th of August and the 9th of September. I take those separately. So if I could go to page one, item four. So these are the minutes for Wednesday, the 27th of July, 2020. Are there any issues of accuracy, please? Nope. So uh, can I take it that the, I can sign these minutes as a true record of that meeting? Is anyone against that? No, we're all happy with that, are we? Uh, there is some background noise on the line. Could everybody who is online please make sure that their microphone is muted? Thank you. We move on to the next set of uh, minutes, which is the minutes for Wednesday, the 26th of August 2020. Um, any issues of accuracy on these minutes, please? Yes, Chair. Yes, Councillor. Uh, I am recorded as having abstained in relation to item five on page seven. I actually voted against. Right. OK, I'm sure that will be noted then. Thank you. Any other points of accuracy on these minutes? No, in that case. Chair yes. Chairman, just to say, as I wasn't present at the meeting, I can't, is I now can't comment the accuracy and therefore will be abstaining. Right, thank you very much. Uh, that is noted. Chair, it's Councillor Ripeth here. The same for me, I wasn't present, so I'll be abstaining. Thank you very much. OK, with, the, with those provisos, um, can I sign these as a true record of this meeting? Is anyone against that? No? OK, so the minutes of the 26 are agreed. We move on to the third set of minutes, which are for Wednesday, the 9th of September 2020. Uh, any matters of accuracy on these, please? Yes, Chairman. Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam, yes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a really minor thing on item seven, um, which was Cottenham on page 16 of our agenda pack, um, sort of in the last full line of the paragraph there, it said the motion GAD been approved, and I'm sure it's supposed to say the motion had been approved with an H. Yeah, OK, thank you very much for that. Anything else, members? No, are you there happy that I sign these as a true record of that meeting? Anything Agreed. Against? Agreed. No one against? No, good. OK, so we have agreed those minutes and we move on to the substance of today's meeting. We're now on agenda five. That's on page 19 of your agenda papers. Um, this is application S4207-19 RM, Reserve Matters. It's for land east of Rampton Road of Cotman. The proposal is to uh, approval of matters reserved for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following outline planning permission S2876-16-R. 
Hotel for a residential is now joining comprising 154 dwellings including access the applicant is uh, the company this land the key material considerations will be outlined by the presenting officer um, this is a departure um, and the application is brought to committee because the officer recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of the Tottenham Parish Council. So, as I say, the officer recommendation is approval. The presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Uh, Mr. Sexton, would you do your presentation, please? Thank you. Thank you. Very good morning. Just one quick point of uh, clarification before I begin the presentation. On the website where the committee agenda is published, um, the document that's published is Appendix 2, Cotton Parish Council, oh, Council Comments, in brackets, August 2020, should say Appendix 2, Cotton Parish Council, in brackets, September 20. When you open the document, you do get the document you're supposed to. It's purely the name of the document that is incorrect. And in conversations with Ian, if we were to fix that, we would have had to take the entire committee agenda down. So the document in itself is fine. It's just so it's on record there is a typo in that. Thank you, I'm sure that's noted. Thank you. Right. Chair, if you could confirm you can see a presentation on screen, please. I can. Thank Excellent. You. Yes, so this is a reserved matters application for appearance, landscaping and layout and scale following an outline plan commission for a residential development comprising 154 dwellings, including access, at land northeast of Brampton Road, Cottenham. Um, very important to start off with the fact that Cottenham has a neighbourhood plan. The neighbourhood plan was due to proceed to referendum on the 26th of March uh, 2020. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the referendum was suspended and government guidance is that no more, no neighbourhood plan referendums can take place before May 2021. Um, but uh, National Planning Policy Guidance Practice Guidance, paragraph 107, has been released in response to the COVID pandemic, it does make it clear that where a local planning authority has issued its decision statement detailing its intention to send a neighbourhood plan to referendum, which is the case for Cotton Neighbourhood Plan, uh, then significant weights in decision making can be given to that neighbourhood plan as far as it is material to the application. So on this application, significant weight is given to the Cotton Neighbourhood Plan. Within the Neighbourhood Plan, there are a, a range of policies. The, the particular ones that are relevant to this application as set out in the report and on the slide in front of you um, are landscape character, heritage assets, vintage character, local green space, development framework, large site design, recreation, sports hub and sports facilities. Uh, also important to know that Cottenham has a village design statement SPD uh, adopted in 2007. The neighbourhood plan draws heavily on that village design statement and the policies and guidance within that document and says in paragraph 1.5 that the design principles and some Cottenham specific policies have been retained or adapted within the neighbourhood plan from the village design statements. They very much work hand in hand, both given significant weight for the application. So this is the application site for context. We're on the sort of western edge of Cottenham, heading out to, to Rampton. Um, site outlined in red. As a bit of background, so outline planning application for 154 dwellings, including access, was allowed at appeal on the 10th of May 2018. As Part of that outline permission, there were three conditions which are relevant to the Reserve Matters application in that the Reserve Matters application needed to be supported by a precautionary working methodology for protected species um, that has been submitted and found acceptable by the Ecology Officer as part of the application. Condition six required details of, of housing mix, which has been supplied and has been found to accord with adopted policy and that in the event, condition seven, in the event that any residential development was to be provided on land that's currently laid out as sports, as playing pitches, the proposal would be required to provide an equivalent uh, area within the development site. But 
as we'll come on to the applicant, the residential element of the development does not encroach onto existing recreation land, so condition seven is not triggered. Very briefly to highlight to members, there are a lot of details reserved by condition on the outline consent, 24 pre-commencement conditions in total, which include sort of standard traffic management plan, uh, drainage conditions, contamination conditions. It also reserves details of boundary treatment and hard and soft landscaping, although elements of that have been provided in support of the reserve matters application. Uh, so since the outline application was granted, there has been a non-material amendment application made to the outline application to add the words up to into the description. Uh, it's more common that an outline plan commission seeks up to a certain number of dwellings, whereas the original one actually said comprising 54 dwellings. So this non-material amendment was approved um, and it does give flexibility, as we'll come on to, um, that you can go up to 154 dwellings. The reserve matters application as amended actually seeks consent for 147 dwellings, but it does fall within the established principle um, of the development of the site. Part of the reason why it seeks a slightly reduced number of residential properties um, is because the red line boundary for the reserve matters application is approximately two hectares smaller than the outline red line boundary. This is best illustrated from this extract from the design and access statement. Um, it details in paragraph 2.4 um, that Cambridgeshire County Council decided to retain some of the land to be used for future school expansion. The Cotton Primary School is here. Appreciate it's not particularly well shown on uh, clear on the map. Um, so the county is not um, through the original applicants have not put forward this all the land to school at outline stage as part of the reserve matters application. So the area in blue was part of the outline application. It is not part of the reserve matters application. Uh, just for a brief context of the area, uh, an aerial photograph within the red line boundary of the application, you have this area here of, of Les King Wood, which is obviously a, a, a wooded area. It is designated as a local green space within the Cotton neighbourhood plan. Um, you have the, the recreation, existing recreation space here and then open land forming the rest of the site. Uh, very Briefly, just some context for any members who've not had the benefit of visiting the site. The site is is relatively flat, although the land does slope down as you go north towards Leskin Wood. So these photos are looking across the existing development on Ramsden Road, across the existing recreation ground, um, again existing recreation ground, and then view from the recreation ground towards Leskin Wood. Uh, Again, just walking through Lairs King Wood, there are some informal footways. This is standing on the edge of Lairs King Wood, so you get the impression here that land does slope down as you go north on the site. And then just walking back along Rampton Road here, you can see ground levels falling uh, and just another view across the site. So this is the site plan for the reserved matters application. Uh, 147 dwellings are proposed, 88 of which are market properties, 59 of which are affordable properties, which is the 40% requirement. Um, it's, a, it's a very spacious layout. It's approximately sort of 17 dwellings per hectare. When you look at the developable area of the site, you'll note that there's no development or encroachment into Les King Wood. Um, and in, in response, very much in response to a neighbourhood plan policy, um, there's a lot of permeability into Les King Wood to better enhance that area of, of public space, which is obviously currently present in the village, but it's somewhat detached from the existing residential development. So this scheme does look to respond positively to how it relates to Les King Wood. All of the properties along the northern boundary of the site front on to Les King Wood as well, right? So you don't have any sort of harsh boundary treatments of the rear of properties. So positive design response in that respect. Uh, these are just some slightly more zoomed in versions of the uh, master plan, so you can see a bit more context. There's obviously a small section of dwellings here which sit against the existing properties along Rampton Road. Um, should say all of the properties meet or exceed residential space standards, apart from about half a dozen. Um, the only reason they don't comply is because they're lacking slightly in internal uh, storage space. It's not a policy requirement 
uh, secured at outline stage. So these properties don't have to comply uh, with um, space standards, but, but they do really on the whole. Um, also, the amount of garden space uh, is very generous. As you can see on these sites, each property has a, a very generous amount of amenity space that would meet or exceed the level set out by the council's district design guide. And the back to back distances would also meet or exceed uh, the council's village design uh, guidance. So for the future occupiers, very generous uh, development that's been put forward. And again, here you can just see the relationship with Lesking Wood. Um, the additional permeability into the wood, uh, which is a positive design response. Uh, I'm sure we'll come to this within the debate, so I don't want to touch on it too much now, but there are 10 house types proposed across the development. They are spread across the development, and again, that's a positive design response to the neighbourhood plan seeking to have variation in, in design and architecture, so you don't have repetitive rows of dwellings. Um, where you do get perhaps five dwellings of the same type in one row, there's an adjustment to the material palette, which is again responding to the design, uh, the neighbourhood plan, in terms of not having that that repetition. The yeah, there are affordable houses obviously within the site. They are distributed uh, well throughout the site in clusters um, of uh, sort of four to twelve, which is broadly in line with the policy uh, adopted. Uh, Excuse me, affordable housing SPD. It is supported by our uh, affordable housing team and they are obviously an integral part of the site, finished to the same design and architectural standards. So we are supportive of, of how the, the tenure types and the, the layout of affordable housing has been provided. In terms of scale and appearance, everything is sort of two story properties. Um, some of the properties are relatively tall. They do range from 8.5 metres to about 10.1 metres in ridge height. The reason for that slightly higher ridge than the existing development along Rampton Road is again the development has picked up on the Cottenham Village design statement, which states that there are uh, sort of steeply pitched roofs is is part uh, a, a design feature within the village. So the properties don't tend to have uh, residential accommod accommodation in the roof space, but they do have steep rich, uh, pitched roofs in response to the design statement. So that's why they are slightly taller than they are two-storey properties. Here you can see on uh, street scene four, which is the looking across the field towards the four, uh, the road behind Rampton Road, where you do have these five properties at the same. Um, they have changed the material and again that's responsive to the neighbourhood plan requirements. Uh, that just gives you an idea of the scale and the subtle variations as well in terms of the scale of each house type as well, just to provide further um, variations in design terms. Uh, these are uh, just an example floor plans, which you would have seen in the uh, drawings pack that was circulated. Um, I've already touched on it, but they do all meet or exceed national space standards, except for half a dozen where they're slightly lacking on internal uh, storage space. Um, and again, it's just for really to show the the scale and the, the variation in design across the house types. I won't go through all 10 as part of this presentation, but it's just to give members a, a feel for the very architectural variation. Um, this is an example of a maisonette, uh, just to highlight that there is a, <clears throat> every each maisonette has a communal garden space and all first floor maisonettes also have a private balcony space. So again, the level of external amenity space afforded to each unit is either meets or exceeds the council's design guide, and obviously that's very important in light of the impact that, that COVID has had on such matters. And although landscaping is reserved by condition, there is a lot of detail um, about how the landscaping would take place within the site. There is a lot of additional tree planting, as you can see. This includes tree planting within uh, private garden spaces. That is something that is mentioned in the neighbourhood plan as a requirement. So again, the, the layout and the planting is responsive to, to that particular part of the neighbourhood plan policy. Um, there is, um, I'm sure it will come up again in a debate, there is some existing hedgerows that will be lost within the site. That is in part because of the visibility space along the front of the site. But the biodiversity documents submitted in support of this application does detail that although about 250 metres of hedgerow um, is lost. Um, there's an excess of 300 metres of hedgerows being put in by this development uh, comprising five or more native species. So there will be an overall 
net gain in, in terms of hedge planting and biodiversity. Uh, these next three slides are just the C some CGI images of the development. This is the northern entrance to the site, which if I just jump back a slide is this, this entrance here. So you can see dwellings here are set back from the, the public highway um, and the relatively spacious layouts, varying materials and architectural language throughout the site, again responsive to neighbourhood plan policies. This is, I suppose, going in through that northern entrance and turning the corner, you've got a view through to the, the leap, uh, which I should have mentioned, sorry, earlier is, is central at the heart of this development. And then a third CGI, just looking across the leap. Again, the variation in materials and architectural language and detail, and you can see on the house types to create that, uh, that, that different character and variation and um, so ease of movement through through the site, through the leap, very much at the heart. Lots of good passive surveillance over the uh, the leap area and throughout the site as a whole. Um, there is, as set out in the report, there is one element of the proposal, or one neighbourhood plan policy where the proposed development certainly does conflict with the requirements of the policy. That is policy COH1 landscape character, which looks at several vistas around the village, which are obviously important views from around the village to various um, site points in and around the village. The, so the policy says, as appropriate to their scale and location, development proposal should seek to take account of the following vistas. In this instance, it's Vista 2 that's the important vista, and that is a view from Rampton Road to All Saints Church, which is obviously a listed church. It's about 1.8 kilometres from here. And by superimposing the application site, you can see how the vista of the, the vista cuts through the development. Um, members will note in Appendix 4 for this report, there is a bit of background to Vista 2 in the in an earlier version of the Cotton Neighbourhood Plan. The vista was shown to be here on the northeastern edge of the site. Outline planning consent was granted in May 2018, um, so there wouldn't have been necessarily a conflict at that point. Then the June 2018 draft of the neighbourhood plan moved the vista to Rampton Road. So this vista point actually appeared after the outline consent was granted. That's detailed in Appendix 4. Um, but nonetheless, the referendum version of the plan, which we're attaching obviously significant weight to, we do have to acknowledge that it does conflict with this policy. Um, to try and show members again who have not been to site, this is a photograph taken from Rampton Road from roughly the where the vista point is shown on the map across to All Saints Church. Um, previously it's not particularly clear on the photo, it wasn't that much clearer on site to be honest, but the church uh, church tower is, is here. Um, if I jump forward, that's a slightly zoomed in version, so you can see the view of the church, a very limited view of the church, um, but nonetheless it is there, that is what the policy is, is referring to. Um, so quite a long presentation and there's probably a lot of points to cover in the debate so I haven't gone into each neighbourhood plan detail too much but obviously the key material considerations are compliance with the outline plan commission. Um, officers are satisfied that any requirements from the outline plan commission um, have been met within the reserve mass application. Housing provision including affordable housing as, as touched on it meets the mix the affordable housing tenure and distribution is acceptable. Open space provision is in line with the requirements of the 106 agreement, so we're also satisfied in, in that terms. Then it's the reserve matters, details of layout, scale, appearance and landscaping. I think on the whole and on balance, officers are satisfied that it, it does comply with the neighbourhood plan, with the obvious exception of the VISTA, and the report does acknowledge that it would conflict with that policy. Um, and then other matters of, of biodiversity, um, largely reserved by condition, flood risk and drainage. Obviously, there's a, a level of information that comes in with this application and the drainage information that has been submitted is supported by the technical consultees, although those details are reserved by condition. Um, highway safety, highways are happy with the, the layout of the site in highway safety terms. Each property benefits from minimum requirements for parking. Uh, residential immunity, as mentioned, in terms of the future occupiers of the development, officers consider this to be very high end in terms of the amount of internal and external space that's provided to each unit, and that's a, a big positive to the scheme, particularly as 
the outline consent didn't secure residential space standards, so a developer doesn't have to bring those forward, but have done in this instance. Um, heritage assets, again, also satisfy that, that heritage is accept, uh, any impact on heritage is acceptable. The nearest listed building is, is quite a distance away of a water tower to the south. Um, and I think that is it for me. I expect there'll be some, some questions. So it's quite a long presentation. Chairman, we have questions right, or clarifications from firstly, Councillor Bradnam. OK, thank you, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, first of all, sorry, I do want to ask a matter of clarification, but firstly, uh, I, for Mr Senior and for the members of the committee, I need to make a declaration, and that is because I am um, probably the person in uh, itemised uh, by the parish councillors having a conflict, a potential conflict of interest in that I am also a county councillor and thus um, the uh, suggestion is I might be swayed by the needs of this land uh, as well as being part of this committee uh, and thus might be swayed by the needs uh, to consider the council's five year housing land supply. And I'd just like to make it absolutely clear that as in all other situations, um, I am not uh, swayed in any of those directions and I come to this matter completely afresh. And I would also say that I take that accusation um, with some uh, offence that that should be suggested. However, that being said, there are All matters right. of clarification. Just before we go on, let's make sure that that is being properly noted and uh, uh, there's no legal issues that uh, I need to pursue. So uh, if I'm not hearing from my advisors, that, that appears to be fine, then Councillor Bradnam. So if you'd Thank like you to move on to your clarification, please. That was addressed under um, by officers on paragraphs 299, 300 of the agenda. Um, so there are lots and lots of things to be discussed in this application, but the first one I just wanted to clarify with the officer uh, is the fundamental principle of what was approved at outline and what has now been submitted as reserved matters. And uh, in paragraph um, 270 on page 70, um, hang on, that's not the one, sorry. It's page, um, sorry, forgive me. It's paragraph 303 on page 74, uh, where it says that the illustrative master plan was not listed as an approved document as part of the outline consent and therefore carries no weight. Furthermore, the footpath and cycleway connection referenced is outside the red line boundary for the development and its provision was not secured by condition or through the section 106. And yet, Chairman, I wanted to clarify through you with the officers how come, if that is the case, how come um, the matters that were inherent in the master plan were considered by the um, inspection officer at appeal? In other words, if the inspection officer at the planning inspector at appeal took the matters in the illustrative master plan into account, how is it that we are not allowed to? OK, thank you for that. We'll get some clarification. Mr. Yeah, Sexton. I will, thank you, Chair. I'll share a copy of the Illustrative Master Plan to, to help with these discussions. Um, yeah, so this is the Master Plan, this Illustrative Master Plan that was submitted at outline stage. And obviously it's quite common that an outline planning application will have an Illustrative Master Plan to show that the site is capable of accommodating the level of development proposed. Um, so this You'll see it says on the title it's an illustrative master plan. It wasn't listed as an approved document as part of the appeal decision, so it doesn't it doesn't carry forward in that respect. Um, so the footpath, and I expect we'll come on to this, I think when local members speak, um, is this footpath shown here, uh, connecting up to this end of the, the village uh, development. And obviously that would provide the potential for residents here to walk along the path through and, you know, uh, this means of access here alongside the primary school and into the village. 
which is obviously preferable to having to walk through the development site and along Rampton Road. Um, members will note that part of that path is outside of the red line boundary. Um, the requirement for that path was not secured by condition. It was not secured within the section 106 agreement. And as I said, this isn't a listed, uh, uh, listed as an approved plan. So while the, inspe the inspector could have looked at this, um, it hasn't been secured at outline stage. The footpath hasn't been secured. So we can't ask for it now at reserve matters stage as part of the planning application. Any footpath provision, which the develop the layout doesn't preclude the possibility of that coming forward because it's very open and permeable on, on the boundaries here. Um, but it, it, to say it wasn't an approved plan, it's not listed as a condition and it's not within the 106 associated to the outline application. So we can't insist on that path as part of the reserve matters stage. So, Chairman, if I may just come back to clarify. Very quickly, please. Thank you. My concern, thank you very much, Mr Sexton. My concern was partly that, but also partly to do with the complete with the loss of the land area between the outline and the reserve matter because um, I, I think I'm right in saying with a little bit of a back of a fag packet calculation uh, that if you take out the area of Les King Wood uh, and then take out and, and look at the um, the density between the outline application and the reserved matter application, effectively the density is doubled on the remaining area with this new application. Now surely the whole point of Sorry, the... I'm, going to, I'm going to stop you there, uh, Councillor Breton. Go to page 38, uh, item 53, and the density is explained entirely there. Even with these changes, the density is only 24. Um. Yeah, Chair, just under the report, yeah, paragraphs um, obviously 80, 87 through to uh, 95 deal with density and it does look at, obviously it acknowledges that Les King Wood can't be counted as part of the developable area, so there is a calculation for both the reserve matters area and the original outline area um, and then the developer in their design access statement actually did a density calculation, excluding Lesking Wood, excluding areas of open space, yes. and just looking at the developable area, and it, it comes in at sort of 22 to 24 dwellings. So it is still below the requirements of local plan policy and neighbourhood plan policy, um, even with the two hectares that has not been carried forward. But that, yes. that's all set out in the report. That, sorry, forgive me. What I wanted to clarify was that the inspector approved the quantum of development based on the de based on the density at the time. So are, are we simply saying that that density was allowed through the outline, but this greater density is still acceptable because it's within our um, uh, density calculations normally? Uh, so yeah, obviously reducing the red line area at reserve matter stage makes it a bit more difficult to bring the same number of dwellings forward. And obviously part of the response to that is we are looking at 147 properties rather than 154. But nonetheless, the, the density is still falls well below the, sort of the average requirements. Um, obviously there is, is now allow exiting. There is allowance within the policy to have a lower density that's responsive to the character of the area. So with this being an edge of village location, obviously officers are happy that a, a lower density is suitable in this instance, so it would accord with policy requirements notwithstanding the changes that have been made since since outline stage. Next we have Councillor Heather Williams. Right, Councillor Williams please. Thank you Chairman. Um, just a couple of matters of clarification through yourself. Um, the cycling, so I can see we've got an objection from CamCycle and it's also been raised by Councillor Tim Wotherspoon. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Mr Sexton could elaborate on, on that. Um, mm -hmm. While Councillor Bradnam raised about the County Council, it's also raised about the five year land supply deficiencies and correcting and pressures and things like that. So we could just have some advice as, as members that we can um, to hopefully reassure public on that, that we are in a position where we are looking at this as we have a five year land supply and therefore that won't be 
applying pressure to us. Um, and the drainage concerns, we seem to have a bit of a conflict between the lead um, planning, sorry, the lead flooding authority and the old uh, water drainage board. So just some clarification around those. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, so in terms of the comments that have been raised by Cam Seigel and Councillor Wotherspoon, the concerns that have been relayed, uh, raised relate to matters of access and the visibility displays. Um, those details were or have already been approved and they were secured as part of the outline stage and the reserve matters layout follows those approved details. I think the concern that's been raised particularly by Council Wotherspoon is that there has been some guidance that has come in since the granting of the outline permission um, you know, as, as these things evolve over time but because you know, they're, they're already fixed um, we can't alter those so the visibility displays that have been provided for, for vehicle access and uh, cycle access have already been considered are considered to be acceptable um, so I don't know the particular details but there's there is this new guidance note which would perhaps alter those if we were looking at an outline application today we might be looking at a slightly different arrangement but those details have already been secured so we can't address that as part of this application um, in terms of five-year land supply and I'm sure colleagues will chip in if necessary uh, Yes, Council to my knowledge has got a five year land supply. This is a site that is counted towards five year land supply. Um, obviously, if members resolve to approve the application, then that's the reserve matters ticked for 147 dwellings. If matters, if members resolve to refuse the application, um, the developer would obviously have the opportunity to appeal that decision. Um, I think it's also important to note that because of COVID, the some of the guidance around the lifetime of planning permissions does say that any deadline for the submission of applications for reserve matters, which would have expired between 23rd of March 2020 and 31st of December 2020 is extended to May 2021. So had it not been for COVID, this would have been the only reserve matters application that the developer could make. Um, but because of the government guidance around the impact of COVID, um, as well as appeal to so my understanding is the applicant would have the opportunity to make a second reserve mass application if required. If that's helpful on the five year land supply point. Um, drainage, I perhaps should have mentioned at the beginning, I've, I've invited Hilary Ellis from the Lead Local Flood Authority to attend today because I expected drainage would come up and members do enjoy asking me drainage questions, so I have got some technical help this time. Um, there. Yes, so the RFA are satisfied. The lower drainage rate, and I'll try and explain this, but perhaps Hillary can add to it, um, that was requested by the drainage board has been secured. The drainage then board have, the have not responded to is the now joining. consultation. Sorry, the, the, the drainage board have not responded to the latest round of consultation on the amended drainage information, which would address their objection. But I don't know if, if we, if it's worth Hillary stepping in at this point to address the technicalities of, of that point. Uh, I'm sure it's going to come up later, Mr. Sexton. Okay. So uh, I think we'll just deal with the clarifications. But could you actually, um, just to be very clear about the five year land supply, if there were 147 houses did not go ahead, we would still have a five year land supply, as I understand it. I I, to be honest, I can't confirm that. All I can confirm that is if members were minded to refuse the application, the developer would have the opportunity to appeal and they'd also have the opportunity to submit another reserve matters application. So the refusal of a reserve matters today wouldn't necessarily remove 147 dwellings from our supply at this point in time, but uh, okay. Got can't be any further than that, I'm afraid. All right. Shall we Next we have Councillor Martin come. Sorry. I was just going back to Councillor Williams to check if uh, it would answer the her questions. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the answer has been very much appreciated and I'll see if there's anything else that comes across my mind later on. Yes, I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Councillor Thane, do we have another speaker? Councillor Martin Khan next. Hello. Um, my okay. question is about uh -huh. the access to the uh, primary school, um, which is uh, in the, on the original, I know it's not binding. The um, desired master plan, uh, elicited master plan, showed a, a, 
a larger road going right through uh, and the, the primary potential primary school site being at the far end of the uh, beyond the development towards the church direction uh, and the new uh, proposal shows a shorter area and access to a different uh, is it suggested is it firmly suggested that if the primary school was built that it would be accessed directly by onto the land adjoining the stub as you show um or is it likely that uh, that the new road will be built right across the playing fields to the far end have you got any indication of how that would do and you, you uh, in the report you uh, imply that this is not something that one could take into account uh, is there any degree to which uh, um, can you confirm this? Can you illustrate it in more detail whether that is a matter? Because that's one matter that I can uh, Yes, thank you, Councillor. I'm just trying to open a document to illustrate the point, but while I'm doing that, so yeah, the primary school access, and I'm sure we will come on to this in the debate, particularly when the parish council and, and members have spoken. There are potential plans to expand the primary school, and as part of that, the new access would potentially stem from this site. Um, so this, this, let me share the layout plan. Um, I'm operating on a slightly reduced number of screens today, so I will be a bit slower jumping around than, than normal. Hopefully members can now see the uh, the layout plan for the site. Yes, so we can see it. So yeah, primary school is is here. Um, and the should an expansion come forward and should a new access come forward, um, it's likely to be served by this uh, road here. Um, the exact route's not necessarily known, but the illustrative plan within the design and access statement and I believe on the outline plan do sort of show the potential for a road across the recreation ground which obviously brings about its own issues in terms of the usability of that space but and while I fully appreciate the parish council's point of view it is an area of land outside of the red line boundary for this application so the, the layout of this application simply facilitates for the potential access which may or may not come forward which is why I think it'd be very difficult for members to I don't think we could refuse a, this planning application on the basis of something that may or may not come forward outside of the red line boundary all this development does is facilitate that potential access and has designed the road to an adoptable potentially an adoptable standard should that become necessary um, but certainly illustrative plans that are within this information that's come forward as the reserve matters and outline stage do sort of show a potential link across the recreation ground but it's it's outside of the red line site and it's not a known element at this time of considering this application so it, it may well come forward but equally it, it, it may not right just to be clear there so it's not material to this application and we have um, I, Roberts. certainly don't believe we could refuse an application on that, that basis i'm sure if if that's not correct i'm sure stephen reed would step in and say otherwise but right. I, no, I don't think he's suggesting we're refusing it at the moment Thank no, you. no, I'm just. <laughs> OK, OK, I think we have Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I don't want to labour the five year land supply, but I'm going to have to say something here and ask some questions because I'm not uh, entirely happy in my own mind uh, with the answer that's just been given to Councillor Heather Williams question, which was, um, have we definitely got a five year land supply if we don't go ahead with this? Because uh, at uh, page 21, paragraph 17, we actually state, furthermore, the development of the site would result in the provision of 147 dwellings towards the council's five-year housing land supply. Now, I am really concerned because it's not just this application today, but it's also mentioned um, on another one later into the, uh, into the meeting, this same thing. Now, we are here we are, we have officers flagging up to members in there to remind us about the five-year land supply. Now, um, I think it's either time that we have that properly explained to us or it didn't appear on agendas in, in the future. Um, exactly what, it, it, then I'll quickly go down to page 26, which is the, uh, the Parish Council's comments and that 
first paragraph, and I don't think it's accusing, accusing us of, of things, I think it's just pointing out their concerns to get clarity of uh, if there is conflict of interest. And I have to say, it does seem to me that um, some of the two uh, hatted members on the committee today um, may actually fall foul of, of it, given what we said at paragraph 17 about the five year land supply. And I need to know, I think maybe from Mr. Reid, given what the parish council are saying as its concerns, if we were to approve this today, are we likely um, to get this thrown back at us after judicial review? I mean, you know, um, the rules about standing up and declaring interest, pecuniary or non, are pretty strong and straightforward. I'd like it because I'm going to have to think about it later in the day as well. Yeah. Okay, let, let's get the answer to that. Then. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sexton, I think you've already given your yeah. answer. So I, I'm going to ask Mr. Carter a few, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, I can confirm the council does have a five year land supply. Uh, this uh, site contributes towards the council's five year land supply. And as members will know, the council uh, has a requirement upon it to maintain a five year land supply that's sat, set out in, in national planning policy framework guidance uh, and policy. So it's important that we consider the delivery of new homes in the context of this and any other planning application uh, that, that proposes to deliver new homes. But I can confirm we do have a five year land supply. Uh, if this application were to be uh, refused for any reason, uh, the council would maintain a five year land supply. But of course, that's an evolving picture that takes into account a, a wide number of other sites across the district. Uh, but uh, we do have a five year land supply. This would contribute towards it. So that is a uh, uh, the delivery of new homes is a material consideration for the committee uh, as part of the discussion today. Sorry, Chairman, but that is. No, hang, no, hang on, let me deal with this. That isn't the question. Uh, and if we could deal with the um, the legal question of interests. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I will ask Mr. Reid to come in on that, but uh, okay. certainly in my experience, it's not unusual to have members who have twin hats, so-called, uh, and uh, that they are uh, perfectly able to determine applications uh, in these circumstances. But perhaps you may like to hear from Mr. Reid on that as well. Yes, please. Could I just ask Mr. Carter to clarify what he means by twin or, or councillor roberts when they say twin hats uh well we have councillors uh, good good morning mr reed uh, we have councillors who are county councillors and, and i'm pointing out to you mr reed at page um at page 26 that first top paragraph which is the comment and concerns of the of the parish council that they lay it out there to them and i would say that there are also uh, district councillors on this committee who are very much um, at the forefront of the five year land supply and it's very important to um, the particular district councillors um, that um, applications wherever, um, uh, albeit within obviously a, a agreed policies and things, get through. And I'm just wondering you know, why more people are actually a little bit more concerned about their positions. All right, thank you. Mr. Reid. Uh, Chair, if I may, um, we've heard from Councillor uh, Bradnam. You may wish to invite other members who are said to have twin hats to comment on uh, whether they're coming to the matter afresh and looking at the application on its merits. I don't think any there is any need for any additional legal comment. All right, thank you very much. So uh, it's up to members to make declarations of interest if they f feel that uh, it is necessary. Uh, Councillor Bradnam has already made her position clear. OK, Thanks. thank you very much. Do we have uh -huh. further speakers, please? Councillor Richard Williams would like thank to speak. Thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams, please. And thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I know Councillor Bradnam has already discussed this, but I, I just want to go back to this point about the difference between the uh, red line site at, 
uh, at outline stage and, and, and the site now and, and just get a bit, bit of further clarification that we are actually still dealing with the same application because there is an argument to be made and, and the parish council makes the argument i think that this is a different application it has a different outline third parties would have commented on the initial application on the basis that the area i put forward for development was going to be developed now the landowner is proposing to hold back a portion of that site for a different use um and and i just want some clarification you know, because my understanding is that once you get an outline applica planning application, the developer commits to developing um, the area that they were given permission for. And that seems to have changed here. So can I just get a bit of clarification that this does still actually fall within outline, um, it's the outline planning application. It's not actually a new application. OK, thank you. Mr Sexton, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I mean, reserve master applications, it's not uncommon, I suppose, that you could secure an outline planning permission and then you come forward in phases. So you come forward for phase one, which would have a smaller red line boundary than the original outline, and then you come forward with phase two. Now, obviously, this isn't a phased approach, but that's just an example of how the red line boundary reserve master stage can be smaller than that secured at outline stage. As long as that red line boundary is entirely within what was um, you know, approved at outline stage, um, then the reserve mass application is in accordance with the principle of the development that's been established. It's if you're reducing the size and still trying to bring forward the same number of dwellings, it makes it more difficult in terms of you know, complying with design and density policies. But certainly, there's no conflict with the outline permission in terms of bringing forward this slightly reduced red line boundary. And, and in some respects, the developer has had to respond to that by reducing. Um, the number of dwellings that has been put forward to members today. I appreciate it's not reduced to the extent the parish council feel is appropriate, but as set out in the report, the density remains acceptable. Um, so there's no there's no conflict with what was established outline. So we are still looking at the same site, the same development, it's still residential development. So um, there's no conflict there. All right, thank you very much. I think Mr <laughs> Carter wanted to speak, did you? Uh, no, not for me. Thank you, Chair. No. Jim, and you have uh, Councillor Bradnam wanting to speak again, and I'm also down to speak myself. Fine, OK. Do you want to speak first, then, uh, Councillor Fain? And I'll go to Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll come in next, then. Um, I think Mr Sexton's been very clear about the relationship with the neighbourhood plan, about the weight we should give that. Um, but my concern was my understanding was that only in relation to one aspect of the neighborhood plan is there significant conflict this is in relation to vista 2 and i would appreciate guidance on two points there the first is as was pointed out when the outline consent was granted in may 2018 at appeal uh, the neighborhood plan did not then have the same status so what weight do we put on it in relation to that? Um, and the second thing is we were shown a photograph of this vista, which appeared to show the church tower only, I think, in the distance. I just wondered to what extent that aspect of the, whether the church tower is likely to be still visible over the houses at the uh, slightly higher height of up to 10 metres ridge height, um, whether any evidence has been presented on that point. Thank you. Mr Sexton, please. Thank you, Chair. So yes, as set out in Appendix 3, I believe it is, it, it uh, attempts to show Appendix, Appendix 4, sorry. It does show the development of the neighbourhood plan alongside the sort of timelines of the outline consent, and clearly there is an argument that could be made that the outline consent was established before the vista was shown on Brampton Road. Um, in conversations with the parish, uh, they sort of said to me, well, it's, it's all, that map has always been illustrative as, as to where the vista actually is. Clearly, the intent is a vista towards the church, which when you go to site, you actually get a better view of the site to the as you travel further towards Brampton, along Brampton Road from the other side of, of Leslie Woods, this application site. 
nonetheless, the Vista, the, you know, the referendum version of the neighbourhood plan has, has it's got to referendum stage with the Vista shown where it is in the plan. So we have to acknowledge that the layout of the site would conflict with the policy as it has moved forward, rightly or wrongly. Um, so that is acknowledged in the report. There is a condition recommended that uh, we, we could look to explore some sort of <laughs> landscape um, feature along the edge of Leskin Wood to try and celebrate that view towards the church. Um, I think it's obviously that by, by putting residential properties onto this site, you are going to be obscuring the views that are currently available from Rampton Road to the church tower. As you saw in the photo at that time of year, it's quite a limited view anyway. So you may still get some glimpsing views from Rampton Road, but I think I think most of them would be lost. But there would obviously be views from within the site towards the church. Um, but certainly I think the ones along Rampton Road that are currently there would obviously be obscured by the residential development, which has been established on the site. So there is a conflict and we have to acknowledge that conflict and weigh that in the, the planning balance, which is why we're here today. Is that helpful? Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bradnam, you want, want to pursue another point? Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify this, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only uh, twin hatted member, that is both district council and county council member on the planning committee today. Um, but the other thing I wanted to, sorry, I meant to come back on hedgerows and I wondered if um, the case officer, Mr Sexton, could just clarify. Um, in the application, there's um, information about um, sort of it's acknowledged sort of regrettable loss of hedgerow, which I think mainly refers to that. It refers to loss of 250 metres of hedgerow along Rampton Road. But I just wanted to check my understanding is of the red line on the reserved matters application. It looks to me as if the um, dog leg hedgerow that goes across the centre of the site much of that is also going to be lost, which uh, can, can you confirm that, Mr Sexton? Because there's also reference to hedgerow being planted, but actually all of that, roughly speaking, eastern boundary of the development, part of it would have been against the existing rather good hedgerow. And I just wanted to clarify, is it your understanding that much of that will be taken out, which would be? All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sexton, please. So yeah, the, the reference to 247 metres of hedgerow that is lost, uh, that obviously includes hedgerow that's required visibility space. And I believe it does also include some of the existing hedgerows within the red line boundary to accommodate the development. But obviously the, the biodiversity information that's come forward does highlight that, although obviously a, a loss of any hedgerow is, is regrettable, there will be a net gain planted throughout the site. So while 247 will be lost in and around the site, 300 metres, um, in excess of 300 metres uh, comprising mixed species will be going in as part of the landscape strategy. Um, that's only sort of highlighted as a master plan at this point because the reserve, the, the actual full details of uh, landscaping are reserved by condition. Um, but the reports that have been submitted obviously do indicate that we will be seeing more hedgerow planted than is lost, obviously acknowledging what is, you know, what is lost is obviously regrettable. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all our speakers are on clarification. So I'm going to move on to public speakers now. <coughs> Is uh, Mr Michael Brown with us, please? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Good morning, Mr Brown. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. Good morning, councillors. Good. And um, you know the system, do you? you got uh, three minutes and uh, yep I'll uh, do my best let you know when the time's up okay, okay. when you're okay. ready okay everybody um, my name is Michael Brown and my wife and I live at 120 Rampton Road one of the short line of houses uh, to the south of the site that will back onto this development we uh, along with our neighbours have objected to the houses proposed to build immediately behind us on grounds of their proximity their height and the steeply pitched roofs. When built, uh, we believe these houses will be two to three metres higher than the established houses, rendering them overbearing and overshadowing. 
although they are located at the minimum allowable separation distance, we fear we still will suffer loss of privacy and loss of light to our living spaces. <laughs> design perspective, the Cottenham Village Design Statement, um, and this is guideline B6, requests that, and I quote, new developments should refer to local building forms and proportions and should reflect those that are adjacent. The differences in form and proportion due to the steeply pitched roofs and the height uh, here are significant and are accentuated by the close proximity. So we are pleased to see that the officer's report in section seven does acknowledge that these houses will cause harm but we cannot agree that this is minor. Uh, further, we find that the officer's assertion that the application should be approved because on balance, the merits of the development outweigh the harm to be unsatisfactory. This approach almost by definition will always deliver a suboptimal outcome unless ways are sought to remediate or mitigate the harm that will be caused. And we believe that such mitigation is possible here by relocation or removal of these houses. The Parish Council is also arguing for this. For them, it would enable them to realise an objective of the neighbourhood plan that the field between us and the recreation ground be used in its entirety for sports facilities, in particular for an all-weather multi-use games area, which cannot be accommodated within the current design. Provision of this would deliver a very positive outcome for the entire village. In the outline application um, appeal report, uh, section 35, the inspector also recognised that harm could be caused by these houses and stated that since there was space available, that they should be located elsewhere. But the applicant has ignored the inspector's recommendation and has instead reduced the red line area by two hectares and without a corresponding reduction in number of houses. So we would ask the committee to consider carefully how the harms identified, which affect the entire community, can be mitigated to deliver an optimal solution. It seems evident that within the red line area approved outline, a layout could be achieved that would, would better meet the objectives of all parties. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, members, uh, do you have any questions of clarification for Mr. Brown? I'm looking in the chats. No, nope, so thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Sorry, Chairman, I'm struggling to get to this. Could I, may I speak? May I ask? Yeah, well, first we have Councillor Jimmy Hawkins and then Councillor Bradman. OK, Councillor Hawkins. But uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Brown, for um, uh, for the points you have brought forward. Um, just to clarify, uh, what in your uh, estimation is the difference between the ridge height of your property and the ones that are supposed to be behind in the new development? OK, so um, the new developments, uh, those particular houses, um, I can't remember what building type they are, but they are 9.3 metres high. Um, our house uh, is 8.3 metres high, uh, but the, our house is the highest um, in the row of houses. So I think the other houses may be a metre below that, so smaller houses. Um, and I also understand that um, when built, houses uh, are often higher than as designed uh, because of um, uh, uh, brown from the, the footings and so on being spread around, so they are built higher than as designed. So that, that um, leads me to the two to three metre height difference. Uh, so they, as designed, they could be two metres higher than the uh, some of the uh, lower houses in this in this um, line of houses, and then another metre um, for the, when it comes to being, being built. OK, th thank you for that. All right, thank you. I think I've got Councillor Bradnam, please. Uh, I withdraw. That was the question I was going to ask. Thank you. OK, right. Thank you. I can let you go this time. Then, Mr. OK, Brown. thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you for your contribution. Um, is Mr. Uh, David Al Alplin with us? Alplin. Yeah, Mr. Alplin. Chairman, I'm here. Thank you. Would like to turn on. OK, so, uh, you know, the system do that you know, there's three minutes and then the big questions. 
so when you're ready yes okay thanks thanks very much thank you mr chairman for the opportunity to speak to you all today in support of this application my name is david aplin and i'm the senior development manager with this land responsible for the delivery of the project for those who may not be aware this land was established by cambridgeshire county council for the purpose of providing much needed quality housing. All revenue that we generate goes back to help pay for the delivery of frontline services such as education, health, social care within the community. We are a developer that can make a difference. Our core values are about delivering quality design based around sustainability, ecology and with community at the forefront in all that we do. Working within the existing outline consent throughout the design processes, we have collaborated extensively with statutory consultees and key stakeholders, and in particular, the local community, to help ensure this application is wholly compliant and will serve as a positive contribution to the Cotton community. Achieving a detailed master plan that suits all parties, both in architecture and layout, has been challenging. However, the requirement and desire by all those involved to service residents' needs, housing needs, ecology, and the future sporting and recreational needs of the community has remained pivotal throughout our policy planning process. Through extensive consultation with the Parish Council and officers of South Cambridgeshire District Council's built and natural environment team, we have listened, we have designed, we have redesigned, and together we feel we have produced a scheme that balances and places the built environment and the needs of the local community, both today and tomorrow, at the very heart of our proposal. In achieving that balance, we have reduced the total number of dwellings by seven to 147, and all homes are 10 year blind. The scheme will deliver 40% affordable housing and over 50% of the total number of homes are either one or two bed, which will greatly assist local first time buyers. The protection of Les King Wood has formed a vital component in our design. The wood will be enhanced by a long term woodland management plan. It will also benefit from new access points for the increased enjoyment of the local community. Our proposal, both in landscape and ecology, will deliver a biodiversity net gain with species rich habitats being created across the site. In addition to the £1.6 million contr contribution to the local infrastructure by way of the Section 106 agreement, we will also be extending the existing cycle and footpath network through the development, which will help reduce local car journeys and encourage active travel. Crucially, and not part of the Section 106 agreement, our design allows for a future access point to service Cottenham Primary School and enables the school to continue to grow and to flourish. This application helps safeguard the school expansion so that access is both safe and sustainable for the whole community. Sustainability is vital to achieving a greener future and combat the climate emergency we all face. And as a company, we are proud that we are years ahead of the government's initiative to reduce the use of fossil fuels by designing in air source heat pumps as a means of heating. I hope this resume has been helpful and that you agree with your officer's recommendation and vote to deliver this scheme as part of Cottenham's local plan to provide well-designed, sustainable housing for the greener future the community deserves. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, members, uh, do we have questions? Chairman, we have uh, Councillor Ripith first. Councillor Ripith, please. Hello, good morning. Um, you said about the sustainability and the biodiversity of the development. So I have a couple of questions for clarification. Um, with hedgerows, you're aiming to put in, I think it was 300 metres of hedgerows. Could you explain whereabouts they will be? be and how that will help with bees and insects able to get around the site um with you know so that that's obviously a main issue with biodiversity 
OK, the, the question that you've asked is actually quite detailed and quite specific. Um, I don't have the ability to share my screen, um, but there is a very detailed, comprehensive chapter within the design and access statement and the relevant chapters that is supported by that. Um, and I would suggest that you just refer to that or indeed to Michael Sexton, and he'll be able to point that out in, in the detail that I think that your question requires. OK, um, the other one was about cycling and um, getting around the site. Um, I'm a little bit sort of concerned about the footpath, which has been kind of it seems to be removed on the reserve matters application. I mean, how far would it how long would it take to walk to the centre of the village um, under the new sort of plans? Right. OK, so that footpath, as, as the planning officer said, that was shown um, on the outline consent was an indicative footpath and does not form part um, of a material consideration. However, we are all about sustainability and we are all about reducing car journeys. Mm -hmm. um, and we've worked extensively with the parish council and indeed the, the district council in providing footpath routes that on a plan that actually hasn't been shown here today that you will have in your documentation. And the whole development is 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 porous. Um, so as well as providing the cycle paths as, as we rightly have to in the Section 106 agreement, there are also additional footpaths across land, which don't forget isn't owned by us, it's all by the parish council, but we've worked extensively with them to agree routes um, that basically do not, um, if you like, jeopardise any future sporting pitch or sporting surface um, extension in the future. Um, so there's, we, there's, there is an, a number of footpaths that, that, that we have proposed, but we can only propose them because we can only take the footpath to our boundary. After that, it's, it's for the parish council or indeed um, a neighbouring landowner to decide whether that footpath can go off into um, Cotman, for example. OK, would it be OK for Michael Sexton to show us any, either of the, or both of these plans? I'm, I'm very happy for them to be shared. Absolutely. There's, there's, there's... Well, I'd like to move on if that's all okay, right. We, okay. we can return to this when we get to the debate. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, then Councillor Richard Williams. Was Councillor Hawkins actually before me? I don't know, I'm only taking I'm the advice of the Vice Chair. So, as was Councillor Bradnam before me. Okay. I think I, we have Councillor Richard Williams next. Councillor well, Councillor Thane is the one who is uh, dealing with the list. Yeah, first Councillor Richard Williams. Yeah. I'm sorry, okay. but you skipped it's two people right. already. It doesn't matter, does it? We'll get to you in a moment, don't worry. So, Councillor Williams, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, th this is really, a, uh, actually, it's a comment arising from, from what Mr. Applin has said, and it, it, it's no criticism of Mr. Applin at all, but I think it would be useful uh, to reassure members of the public if we could just have a bit of uh, some clarification from Mr. Reid or Mr. Carter that the purposes for which the funds raised from this development would be used, e.g. fund public services, is not a material consideration for this committee. Uh, that is quite clear, I think. Um... Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to get things on. Yes, I, I, we, we take all that on board. Uh, yep. Mr Carter, you wanted to confirm that then, did you? Yeah, sorry, Chair, just, just through you, yes, I confirm that that interpretation from Councillor Williams is, is correct. Thank you very much. Do we have Councillor Anna Bradnam, which I think is on this one, not the last one, is it? That's correct, thank you. If, through yeah, you, Chairman. And please. Um, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask Mr Applin um, whether he would accept that an established hedge has greater diversity than a newly planted hedge. And I wondered whether he would be amenable, uh, and I'm thinking about the hedges both along Rampton Road and with on the eastern boundary of the houses. I wondered whether he would be amenable to a condition that required him to maintain existing hedges wherever possible, even if that meant cutting them quite short, uh, because he could still then maintain the um, his aspiration for open openness. I wondered whether he would be prepared to accept that. Um, it's it's not something I too could agree to at the moment, but in in principle, um, there is absolutely no reason why, and and we and we haven't done this anyway, that we're not just going to remove hedges for removing hedgerow sake. Um, any hedgerow that we've had to remove has basically been to enable development maybe because of safety reasons, because of highways and visibility displays, 
Um, but there's already been gone into. We we are planting in excess of the number of hedgerows that we're actually removing. Um, to your to your first point, uh, again, the detail you require, I'm not qualified to to tell you about the species rich varieties that are going to be planted. Um, but again, it will all be in that report, and I think it's already been actually conditioned anyway. So you would be able to seek clarification on that. All right, thank you very much. Then we have Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Councillor Hawkins, please. <sighs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, through you to Mr. Affleck. Um, thank you for all that you have explained. I think what I want to clarify from you is, I mean, you say you've worked hard with um, Parish Council and you've listened. Um, however, there seems to be this design feature in the houses, which is of very steep, um, steep roofs. Um, and I just wanted to find out from you if that is a feature that runs through the village or is it a is it, is it a because you, you've you've selected that as a feature for your um, for your side, but from what I've seen of Cottenham, that is not a typical um, feature. So how come you've settled on that one? Please. Okay, um, we we we've got ten house types on this on this on this development, um, and as you know, we've we've attended a number of design review panels with the with um, South Cambridge District Council's built environment team. So we have worked hand in glove with basically agreeing the materials um, and the and, and the visual appearance of these buildings. Um, and we have been working, it's about two years now. And again, we've obviously taken in the design guide for Cottenham and some roofs, you're right, if you actually walk around the village, you will see varying pictures of roofs. Um, these are modern houses, obviously built with modern but traditional materials. And so the, the, the actual pitch of the roof, as the planning officer explained, is not untypical of some of the houses and some of the dwellings that you're actually going to find within Cottenham or the surrounding area. Uh, uh, may I come back, Chair? I don't think you've answered my question. How typical yeah. are steep roofs? They're not very typical, are they? It's just a small percentage of Cottenham I, that has steep roofs. I would, I would. I would respectively disagree. OK, we then have Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my camera's not working again. Thank you very much, Chairman. And through you, Chairman, um, I'm sure that um, we've really uh, heard that a complimentary uh, flowing appreciation from an applicant to their own application as this one. And I wonder, given uh, the uh, the words that were spoken and the claims that were made, I'm sure that um, the County Council's representative must be very disappointed at listening to what the neighbours say and the uh, very detailed explanations of the parish council's feelings. I wonder if you could also tell me, um, Given the fact that you uh, have got two hectares less of, less of land that you are using, why you have only chosen to take out seven dwellings from a two hectare area, one of the great concerns of neighbours, Mr Brown said at the start, was the uh, nearness to um, those that are already around. Um, and uh, I would have thought that if you are as listening as you are saying that you are, you would have taken that on board and actually taken some of that problem away by not having dwellings, uh, so many dwellings on this site and therefore giving some relief to people already in place. Why have you not done that? Uh, Councillor Roberts, thank you for your question. Um, there are a number of questions within that uh, overarching question. Um, we, we don't act that the two hectares that were removed, we don't actually own. So as the planning officer tried to explain, um, th this, this isn't a phase development. We have we are delivering in a, in a single phase. We don't actually own those two hectares that were removed. Yes, so but, we had to achieve, we, but we had to achieve the same amount of housing within a much smaller area. Now, Why? It, looks very, it looks very simple on plan. But you've, got, but, you, but you've got a number of parties, all of which conflict with each other. So the parish council, rightly, and I would do the same, want the maximum amount of land, which is actually our land, 
um, that they would like for future expansion of recreational purposes. That is admirable and we've worked with them. But at the same time, you have um, the Les Kingwood, which is, a, which is a key Cottenham asset and we don't want to encroach into the wood. So we've pulled away from the wood and we've also pulled away. So we've given or we're proposing to um, allow the parish council as much land as possible. We've worked with the parish council on a number of pitch configurations. And I appreciate that we don't have time today, but actually there is plenty of room within what is left to actually install a mugger and a number of five a side football pitches. There is there is actually space there, but at the same time, we still have to provide an access uh, for future potential expansion of the primary school, as well as fitting a number of houses. And yes, that has meant we've lost seven houses. The back to back distance with the objection that was voiced earlier, actually are, we, we, we have exceeded back to back distances. Um, and again, we have lost seven units, which we're quite happy to lose seven units because we're about quality. We're not about cramming houses into a small area. That's that's not what we're about. That's not sustainable. And it really? doesn't create an environment for really? those future residents of, of Cottenham. OK, thank you very much. Okay, we have no other speakers, but Michael Sexton has offered to clarify a point here. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be very helpful at the moment. I think we we know what we know. So thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Alpin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. And we'll move on then to the parish council representative, uh, which is Councillor Morris. Councillor Morris, are you with us? Can you hear me now? Yep, I'm going to hear okay. you. I can't see you yet, though. Oh, that could be a blessing. Um, <laughs> it's supposed to be on, but I'll I'll carry on in the it may yeah, turn. Okay, sorry. I'm sure you know you know the system, don't you? Indeed, I do. Even yeah. uh, when, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, first, could I uh, give a sincere apology to Councillor Bradman? It was certainly not intended to give personal offence to her and her position. Uh, it was perhaps a slightly heavy handed approach to bring to the committee's visibility that um, there are multiple county council issues that have a bearing on this. So I'm sorry, certainly. Um, yeah, good morning still um, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, if I can start by saying that the parish council contends that insufficient weight is being given to certain policies in our neighbourhood plan, uh, which, as you know, we've been working on for five years, only to be a little thwarted earlier in the year by COVID. But lots of other plans have gone awry in that time. The Cottenham Neighbourhood Plan was recommended by the examiner and the district council to go to referendum, but that was suspended by your CEO in March based on fears about safety with COVID. But subsequently, the government has asserted that such plans should be given significant weight. This interpretation, we believe, could and should lead to the planning authority treating the neighbourhood plan as part of the local plan in key areas, including site design and accepting the parish council interpretation of the policies it actually wrote itself. Um, the parish council's comments are more consistent with the findings of the appeal inspector and our neighbourhood plan examiner, independent plan examiner, of course, the developer, rather than <coughs> amending any significant design detail, has focused on numbers, number of houses, despite buying a smaller site and then arguing why, in their opinion, they consider the application is consistent with the neighbourhood plan and even questioning the plan's weight relative to the district design guide, which was not mentioned at all by the appeal inspector. Um, the authority appears to be defending rather than testing the developer's approach. Uh, that's perhaps an exception of the committee from what I've heard this morning, including the worrying attempted rebuttal of the persimmon eight, as I call it, surface water planning condition, which is applied with your uh, council's help to both the persimmon and red row reserve masses applications, specifically to meet our policy COH 2.2. E, F and G on surface water drainage. But as a reminder, the government says neighbourhood planning gives communities direct power to develop a shared vision for their neighbourhood 
and shape the development and growth of the local area. They're able to choose where they want new homes, shops and offices to be built, have their say on what those new buildings should look like and what infrastructure should be provided. In our view, um, OK, I'll move on from that. At examination in 2019, the examiner, the independent examiner in his report said, this neighbourhood plan includes a range of policies and seeks to bring forward positive and sustainable development in the neighbourhood planning neighbourhood area. It seeks to refine the local green spaces in the village. It also identifies potential development sites within the village itself. In the round, the plan has successfully identified a range of issues where it can add value to the strategic context already provided by the wider development plan. We believe the officer report takes a view that is too close to that of the developer, gives insufficient weight to the examined NP policies cited from the Cotton plan, and the application should be refused unless and until progress is made on the issues raised, allowing you to encourage rather than discourage the development of further neighbourhood plans. And we did in our last submission identify mitigations that are possible in all the areas where we have objections. But unlike what Mr Applin was recently saying, the this land proposition has not changed. They have not listened. Um, whether on whatever aspect it is. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think we have some speakers, do we? Councillor Chairman, Chairman? Yes, we have first Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning, uh, Frank. Nice to see you. And you. Thank and you. Can I say thank you very much? I accept your apology. I suspected it was not intended directly at me. And I also am very aware of the amount of work and time you have put into developing uh, your village design statement and your neighbourhood plan. So I appreciate how close it is to your heart. I particularly wanted to ask you that I know you have been trying to, um, uh, what is the word, assemble land such that you can have the maximum um, area for open um, play and recreation and sports pitches and such like. And I wanted to, if you could perhaps talk us through what impact you think this application might have on your potential wishes for how you wanted to use that land for um, recreation space. Yes, and I'll try and be brief. Um, there are complications because of the County Council's other aspirations on the land. Um, it's likely that um, land in the north of the overall site will be taken away because of the primary school expansion. Some of that land is unusable because of um, surface water. One of the issues that we raised with this land on their own development, which I'm sure they don't yet appreciate the full sense of. Um, but Ideally, there is a piece of land that the county would not sell to this land and we think they're holding it back because to use it effectively as a ransom against some of the land that they'll take away for the primary school. But there's no guarantee we will get that land. So at the moment we could be constrained to what we call our first and second field. And the third field that we leased at some expense from the county council 20 years ago, I think, we will lose a lot of that land and the pitches that were on it. And the land that this land is possibly offering, and it's still not clear exactly how much land and on what terms, uh, is not enough to replace that. And it means in practice that um, we probably would have to do some sort of all weather upgrade on that area to substitute for some land that we will lose elsewhere. And that would be a costly venture. Uh, we, I, I we, think we'll briefly, probably get, get the picture there because yeah, this just, is just one more if I may, just, just one more if I may. The, do. the possibility of fitting a full scale football pitch with the three or four metre respect lines that the FA require is limiting how we could use that land that this land is offering currently. So those extra houses being removed is very important. All right, thank you very much. Next we have Councillor Ripith. All right, Councillor Ripith, please. 
Good morning, Just. Um, so bearing in mind everything you said, and thank you for the detail in your report um, in our agenda papers. If the number of houses were reduced to the pro rata amount, taking out the hectares on the two hectares, I believe it is, um, reduced from the outline to say 120 or so houses, would many of your concerns be addressed by that? Would there be space for, yes. you know, the pitches, the footpaths, the hedgerows, the things that you hope to, to be part of your neighbourhood? The short answer is yes. It, the, the basically, there is scope and it, in one sense, it's annoying to hear uh, David Applin suggest some of the things along Lake as King Wood. We deliberately reduce the size of Les King Wood as far as local green space was concerned to allow him more flexibility on where the houses were going to go along that line. The way they've chosen to put them uh, blocks the vista, as we've heard, uh, which is wrong. Uh, if a neighbourhood plan is going to be respected at all, that vista has to be retained. And that would take out about a number of the houses. There's a few along the front of the, I think they call it their green or something, which should also go. And there's the five that Mr Brown referred to should go. Mm -hmm. And if those went, as you say, bringing it down to about 120, there is a workable design. OK, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Next we have Councillor Hawkins. Right, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, <laughs> thank you for your comprehensive um, response to this. So one of the things I want to explore uh, with you is the, the, the appearance and the proportion of the buildings and especially those that um, are towards the south. Now, I did try, I did try earlier on to get from Mr. Appling his, you know, his view on why the, the buildings seem to be so tall. I mean, in my estimation, two, three story buildings should be what no more than perhaps eight meters, 8.5. And yet we have stuff that is going up to 10 meters. Yes, there is no sensitivity at all. Um, as Mr Brown said, and in fact, I, I pointed out to him, the when the groundwork is finished, as we found on the Bellway site, the finished level of the land that people start building up from is probably a good two meters higher than it was when they started. And so putting houses close even within the rules to the rows of houses on Rampton Road already, the second row effectively, mm -hmm. is insensitive at best and they should be pulled back. But on the other hand, that eats into land that the parish council want for sport, of course. Um, the steep roofs make no sense at all um, in Cottenham. And one of the things that we've been careful not to do is that I think this land have spoken far more to the district design guide across South Cambridgeshire, where I don't, I'm not an expert on it, but there probably are more steeper roofed houses, steeper pitched houses. In Cottenham, as you say, there are very few. Mm. And one of the tragedies that we have at the moment is planning that focuses more on the broader district and tends to homogenise rather than picking up the character of individual villages. And that's what neighbourhood plans are supposed to do, Can as village talk. design guides are supposed to do. Is now so it'd be a tragedy if we lost that. Uh, and, well, you understand that. I do, I do. Th thank you for that clarification. I did think so because I have spent time in Cottenham in the past. I have worked there. I have, you know, I, I know what it's like. So I was quite surprised um, by the comments I received previously. So thank you for that clarification. Um, as also just towards the less king woods. It seemed to me that the houses have been pushed quite close to that. What's your what's your response to that? Yes, they have. Um, and as I say, we, in, in the past, and I don't think we've had any meaningful conversation with this land for well over a year, despite all sorts of assurances when the neighbourhood plan was when the referendum was suspended. Mm -hmm. um, the we tried to open up, as I say, by pulling the um, designation of the the local green space back to the pathways within the wood mm -hmm. to allow more leeway and gap between the houses and the wood itself. In practice, that area is still overdeveloped. They put a strip of houses pretty much along, almost right along the vista, almost deliberately along the vista, it would seem. Um, but 
I'm sure it wasn't deliberate. It's just insensitive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, next, we have Councillor Roberts. Unless you want to invite, take up Michael Sexton's offer to clarify on Les King Wood. No, I'd, li I'd like to complete the um, members' comments, um, questions first, please. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Just, uh, I was actually going to make the two points with my um, particular concern were the numbers and the heights, and those questions have been very well put by my colleagues, Councillor Whippers and Councillor Hawkins, and thank you, Councillor Morris for answering those. Thank you, Chairman. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, we have no other speakers listed. OK, uh, Councillor, um, Mr Sexton, did you want to come back in? Uh, I, I, well, before we do, do that, I'll re release Councillor Morris. Thank you very much for your contribution this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, Mr Sexton, did you want to expand on the Kingswood issue? Yeah, if it's appropriate at this point, or I can wait till the debate, I've put together a plan that overlays the two hectares that's been lost with the outline. Right. Uh, application, which I think will help okay, members. We'll we, we come back to that then, because I've still yeah, got two then. speakers and uh, I'd like to complete those, please. So, uh, local councillors, I believe, wish to speak. Is uh, Councillor Goff with us, please? I am. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, before I start, can I just make a, a declaration? Because I will reference the Old West River IDB. Uh, in my comments, and I am, along with Councillor Wilson, board members of the IDB. Um, but of course, uh, their uh, role in this application is uh, completely independent of, uh, of, of our role as board members. Yeah, that, that's noted. Just before you start, Mr. Goff, could um, members and visitors please turn off their cameras and their microphones? Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, the setting of this development is important. Its adjacency to the intensively used recreation ground can very, very important. Very important is now joining. Very important local green space of Les King Wood, a much loved tranquil area. I want to highlight three points. The outline application was for 154 dwellings. The developed area has been reduced, but the number of houses or dwellings has not been reduced commensurately. Pro rata, it is 26. A poor precedent, but note in particular the layout of the area to the northeast of Ramp Hill Farm that is now being developed. That will compromise future potential expansion of recreation space as envisaged in the neighbourhood plan and explained by Councillor Morris. Once lost, it will never be possible to recover that flexibility. Secondly, given the adjacencies, boundaries on this site are important, of particular significance, and this has been mentioned by Councillor Bradman and Councillor Ripper, is the linear mature hedge, probably about 500 metres, that runs along the whole eastern and northerly boundary away from Rampton Road. This is, no is noted and considered in the biodiversity report to be a hab habitat of principal importance. However, on the inspection of the layout and the design, it looks like it's in, in, incompatible with the retention of this hedgerow. The, re the officer's report in Payer Para 126 says the eastern boundary of the site will remain relatively open and allow easy access onto the adjacent recreation and open areas. That implies that the hedgerow would be removed. But the aforementioned biodiversity report assumes in para 3.3.2 that that hedgerow will be retained. That is completely inconsistent. Right. And it suggests to me that the right. conclusion of the overall net gain from the biodiversity report, which has been mentioned on a couple of occasions so far, is flawed as referenced in para 220. That inconsistency cannot be uh, allowed to pass unresolved. Thirdly, um, drainage. Drainage is important in COP. Um, to those of you who visited the site, you will have noticed the waterlogged ground on the site and the considerable slope. Locally, it is referred to as a hill. I'm worried that the IDB has not 
opined on the scheme. I'm also concerned that the parish council remains concerned. This is really important because if the retention facilities prove to be insufficient, it could really compromise the utility of the local green space. That would be a real loss and I hope uh, members of the committee will um, discuss and review the, uh, the drainage issues. Thank you very much. Chairman, I don't have any questions listed at this stage. OK, okay then. Right. Well, Councillor Goss, uh, thank, you, thank you very much for your contribution. Chairman, I now have uh, Councillor Bradnam wanting to ask a question. Yeah, of course. Councillor Bradnam, please. Of course, Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Goff. Um, I wondered, uh, in your consideration of the drainage arrangements and the sud pond, can you just explain to me, is your fear that the sud, if the sud pond is inadequate, that that will actually if, end result in flooding of um, Les King Wood, or is it your impression that it will overflow into the IDB um, uh, catch catch drain? Well, I think the the, the plan is that the, the, the IDB drain is the actual um, outlet for for the, uh, the, the drainage system. There's two issues I think with the retention. One of which is the scale of the retention. I hope I hope it is right um, that the, the scale is appropriate for for the requirements of the drainage system. But secondly, the other point, and, and the parish has uh, pointed this out too as well, the the actual land in Les King Wood is very, very um, claggy. Uh, it's silty, so it often gets waterlogged. It has actually had standing water on it um, in the past uh, when it rains heavily. And obviously, if that, um, if that area does not drain uh, effectively, it reduces the utility of the use of that local green space. Thank you. Councillor Nick Wright next. All right, thank you. Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question to Councillor Goff is this, that um, I note from my emails that you and Councillor Wilson arranged uh, visits to the site for members of the planning committee. Could I ask whether the chairman was present in all those visits? Well, um, I, I can answer that. Uh, no, he wasn't. I made an independent visit to the site myself. Um, this is unofficial visits in that uh, as things stand with the, you know, the present pandemic, that we, we are not making official visits. So these were um, visits requested by the local member and it was up to members of the committee whether or not they wished to go. Uh, in light of your response, probably my next question will be to Stephen Reid uh, when I come to make comments. So. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, do we have any other? There's no other questions, I think, to Councillor Goff, so thank you very much, Councillor Goff, for your contribution. And Councillor Williams, Will Wilson. <laughs> thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me. Um, so thank, when you're ready, you know, you have the three minutes. OK, thanks. Right, as we've heard, Cottenham has both a village design statement and a neighbourhood plan, which is currently subject to referendum. Both have been drawn up with the participation of residents and are intended to give local people the opportunity to have input into how their community develops. The neighbourhood plan, which incorporates elements of the village design statement, was due to go to referendum, as we've heard, but because of COVID, um, it didn't. But uh, government regulations um, require that they, the um, neighbourhood plan is given certain significant weight in decision making so far as the plan is material to the application. A steep pitched roof is an exception in Cottenham rather than the norm and the design here creates a conflict with the village design statement. The impact is all the more significant for the existing properties in the vicinity. The proximity and height of the new houses is highly likely to create overshadowing 
We've already seen this happen on the Bellway development in Cottenham. The groundworks raised the level of the houses, causing overlooking that could not be remedied by six foot high fencing. The officer acknowledges the visual harm created by the additional height. However, page 39 of the agenda refers to a 21st century design to explain the departure from the neighbourhood plan. Given that the neighbourhood plan has been drawn up and approved by the examiner in the 21st century and that it is specific to Cottenham, why accept this departure from that document rather than seek to give it the significant weight that is required by government regulation, especially if it is acknowledged that the height of the roofs creates visual harm? The, visual, the village design statement and the neighbourhood plan both seek to encourage walking and cycling and the reduction in car use. This development is remote from the core of the village. The, the new residents will have a roundabout walk via Rampton Road and Lambs Lane to reach the nursery, the primary school and the core of the village to use local shops and facilities. Pedestrians will need to navigate a narrow pavement on a busy road on which the local speed watch team regularly flags up speeding traffic. This is equally intimidating for cyclists. The outline plan submitted to the inspector highlighted the prospect of off-road paths to the village core. Their absence in this application, forcing residents to walk and cycle along a very busy road, is highly likely to result in car dependency. This plan makes no attempt, therefore, to ameliorate car dependency. The remoteness, the lack of more direct off-road walking and cycling to the village core, as well as the design of the houses that is at odds with the village design statement, will do nothing to help the new residents feel part of the existing community in Cottenham. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Wright, I, your camera is still on. I don't know if you noted. <laughs> Apologies. Right, no problem. Uh, Councillor Thane, we have speakers. Councillor Thane, are you with us? I don't know if we've lost Councillor Thane, have we? Councillor Fane is muted. We have Councillors Hawkins and Councillor Bradnam plus myself listed to speak, Chairman. Right. OK, so I think you're first on the list, aren't you, Councillor Fane? So if you'd like to go ahead. Yes, my question relates to the design and the roof pitches. Um, I noted that at uh, Paragraph 53, the urban design officers were supportive of changes introduced to the scheme and considered that these accorded with the design objectives set out in the Cotton and Village Design Statement and the Neighbourhood Plan. Um, it was further suggested at one point earlier this morning that the roof pitches and therefore the height of the ridges was in part a response to the Village Design Statement. It may have been a response to the Neighbourhood Plan, that wasn't clear to me at the time. I wondered if Councillor uh, Wilson could comment on that. Um, uh, uh, this has already been discussed earlier with um, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, okay. The generality of roof pitches in is now is exiting much, is, is lower. Um, high pitched roofs are not the norm in Cottenham, and given that. Um, it, especially in the case of the, the houses that are going to be backing onto the houses in Rampton Road. Um, it, it's not necessary. And as um, Councillor Morris said, it's insensitive to say the least. Um, high pitched roofs are not the generality of the shape of roofs in Cottenham. All right, thank you. Then we have Councillor Hawkins, I think. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think my my question to you really is on the uh, on access to the village centre. I mean, I know uh, Mr. Applin said uh, there's a map somewhere that shows some paths that we've put together. I mean, 
did any were you aware of any of this happening? I mean, what what was the I presume you discussed with them, you know, access from there into the center, into the school. Um, but it seems the maps that we have don't actually show, um, you know, how people from that development are going to be getting to the village. Yeah. Um, I, I think in particular, if we look at the people in the northeast who will be living in the northeast corner of the site, they will have a very long walk um, or cycle that there are cycle there will be cycle paths provided for in the development but they will have a very long walk mm. to, to access the school where there could be a more direct pathway that goes um straight oh, sorry so i was just ringing the my doorbell um <laughs> well timed um yes uh, so they will have to walk along Rampton Road and Lambs Lane and I think human nature is such that people will just get into their cars. There is already a problem with people driving their children to school and causing, uh, well it's obviously risky and dangerous and to have even more people doing that at the same time is just, um, just horrendous. So there should be some way for these people to be able to access the village core and it's about accessing village amenities, village um, pubs, shops. The human nature is going to dictate that they will get into their cars and this does nothing to prevent that happening. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. And Councillor Bradnam, please. Uh, thank you. Councillor Hawkins has again asked the question I was going to ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fine then. So it was to do with, with how long it would take to get from um, those houses in the north corner to into the village centre. Uh, I understand that my colleague Councillor Gordon. Uh, uh, no, I'm going to in the... interrupt. No, I'm sorry. We, okay. we have, have to actually address the actual application before right. us. The, the principle of the development is was decided at the outline stage. So that is not within our power to um, to review that again. With OK, so I think we've uh, done the uh, speakers there. So Councillor Wilson, thank you very much thank indeed you. for your contribution. Thank you. So members, um, just before we go on, I think Mr Sexton would, would just like to clarify some elements about Kingwood. Mr Sexton, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I just wonder whether it would be helpful before starting the debate just to uh, I'll just put together a plan that shows the two hectares that are being moved um, in terms of the density argument, if that would be helpful to members. Um, if I just share my screen. Uh, this is I've literally just superimposed. So this is the outline master plan showing what illustratively uh, may have come forward and the inspector would have had before him when considering density. Okay. The area that I've drawn is Sorry? now joining. The area that I've marked in blue, just for context, shows the two hectares that has been removed from the development site at Reserve Matter stage. So when looking at the argument of what the inspector considered density wise to what we're considering density wise now, members should note that the area removed, although again illustrative only, only affects 20 dwellings a lot of the area that's no longer part of the application was never shown indicatively to be um, residential development so how the de how the density would have been considered by the inspector on the basis of this plan is very similar to how the density is being considered within this reserve matters application because the two hectares removed was not shown illustratively to be two hectares of housing um, i just thought that might help clarify on that point and Regarding Les King Wood, and I do acknowledge that the Parish Council haven't drawn the local green space boundary right up to the edge of the wood. Um, an original layout of the plan did have houses much closer to Les King Wood than currently proposed as before members now. That was strongly objected to by the local authority, in particular the Council's trees officer, because once you start to encroach into the woodland, it starts to lose the fact that it's a woodland and it starts to become more of a glorified row of trees. Um, so just I think that's important to note that there was an initial objection from the trees officer because development did encroach into Leskine Wood and that has been pulled away now. Um, I just thought those two points might be helpful moving forward, Chair. Right. Thank you very much indeed. 
<laughs> uh, I think Councillor Wright, you wanted to raise a point. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, having listened to both local members who are clearly objecting to the application, in the interests of fairness to everyone, um, I'm surprised that they have been giving tours of the site and no member of the planning committee who's been on those tours has declared it as an interest. Um, I, I can't ever remember where local members have done this in advance. And I don't accept your explanation that it's a COVID practice, because at the last planning uh, last planning meeting, we all, well, a great many of us went out to Willingham, where the planning officer gave us a tour of the sites. And I, I would just like to uh, ha hear Stephen Reid that you know, we are able to proceed with this, bearing in light what I've said. All right, thank you very much. Yes, let's take advice then. Uh, Mr. Reid. Uh, uh, Chair, if I may, um, I think that's a, a matter for the planning officers rather than the legal officer to deal with. Okay, Mr. Carter then, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, I gave advice uh, to members that we wouldn't be able to accommodate a site visit in the traditional way, minibus, for example, um, due to the current restrictions in place due to coronavirus. What I did say was that if members wanted to visit the site from public vantage points, such as the road or the footpath, public footpath, then that was a matter for members to determine with, uh, whether or not they chose to do that. Um, whether members uh, were then given uh, an explanation uh, or views of the site by the local members is a matter for individual members to consider uh, when it comes to making a decision on the application. Provided that members come with an open mind to this meeting, then in my opinion, uh, it doesn't preclude them from making a decision on this application today. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. We then have Councillor Roberts. Right, uh, Mr. Reid, would you turn your camera off, please? Apologies, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, are we into general debate now, please? We are indeed, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I think it's been a really interesting debate and um, we've fleshed out a lot of concerns and we've got a lot of in input um, from both officers, uh, members of the public, etc. And I would like to thank Mr Sexton for the report that he gave because obviously it is detailed and I think it does point out to us um, the four lines or the concerns that, that needed to be looked at. Um, however, having listened to um, everybody today and especially actually um, having listened to the questions of Councillor Tuma Hawkins and uh, and uh, and <laughs> Councillor Ripper, I'm losing names. Um, I think that I can't possibly go along with this application in its present form. Um, I think as has been stated, the, uh, we know that this site will be developed, um, but I'm afraid there are just too many flaws in it at the moment. I'm really disappointed at the County Council, but maybe not surprised, that they seem to have taken so little on board and have been so intractable and not listened to the parish council and the residents and uh, 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 not even I think maybe today so it seems to me you know the height uh, is is far far too high the numbers are far far too high that should have come down in accordance with losing that two hectares of land there's absolutely no excuse for what it hasn't done uh, the hedge concerns the the fact that it hasn't followed um, the agreed, you know, the neighbourhood plan, the design plan um, that are there to make and encourage us to get it right. So, uh, Chairman, I'm hoping very much uh, that it gets refused and I will be supporting the, especially the local members and the parish council and their concerns. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. I think we next have Councillor Heather Williams, then Councillor Khan. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, then, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't want to echo too much what others have said. However, I, I am in agreement that it's not suitable, in my view, for Cottenham. I think it does have too much of an urban design feel, uh, feel to it. And I think the heights of the building are, are unacceptable, as others have said. 
Um, and the, we should be giving weight to the visual design statement. That's what they're there for, in my view. But I, I do appreciate that this isn't a, it is a finely balanced one, which people can, can see either way, but that's my personal views. All right, thank you. Councillor Khan, is it next? You're muted, Councillor Khan. You're muted. Sorry, my earphones off. Does it, can you hear me now? Yeah. Fine. I've had this before. Sometimes when I have my earphones on, you can't hear that the mute mutes automatically, even though it's not on the on Teams. Uh, it's a complicated site. Um, the uh, I found the vi visit on site very, and I uh, I declare that I was on site. Uh, uh, um, I found the visit very useful. Um, uh, perhaps not the way that, that others uh, might have thought. Um, it was clearly the uh, the. In terms of the neighbourhood plan, I took the advantage after the point after was going to have a direct look at the labour plan and the design codes, uh, the design um, state um, policy, which was de determined. Uh, the village is divided into various types of of development: the the, the village core, the village uh, development in the village core, the village um, the, the sort of Victorian development, and modern development. And in modern development, the main point that it makes is that they they're very mixed, very mixed type of uh, houses. Um, I, I don't actually get that the pitch of the roof is very much an issue that, that is de de um, commented on there. Uh, and this, uh, the, so that I, it, and they do seem to have been made attempts to make sure that the, the development is relatively mixed. Um, so I actually am not actually of, um, of the view that it uh, is that uh, different from the um, design, design policies, uh, uh, that, that that in itself make a refusal. In terms of the houses north of Rampton Road, uh, I think the key word there is actually that they are north. Um, they won't be overshadowed. The sun will, will the sun will never be between the houses along Rampton Road and the, these these road. Uh, road. The high pitch roof is rather unusual design, uh, but it's a, it's a small number in a in a large mixed very mixed uh, development. Uh, and I don't think that I could really stand on my heart and think that that would be enough reason for, for refusal. There are reasons which I'm happy about, uh, which are not, uh, which we can't be sure about, but they all appear to be reasons which are not material considerations. Uh, the, the, the matter of the link into the village, well, the principle of development has been decided, determined uh, and it was never with, the area was never within the, the red line, so we can't insist on it. Um, the developers indicate that he's willing to, uh, they're willing to, to do some, uh, something about that, but that's not a matter that we could consider in the application. The other really thing is the access to the school. The original site showed access to the school at the far end of the uh, site, right in the southern part. Um, but the, uh, uh, now they're talking about taking land out of the site to put the school nearer. Uh, I'm unha unhappy about the uncertainty about this, but again, because it's outside the red line, we can't consider that as material uh, consideration. So uh, in terms of the, the vista, that is a, a clear obstruction but as the voters showed and as was obvious on site the view of the church from the actual site is not terribly dramatic and in fact there are hedges in between which could easily grow up so there's no guarantee that that vista will be maintained i don't really think it's going to be sufficient for me to say that that's a reason for refusal um, in terms of the proximity to other houses to uh, les greenwood we've been um, the, the proposal has removed them Again, it, um, I'm not sure that that's adequate reason to, to, to refuse. In terms of the size of the um, retention pond, we're told that it's adequate. I, I'm, I'm not a sufficient expert to say that it isn't adequate. Um, the, site, the whole site is built of clay, uh, of piercing clay, so, uh, or, or maybe boulder clay, but it, it, parts of it are certainly very impermeable. Uh, that's, but the principal development on that impermeable site has been determined if they if the uh, runoff is going to be adequate for meeting the requirements, I don't see that we can, we're going to be able to say, um, refuse it on that ground. So I come to the view that although there are things which I'm uh, um, not happy about, I don't, uh, and it perhaps is not a perfect development, 
Well, I think it's a good enough development to, to, for us to uh, grant permission, and I tend to agree with the planning officer, and I, I think we support the development uh, when I come to vote. <coughs> we have <coughs> Councillor Bradnam and then Councillor Ripith, I think, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as always, Councillor Khan comes to us with very uh, interesting views. Um, my, I find this very difficult because um, I, there are a lot of things about this development that I find um, unfortunate. And, and one of those fundamental ones is because of the change in the outline, it's the potential that the development could effectively jeopardize the way in which the land might be used for playing fields in future uh, and but as that is outside the red line that's a difficult argument to make um i wish we could ask that the five houses uh, north of those at rampton road were removed but we have the plan as it is in front of us um I'm also very disappointed that there isn't any internal connectivity to the um, east, to the core of the village. Again, that's outside the red line. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat astonished that the illustrative master plan was not one of the documents that was um, itemised in the outline consent. Uh, and the other one is regarding the houses north of those um, which are currently north of Rampton Road I am really disappointed by the statements uh, you know that goes through from paragraphs 273 to 282 where in each case the reference is given um, saying that the back-to-back -back distances we'd like are a minimum of 15 meters um, and these are all you know approximately 14 meters when in fact they're a bit less you know uh, and then there's you know loss of privacy between some plots but we think this is on balance this is just acceptable and and as uh, parish councillor morris said you know if you always go and say well this on average it's okay then you'll end up with a substandard development. And I think that's a great shame. Um, so given that this might go one way or another, I would just like to request a condition um, if it's possible to do that. And I'm, I'm not quite sure if it is possible to do it, is that if this is approved, that we make a condition that wherever possible, the existing hedgerows should be maintained in, in, where, in their current location, wherever it's possible to do that. And if necessary, they might be cut shorter because I would like to see, you know, this council has a commitment to biodiversity and for <coughs> connectivity for um, wildlife. And so if it's possible, perhaps can't, uh, Chris Carter could advise us whether we could put in a condition that mentions maintaining existing hedgerows wherever it's possible to do so uh, and not simply saying oh we can replace them with 300 meters of new ones because that's not quite the same particularly the ones around Rampton Road which are a very ancient hedgerow which will have um, you know wildlife associated with it which would take a long time to dis to replace elsewhere could we take advice from chris thank carter you, yes, on that? Yes, about, about to do that thank um, you mr carter do you have your advice on the thank you yeah, th request? thank you chair um well with your agreement I'd, I'd like to ask michael to comment on that because i believe obviously the um hedgerows have been looked at as part of the proposed layouts of this development and, and therefore there is a reason why it's proposed to remove these hedgerows uh, and to plant additional compensatory hedgerow elsewhere so um, it may be that Michael can provide some advice on that and then I can return to the principle of the condition if needs be. All right thank you very much. Mr Sexton. Yeah so I've been looking through the documents I can't find a plan that would clearly show existing and uh, new hedgerows there is obviously this precautionary ecological report that was required as part of the reserve mass application which does talk about retention of hedgerows, but there's no plan, unfortunately, that indicates which ones. That has been reviewed by our ecology officer and they're, 
they're satisfied with the details and that would be one of the approved plans. Um, I think it's important to note that the outlying consent has imposed conditions that require the details of hard and soft landscaping and boundary treatments and I think that's where we would start to get a lot more detail um, in terms of the, the hedgerows to be retained and perhaps you know we could impose if if we wanted to approve we could perhaps impose an inform informative the effects that Council Bradham is is seeking that um, as part of those details to come forward through a potential discharge of conditions applications we would like to see as much of the existing hedgerow on site retained where it is practically possible to do so. So I think perhaps an informative that refers back to those details reserved by condition um, might be a, an appropriate mechanism rather than a, a condition. That would be my my view, Chris. Thank you. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Michael, for that clarification. So I think that's an important point that there are already conditions on the outline permission uh, which will help to deal with this. So I would be happy to agree that a, a, an informative along the lines that Michael just set out would be perfectly appropriate to include. And, and um, Mr Carter, could I just clarify that that could include both the hedge along Rampton Road as well as the hedge uh, on the, let's call it, eastern side that, that skirts around the eastern side of the road because uh, currently, if we can be clear, at the northeastern extremity of the development currently, the road bends round in a curve, and that dis is described exactly by the current location of a hedge. And yes. I would like that to be maintained as well as far as possible. Oh. Elsewhere on that red line, um, if you zoom in very closely and go to the small print, it refers to this as a, t a, a low timber a low level timber fence with trellis above. Um, that's to the um, north of the, the, the middle block, as it were, and then down towards the um, ones nearer the southern end of the site, it refers to a knee rail. Um, but wherever it's possible, I would like us to maintain that hedge if it was going to be approved. Yes, we can certainly indicate that preference, Councillor Bradham, through the informative and those details, as I say, will be a requirement to discharge that condition of the outline consent, as, as Michael explained. So, yes. OK, but it's yes if the rest of the committee want to do that. So shall we deal with that now? Uh, the additional uh, informative that Councillor Bradham is suggesting. Um, <coughs> are we all in favour of that? Is there anybody against? I'm waiting, I haven't heard anything. No, so by affirmation then we have the informative as per you know, the discussion just then. Um, I'd also say that the chat, the meeting chat should only be used by members of the committee, please. Um, our next speaker. Councillor Ripith is next. Councillor Ripith, please. Thank you. Thank you um, for letting me come in again. Just to highlight, I think we can get something better than this. I don't think this is good enough and I will be voting against, but I'd also like to mention I did come to this meeting afresh at the start and yes, it was useful to view the site, but I've listened to all the speakers and you know, coming to my own conclusions from what they said. And um, thank you also to Michael Sexton for the point about the two hectares and the space. And not all of that was housing, but he did say it would be 20 dwellings short. So that makes more 134. I just think there, there is an opportunity here um, for the developer to come back with something which is more sustainable um, not as um, cramped in and which offers more of a biodiverse, sustainable development. Thank you very much. And the, your grounds for refusal are? Councillor Ripith? Um, design. All right, design. We've um, had height and numbers previously. Um, yes, height and numbers and design, I think, are the strongest ones. Right. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Thane, is it you that wish to speak now? Yes, Chairman, thank you. Yeah. Um, I 
would say briefly that I agree very much with what uh, Councillor Khan said. Uh, I think we both listened very sympathetically to the concerns raised by local people. But the question at the end of this is whether there are any grounds to refuse based on material considerations. In my view, clearly there are not. I shall be voting for it. We also have Councillor Wright wanting to speak, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wright, please. Thank you for letting me come back, Chair. Um, I'm not happy with this, and I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Ripeth that I don't think this application is, is there. You know, this is one of our most experienced uh, parish councils. They carry a lot of weight in what they say. But my main reason for refusal will be policy COH forward slash one. Uh, the, the damage to the vista from the road um, because the houses are too close to Les King Wood. Thank you very much, Chairman. OK, thank you, Councillor Wright. Then I think we have Councillor Daunton. Right, Councillor Daunton, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I've listened very carefully to all the arguments and I'd like to thank the officer and all those who presented it. It's a very difficult site um, and the arguments for and against very powerful. Um, I'm very much inclined. I, I'm concerned about several things. First of all, uh, the attention or lack of attention, it seems to me, to be paid to the neighbourhood plan and the village design statement. Um, Secondly, um, the characteristics that the height of the building uh, on the design element. And, and thirdly, I think we've not we have heard about the drainage questions. I'm not sure we've paid enough attention to that. And I know that there was recent flooding in Cottenham and, and I do have serious concerns about the drainage issues. Um, and as Councillor Ripper said, I, I think that we could do better on this side. And um, I, I will be voting against it. Right, thank you. Councillor Richard Williams is next. Right. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Oh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I've listened with great interest to the debate. Again, I'd, I'd like to thank um, the officer, Michael Sexton, for the report, which I thought was an excellent, detailed and very well presented report. Um, as I say, I've listened with, with interest and a very open mind on this. Um, in the end, I think I am concerned about the um, Cottenham local plan COH1 um, not being respected and the uh, height of the buildings and the modern design I think at the end are um, key factors for me so I plan to vote against. Thank you. And I have no other speakers listed at this time. Right okay so are we ready then to go to a vote? Uh, let's be very clear that we need to be voting on the basis of the reserved matters and the reserved matters only. The principle of development it is not in question. Um, the outline is in existence. So reserved matters is about layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, biodiversity and flood and drainage. Um, so what I've heard so far is that the main concern is on design, uh, the height and numbers of houses, in particular, um, not meeting the requirements of the neighbourhood plan COH stroke one re vistas, um, as well as uh, the various bio various issues about hedges and so on. So. If we're ready for a vote, I assume that we um, are going to have a mixed feelings on this. So the proposed... Chairman, before you go to the vote, did you want to take the comments from Chris Carter and Michael Sexton who are asking to speak? Are they? OK. Uh, Mr Carter, then, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to seek a little further clarification on, on potential reasons for refusal. Yeah. Um, I, the point about uh, height is understood. Uh, the point about numbers, um, I just wanted to understand a bit more about the issue with the numbers. Is it members feel that the uh, the scheme is, is too dense, that the 
uh, trying to fit too many homes too close to the wood? Is it that the numbers of homes are blocking the view of the church that's identified in, in the neighbourhood plan? Just so we can be specific about the, the point on numbers, the point about height, um, I, I think both Michael and I understand um, clearly at this stage. Well, numbers, I thought the argument was about it should be pro rata given the reduction in the area. Well, there's no, there's no, with your indulgence, Chair, sorry, there's no, there's no, um, there's no policy to say that that should be the case. What we need to be considering is whether the number of dwellings proposed uh, delivers uh, an appropriate design response to this site. Uh, not simply that um, it should be prorated uh, because of the piece of land that's been removed from from the site since the outline commission. So, so but it doesn't come, no, hang on a minute. Sorry, so, so doesn't that um, come into the vista argument then? Well, that, that's what I'm asking the committee to clarify. Is but, it? But that has the house specifically suggested COH stroke one in the neighbourhood plan would be so, a. So, so if I may paraphrase, is it that the committee considers that the number of dwellings uh, within the reduced site area causes harm to that vista that might not be there if it was a lower number of dwellings? Is that what is that what we're saying? That's right, because they've put yeah. them closer to Les King Wood, which has obscured the vista that would otherwise have been there. Okay, okay, that's fine, and, and therefore the committee considers that that outweighs any other any other benefits along with the height issue as well. well in, in combination with the other factors. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. That's the clarification okay. I needed. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. Did you still wish to speak? Um, my my comments were going to be about numbers as well because there is obviously the established permission for up to 154 dwellings. Um, I think I think it's been clarified. My concern would just be obviously this is very spacious development and if we get very prescriptive about numbers we may see an application come back in that has got much less meaty space although still within requirements and obviously residential space standards may be lost should a developer come forward with a, a more grant form but I think I think yeah what, what's been related with Chris would help us if that was a reason for refusal. Right. Okay okay members could everyone mute please there's some background noise at the moment OK, so the proposal before you or the recommendation before you is for approval plus conditions. I'm going to do a roll call um, vote in just a moment. So if you want to approve it, you're in favour. If you want to refuse it, you're against. Uh, and if you want to abstain, you abstain. So I will now run through uh, the list, so uh, Councillor Bradman. Against, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Khan. Approve. Okay, thank you. Councillor Daunton. Against. Councillor Thane. For. For. Councillor Hawkins. Against. Against. Councillor Ripith. Against. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Against. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you. And my vote is four. So it's three, four, and eight against. The uh, application is therefore refused. Thank you very much. Um, we move on then. Oh, we, what time is it? Hi Chris. Uh, do you want to take a break members? Yes, I think that would be a good idea. Yes, okay. please. What time is it now? 35. Yeah, 10 minutes then um, back a quarter to, to one. Is that all right, Aaron? Are you switching off? Aaron, can you just confirm that the feed is off, please?
Thank you very much, Chair. You're now live again. Thank you very much and welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, we're now moving on to agenda item six, which is on page 101 of your um, agendas. Um, this is application S4243 stroke 19 FL. It's at Orchard Park, land to the west of Neil Drive at Orchard Park. So the proposal is for the erection of two new private residential blocks with linking central element comprising 138 revised from 144 student rooms and associated facilities. A resubmission of application S3983 stroke 18 FL. You will recall um, that we have recently dealt with an application which uh, has an almost identical design. The applicant is Marchingdale Developments Limited. Key considerations will be covered by the presenting officer. This is not a departure. The application is brought to committee because the community council has objections. The agenda says that the parish council does as well, but in fact the parish council chose not to comment, so that's incorrect. The recommendation is approval, subject conditions and an S106 agreement. Presenting officer is Luke Simpson. Uh, would you do you give us your presentation, please, Mr Simpson? Thank you, Chair. Uh, could you? I can um, see that, yep. OK, great. So the proposal is uh, for the erection of two new private residential blocks uh, comprising 138 student rooms. And the site is uh, COM4 in Orchard Park, which you are very likely be uh, very familiar with. Uh, the application site is located within the development framework of Orchard Park and it's situated to the north of Cambridge, uh, south of the A14. And it forms part of a plot known as COM4 because it's described as COM4 in the Orchard Park Design Guide SPD. So the proposal would provide 138 student rooms and associated facilities. There are two linear blocks linked via a bridging element, uh, as you'll see shortly, orientated east to west. Uh, the development would have a maximum of five storeys and a maximum height of approximately 14.2 metres. Uh, block A and the link section across the bridging element would provide 100 self-contained rooms uh, with desk, study space, ensuite, cooking facilities, uh, with communal television and games rooms at ground floor level. Uh, Block B would provide 38 cluster rooms whereby individual rooms benefit from desk and study spaces, non-suites, but cooking facilities with, with occupants of this block utilising, uh, they, they'd have shared kitchen facilities. Um, so there'd also be three accessible rooms. Uh, there'd be a reception area at ground floor and a separate management and warden's office at ground floor level. Uh, so this is a sui generis use, uh, meaning that if the owner wanted to change the use to residential, for example, then they'd need a uh, full planning application in order to do that. They couldn't just change to a residential use from student accommodation. Uh, there are seven car parking spaces proposed and these are all at ground floor level, so there's no basement car park uh, as there was with the recently approved scheme. And there'd be 145 secure cycle parking spaces and there would be a footpath uh, provided to the south. Uh, the scheme includes landscaping and the development would provide accommodation for local educational institutions in particularly uh, sorry in particular crc cambridge regional college who have written a letter indicating an interest in the proposals and who have been involved in formulating the 
proposals as far as I understand. So by way of background, um, this scheme is one of two resubmit resubmitted schemes on this site. So as members will be aware, the two previous schemes, one for build to rent and one for student accommodation, were both refused uh, last year for reasons pertaining to design, landscaping and ecology. The applicant had appealed the previous decisions and these were to proceed by way of a public inquiry. However, as you may well know, uh, planning permission has recently been granted on this site for 80 built to rent flats um, under, under reference S slash 4191 slash 19 slash FL. Um, I believe that was in August. Uh, upon the grant of planning permission, the, the applicant withdrew the appeals. Um, so those, those appeals are no longer proceeding. So this this current scheme is is the remaining um, resubmit scheme that still needs to be determined, um, and should be determined on its own merits as well. Uh, as the chair alluded to, the design of the proposed development is very similar to the previously approved uh, build to rent scheme, and officers consider that all of the previous reasons for refusal have been addressed, as was the case in respect to the recently approved scheme. So there are a lot of similarities uh, between this presentation and the last presentation, but I will go through all the design issues again. Um, so this is an extract from the Orchard Park Design Guide SPD, which shows the COM4 site. Uh, it envisages heights of 12 meters, uh, of between 12 meters and 15 meters for the areas of land to the east of the site. Uh, as you'll note, there's no prescribed height um, for, for the application site, which is uh, this area to, to the west. Um, although the SPD itself, the text refers to nine metre height for other blocks. So uh, the only reasonable conclusion is that the nine metre height uh, relating to COM4 um, can only reasonably relate to this area here. This slide shows the proposed layout on the left and the previously refused layout on the right. As you can see, there have been significant revisions to the design of the proposed development. Uh, so now we've got an east-west orientation as opposed to uh, a north-south orientation. So that was previously one of the reasons for refusal. We weren't happy with the orientation of, of the blocks. Um, purely for design reasons, because most of the development fronting the A14 is uh, orientated east-west. So with the introduction of this bridging element, they have overcome that aspect to the reason for refusal as far as uh, offices are concerned. Uh, there's also a significant increase in the uh, width of the pedestrian link. So, uh, so the, the plan on the on the right hand side showing previously refused development clearly has a, a much narrower pedestrian link, whereas this has been widened significantly. Um, and the distance between the development and the residential dwellings to the south has also been significantly increased, as you can see. Um, given the revisions to the design of the, lay the layout, um, there's significantly increased area available for planting and landscaping as well. Um, so previously, the scheme was refused partly on the basis of landscaping and the fact that we didn't think that the applicant could achieve a high quality landscaping scheme that was viable. Um, we we no longer think we think they've addressed uh, that reason for refusal and that the landscaping proposals can be required by condition and and that actually now um, they are able to achieve a high quality landscaping scheme which is viable previously the previous scheme would have required significant revisions to design so that you don't they'd actually have to move the buildings so so we couldn't have conditioned it previously whereas now we, we're happy that they've overcome that reason for refusal. Uh, this slide shows a section looking west with the proposed development at the bottom and the previously refused development at the top. 
as you can see, the setback from the neighbouring properties to the south has been significantly increased, as I referred to earlier. Um, there's also been an increase in setback at fifth floor level, um, which is, well, as I said, the, the height parameter in the SPD is, is nine metres for, for this plot. Um, and this this development is, is approximately 14.2 metres, but we as planning officers consider that that impact, the impact of the height has been mitigated firstly by the increased uh, distance between the blocks and the residential development to the south, but also with this increased setback at um, the floor level, which um, mitigates the impact. So you can see the height is actually fairly similar between the residential development to the south and, and the fourth um, storey element of the development. Earlier I referred to the orientation of the proposed development. This slide shows how the revised orientation translates when viewed from the south. So the slide at the bottom is the revised proposal and the slide at the top shows uh, the previously refused development with two blocks which were orientated north to south. Um, you'll note that the development now has an east-west orientation as required by the SPD. Uh, the, the bridging design that, that they've used serves to also create a, a more active frontages to the south uh, with pedestrians drawn in to the entrances below. There's also uh, there are increased well, an increased amount of fenestration which creates natural surveillance for the, for the pedestrian link, which we think is also an improvement to the scheme. Uh, these are the pro proposed elevations. Note that the northern elevation facing the A14 uh, includes additional windows, so uh, um, that's that's an improvement. Uh, previously, they were quite blank elevations, so they've improved that slightly as well. Um, as you'll be aware, Orchard Park Community, Community Council objected to the proposed development. Uh, the objections are very similar to the objections made in relation to the build to rent scheme. Um, all of the objections are addressed in the committee report. Uh, of particular note, the current scheme does not include any viability evidence, so uh, there's no affordable housing requirement, so the, the applicant hasn't submitted any viability evidence. So all of the, all of the points relating to viability aren't, aren't actually relevant to this proposed development. Uh, in addition, many of the objections uh, centre on parking and transport. However, there would be a clause in the Section 106 agreement which would require that uh, the tenancy agreement includes a restriction on car ownership uh, with the exception of disabled students. Um, so none of the students would be able to own a car and, and that is a common approach taken for proposals for student accommodation elsewhere in the UK. Uh, including in recent appeal decisions, so it's not an unusual approach and it's enforceable as well. Uh, with regard to the area of the pedestrian, pedestrian link which falls within the ownership of the Community Council, this is not part of the proposed development and is therefore not within the red line boundary, albeit the developer is committed to providing the funding for this part of the footpath link. Uh, the LPA will make these funds available to the Parish Council should they wish to develop this part of the link in accordance with the Design Guide SPD. So this slide just runs through the differences uh, between the refused development and the current proposal. So there's been a reduction in the number of rooms from 151 to 138. Um, as I mentioned, there, there's been an increase in the distances between the blocks and the residential development to the south, uh, quite significant increases, five to 11 metres and nine to 21 metres. Um, and there's also been an increase, um, a further increase at, at the fifth floor level. Uh, as a result of the decreased distances, uh, the, the area around the footpath links been, been increased, as I've discussed. Uh, we've got the bridging element, which creates the east-west orientation, uh, improved active frontages and elevational treatments, 
and increased area available for landscaping. So these are the key uh, material considerations in the, in the determination of this application. In terms of the principle of development, it's considered that the principle is acceptable. Uh, planning permission has recently been granted, as you know, uh, for residential development on this site. With regard to urban design, landscaping and ecology, the reasons, previous reasons for refusal have all been addressed. Um, I haven't mentioned the ecology, but the uh, previous application was refused on partly on the basis that the required uh, survey work um, in relation to a population of lizards, which are a protected species, had not been undertaken. That has now been undertaken and the survey has been submitted. Um, so the ecologist is satisfied, subject to conditions that uh, the ecology reason for refusal has fallen away. So all of the other considerations, uh, relevant material considerations are discussed in detail in the committee report. So in terms of officer conclusions, uh, we consider that the proposed development accords with all relevant development plan policies as set out in the committee report. I think with the build to rent scheme, we, we did identify some minor conflicts um, and there was a bit of a balancing exercise, whereas this scheme, we consider that all uh, development plan, relevant development plan policies are complied with. Uh, there'd be a conflict with the Orchard Park Design Guide SPD in terms of the height parameter, um, but we consider that that's mitigated by the setback at fifth floor level, which you know is exactly the same situation as for the build to rent uh, proposal, which was approved previously. So in terms of design, this is actually almost identical to the previously approved scheme. Um, it's probably actually uh, an improvement because uh, I think block B is um, smaller than the uh, previously approved scheme. So it's actually it's actually better in terms of design than, than the previous scheme. Um, officers consider, consider that there are other material considerations which weigh in favour of the development, which include the social and economic benefits associated with the provision of student accommodation and the provision of 55 units towards the council's housing land supply. Um, just because we mentioned housing land supply, it doesn't, it's not an issue with that. It's obviously a relevant consideration to consider the benefits associated with the provision of housing. Um, and there's a, a requirement to continually monitor and update the housing land supply. That's why we're mentioning it, no other reason. Um, there would be a as well there'd be various section 106 contributions and these are set out in the appended agreed heads of term so they've all been agreed in principle with the uh, with the applicant they include contributions to open space indoor meeting space and a cycleway uh, a contribution to the cycleway link on histon road um, I know that previously in, in relation to the build to rent scheme, there were a lot, so there was quite a substantial debate about contributions and viability. That isn't the case here. We don't have a viability case, and the applicant has committed to making all of the required contributions in relation to this proposed development. Um, as I've mentioned, there'll also be a car ownership restriction, which would be um, with it control and and outlined in the section 106. So on that on that basis, officers consider that um, the development complies with all relevant development plan policies and there aren't any material considerations which indicate that a decision should be made other than in accordance with the development plan. And therefore we recommend that the planning commission is granted subject to the conditions in section 106 uh, contributions as set out in the uh, in the officer report. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Um, points of clarification, please. Chairman, we have uh, Councillor Roberts wanted to speak. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. And through you, Chairman, to the officer. Um, I have a sense of deja vu here um, going on last month, and I'm sure the officers feel a bit the same. However, um, can you just have clarification on first one thing? 
the uh, community council is still objecting. Is that right? Because I, I thought I heard at the first that community council wasn't objecting now, but I mean, all the paperwork is there saying that they object to it. Second point is, um, having been on South Camps for long enough to have remembered the idea behind Orchard Park, uh, the officers agree that actually we are getting a very disproportionate and unbalanced community now uh, here with these various uh, applications. And I'm not at all sure how we can ensure that the implementation of no cars um to the students who would be there can actually happen because this isn't a building that's been built by one of the university colleges is it um, and therefore it's a private uh, development seemingly going to be used by colleges and and given all the problems that orchard park is already suffering from in um parking problems how is that actually going to be police? Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Councillor. The, uh, yeah, the first point you raised about the uh, Community Council that yes, that they are objecting. Um, it's the uh, it's Histon Parish Council who aren't objecting. Um, yeah, thank that. you. Point of clarification um, that Histon obviously objected to the previous proposal, but they didn't comment on this. So they're not supporting, but they didn't comment. Um, the I, I, I'm not really sure what your, your point is in relation to you said uh, the development would be disproportionate to the community. I think uh, I assume you're talking about the, 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 the community council is pointing out very much that um, whereas um, they are looking to be having much more family homes, um, what is happening there is you are getting more and more and more applications being approved for single occupancy, um, you know, rooms basically. OK. Um, well, I don't I don't really see how that's necessarily an issue. I mean, in policy terms, I don't think we have any policies which require um, certain tenures in certain locations as such. Um, I would also say that actually um, this will take some of the pressure off some of the um, traditional residential development in Orchard Park, um, which probably which presumably accommodates um, some students. Um, so this provides purpose built student accommodation. So well, it's going to actually take some of that pressure away from from Orchard Park, which would potentially um, be, be beneficial in, in the terms which you suggest, um, because it will free up some of the housing stock for potentially families. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a policy basis for uh refusing on on the grounds that it's uh, out keeping in social terms um i think yeah policy hq1 has provision for um social um, let's have a look so with me Is somebody having a bath? Uh, well, I, I've got a policy in front of me, but there are there are aspects to policy HQ1 which allow for, um, well, require consideration of social cohesion. I don't think that's how it's particularly how it's phrased, but um, you could hang something on that if, if you if you wanted to, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm satisfied that the development is in keeping and there's no reason to consider that a student accommodation in this area would would um, be out of keeping in sort of social terms. Um, in terms of your other points, in relation to the car parking, the um, 
that is that can be controlled because the section 106 agreement will require that the tenancy agreement which which students sign up to stipulates that they can't own a car unless they're disabled um, that is a common approach taken to student accommodation um, nationwide so in, in many instances um, section 106 agreements are used to control car ownership in that way um, so it's, it's not uncommon and, and there's a recent appeal decision in Southampton where the inspector took the same approach um, so it you know that as far as we're concerned that's enforceable Fine, good thank you very much uh, next Councillor thing, Bradnam Councillor Bradnam please Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm with you. Um, so two things. Um, one was I just wanted to seek some clarification on sort of principles uh, and the other was a particular one. So given that the previous approval for the build to rent has already been approved, I just wanted to clarify if this were also to be approved, uh, for student accommodation, could the applicant simply choose which, which uh, application they chose to deliver? Um, That's which the bottom? Oops. Is and now that, exiting. Thank you. Uh, and the second question uh, was um, at the um, southwest of the corner of the site, uh, there's reference on the site plan to the pedestrian link outside the applicant's ownership for indicative purposes only. Can you just clarify, I'm, I'm sure it's in the papers somewhere, but is there some uh, confirmation somewhere that that will be um, secured as a as a route act, uh, onto, I think it's Chieftain Way, isn't it? Yes. Um, so firstly, yes, the developer uh, can implement either consent. Um, secondly, the the section 106 agreement uh, includes provision to provide funds to the Orchard Park Clinic Council in relation to that part of the um, pedestrian link should they wish to uh, construct it in accordance with the Orchard Park Design Guide SPD, but it falls outside of the uh, applicant's ownership um, so that they're only responsible for the development which falls within their ownership. So, um, so that piece of land is in the ownership of Orchard Park, so it's yeah, for them to develop yes. if they want to. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Chairman, yeah, I think I'm probably next and then Councillor Richard Williams after that. Councillor Fain then. My question related to the, uh, the setback, um, I think the, my impression is that this has been set back significantly to the south from the buildings to the south on the fifth floor, but actually these the buildings the refused application. I'm not quite clear because I haven't done the comparison whether that setback is any different from the uh, from the other application which has now been approved, and indeed. this today. Your sound was breaking up there, uh, Councillor. Did, did you get that? No, could you? Would you like me to repeat? Mr. Simpson, thank you. Yes, you could. Yes, my question related principally to the setback to the north, which used from that which was shown on the original. It's not quite this setback is different from that in the I, I think I'm sorry I'm having trouble with my mute button going on and off right. uh, I will try one more time if I might may chairman please concerns the setback from the busy a14 to the north which has been re reduced as against the refused application I think it may be the same as in the alternative application I'm just wondering whether uh, that is an issue which is relevant a material consideration here given the amount of work that's been going on beside the A14 and the lack of access to that edge of the A14 other than by taking this this land here 
Is that a factor that we should consider? I, are you, I, firstly, the setback from the A, A14 is very similar to the previously refused application. I think it's slightly increased, but that relates to the uh, an issue with the application site boundary. So it's had to be revised very slightly, but um, we're, we're perfectly satisfied that the prox proximity and relationship between the development of the A14 is acceptable in in policy terms. Um, that's that wasn't hasn't cropped up previously um as uh, as an issue and it certainly wasn't a reason for refusal in relation to the uh refused scheme and i think the uh, orientation of the building related buildings well it is one building in relation to the um a14 is very similar to uh, if not identical um in terms of proximity to the previously approved uh, build to rent scheme as well. Thank you for that. Chairman, I think next we have Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've, I've got three points um, of clarification for the officer. Um, the, the first is about the orientation of the building again, so this north, south, east, west issue. On the diagrams we were shown, I, I just, just want to sort of clarify that, of course, there's the bar going across between the two buildings running north, south, but of course the bottom of that would be opened. I think on the diagram it was it was shaded in grey, but of course it will be open. And looking at the building from the A14, the north elevation, um, it was a one-dimensional drawing we got, but of course given the perspective and the depth, the link would actually look a lot smaller in, in, in reality than, than, than it did on on, on that drawing. Um, so I, I, I just still have a, a an issue with this being classified as definitely east-west when there's a strong north-south element to it. Um, okay. on, the, on, on the question of parking, now joining. Just, just to note a couple of points. I mean, seven spaces doesn't seem very much. I know students, well, students are not, not supposed to have cars, but students often do, but on, on travel days, um, when students are arriving and leaving, 155 students will create quite a lot of um, cars. Um, so I'm not quite sure where they'd go. And just to pick up on the, my final point on what Councillor Roberts talked about, um, I think it, it was in the presentation, the social benefits of student housing was cited as a material consideration. Well, I, I, I would ask the question, what about the social benefits then to Orchard Park? Because if social benefits of the development are a material consideration, then I think we have we can legitimately look at the social benefits or disbenefits to the community in Orchard Park from having a large transient um, population centre. OK, uh, on the I suppose on the orientation point, uh, I'm not really sure if that was a question or not, but I think the way I see it is that the uh, the bridging element introduces um, a building which uh, has the appearance of being east-west orientated as opposed to north-south so it's a significant improvement um, what you know most of the development fronting the a4 well backing on to the a14 is orientated east-west um, that's that's the reason why we, we wanted the east-west orientation in the first place. That's that's the reason part of the reason why the SPD envisages it, it envisages it. Um, but it also envisages east-west orientation for uh, noise attenuation purposes. But there is no um, noise um, issue here, and and there never has been. So so the only reason it was refused previously was on character grounds, and and I'm satisfied that. The, the bridging element is a significant improvement and and it does result in a development which is in keeping with that predominant east-west character. Um, in terms of the parking, uh, yeah, valid point about um, end of term, beginning of term, uh, we would, well, we have proposed a condition uh, in relation to a, a drop off um, pick up management plan and that, I think that was requested by the local highway authority so so there is um, a mechanism to control the impacts associated with um, the beginning and end of term 
And moving on to your uh, final point, which is a good point. Um, yeah, this uh, economic, environmental and social impacts of development um, are often material. Well, they are material considerations in the determination of planning applications and they can um, go either way. Uh, so there could be environmental benefits or um, disbenefits. So in terms of the social benefits, I, I, I think there are social benefits through um, supporting um, uh, local education institutions and I think that and providing housing for, for young people involved in those institutions and I think that's a significant benefit associated with the scheme. I don't see any um, social disadvantages uh, but you know that's something for members to consider um, and if they do then yeah they need to weigh that um, do, do those disadvantages outweigh um, uh, or warrant a decision other than in accordance with the development plan policies? That's a, that's a difficult question, but I certainly haven't identified any, so um, hopefully that answers your, your question. All right, thank you very much. Chairman, we have one other speaker listed. It's, um, oh, Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam, you already had the speaking. <laughs> thank you Is very this a much. New Yes, it is a new point. Thank you. Um, sometimes these things um, evolve as you hear what other people say. Um, so my concern was, uh, as it is for any development at Orchard Park, is to do with the car parking. And I wanted to clarify um, uh, whether there, who would, so who would be responsible? You, you said there was a management plan for pick up and drop off days, but who will be responsible for monitoring the car parking and also how will that be enforced? Because if it falls to, for example, civil enforcement um, or the police, that's not going to be done. And I just I just wanted to check how it's, you know, it's rather difficult. It's rather different to a situation in Cambridge colleges where there are sanctions that they that can be applied because the people are in the college. I'm just wondering how you think that might be uh, done because it would not be appropriate for that to fall to the parish count the community council okay yeah so as i mentioned there's um uh, the reason it can be controlled by uh, section 106 agreement is because we can control the uh, content of the tenancy agreement which applies directly to the site um so what we're saying is that there should be specific uh, clauses included in the tenancy agreement, which would require that students don't own a motor vehicle unless they're disabled and set out the implications, uh, which are also specified in the Section 106 agreement. Um, should they breach that um, requirement? So I Without, I don't know the specific detail. Let me just have a quick look. Um, Sorry, so my I... point was that if they simply say, no, I don't have a car and then park it somewhere else on Orchard Park, there's very little way anybody could monitor that. Well, it's the same as any enforcement issue. So if someone raises it as an issue with us, then we would approach the management company um, and refer to the 106 agreement and um, action should be taken in accordance with the, with the contract which should set out the implications for not complying with um, with that requirement. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay members, uh, I've got two public speakers uh, to call. Um, once we've done that I'll, I'll be adjourning for half an hour for lunch. Um, so just so you're aware. So um, can I call Mr. Fulton? Is Mr. Fulton with us, please? Yes, hello. Afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Bradnam has already addressed the point I was going to raise, and that is that the, uh, the application under consideration today does not actually approve a functional pedestrian link between Mill Drive and Chieftain Way. Yeah, okay. okay. Hang on a minute, because uh, we're 
you know, we have to deal with this by, pro by process, uh, Mr. Fulton. Ken Winterbottom. So, so uh, is now yeah. exiting. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, you know the process, don't you? So we've got yeah. three, three minutes, and uh, whenever you're ready, you can start that, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I was just saying that Councillor Bradnam has already addressed the uh, point I was going to raise that the application before the committee today does not actually provide for a functional pedestrian and cycle link between Neil Drive and Chieftain Way. Uh, but I think that's been adequately covered by officers. Um, uh, that was my chief concern, um, and um, I don't think it complies with the requirement in the SPD, uh, but I'll thank the committee for the time and I'll let you move on to other speakers. Uh, well, right. well, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. Uh, uh, our second speaker is on behalf of the applicant, and it's Mr. Watson. Is Mr. Watson with us, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Hello, Mr. Watson. Hello. Good afternoon. Again. Welcome. Um, you know the the uh, process. You've got three minutes, so whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as members are aware through the presentation, um, a proposal to deliver 80 built to rent apartments was approved on this site in August. Like that proposal, this application for the student accommodation is also a resubmission following an earlier refusal, which had raised concerns over the scale and massing of the buildings, the quality of the landscaping and a lack of a protected species survey. In approving the amended build to rent scheme in August, the committee agreed that an appropriate protected species survey had now been submitted and that demonstrated that there was no harm. The reduction in the length and the footprint of the buildings and the increased separation which results between the proposals and the buildings to the south as has been walked through today in the presentation had improved and that was now acceptable. And subject to appropriately worded conditions, the committee agreed that a, an appropriate landscaping scheme could be delivered. Now, as is noted in paragraph 75 of your officer's report, and again, as has been presented this morning, th this scheme is very similar to the built to rent scheme. The main differences are that the eastern block, built block B, is actually set even further back from the southern boundary than the previously approved built to rent scheme. There are more windows facing south addressing the footpath link, and of course, the building is subdivided to provide student rooms rather than flats. As with the built proposal, therefore, officers believe these um, changes have addressed the previous concerns and it, it's recommended for approval. Whilst car parking provision was not a previous reason for refusal, it was debated at some length when we um, considered the build to rent scheme in, in, in August and it's been raised again this morning. Um, by its nature, this scheme is quite different in terms of the need for control of site parking. There's a much lower demand for parking and there's a far greater ability to control the behaviour of the tenants in this case. A Section 106 agreement is proposed, as you've heard, that will ensure that the tenancy agreements which are entered into, the, into by the students before they can take a res residency makes clear that they are not allowed to own a car and bring a car to the site. As is noted in paragraph 138 of your Oxford report, the County Council's Transport and Highways Development Management teams are both very happy with this approach and it is approach which is, is used elsewhere. In conclusion, paragraph 61 of the MPPF advises that it's necessary for local planning authorities to have regard to the need to provide housing for a range of people, including students who do form an important part of the local community. This proposal would provide much needed high quality, dedicated student accommodation. And at the same time, it would assist in easing the pressure on and loss of family housing to the multiple occupancy market. We really do therefore hope that the committee will feel able to support the officer's recommendation and to grant permission for this scheme. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Hang on, hang on a minute. There may well be some questions, I think. Um, do we have questions, Councillor Thane? Councillor Thane may well be having some difficulty. Question from Councillor Roberts. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Roberts, please. Um, thank you again, Chairman, and through you, Chairman, I would like to ask the applicant. Um, in your previous uh, encounters with South Cam's 
about these sites. Um, you were going to go to appeal and part of your appeal argument was going to be that South Cam's District Council does not have a five year land supply. Is that still your um, stance? Um, and would you use that again um, if we refuse this and it went to appeal? Um, now, come on. We have to only ask questions which are relevant to the actual planning application. Chairman, it's terribly relevant. Well, I, I, I don't think. Especially that's... given pre-meeting advice a little while ago. Well, indeed, I mean, but you know, there's no can reason to respond to that. The applicant can give us an answer. Or can I mean, we it's up to Mr. Watson if he wishes to give an answer. I'm happy to answer if you'd like me to, Yes, Councillor. Um, this application, as I think your, your officer pointed out, is um, in accordance with the development plan. So where applications are in accordance with the development plan, we don't need to try and run other arguments that, that would support the application. The five year land supply um, argument was to do with specifically with the appeal where the council was was arguing that our proposal did not uh, um, accord with all of the development plan policies and as is a often used approach where land supply is let's say at question um, if a council is found not to have a land supply a five-year land supply then it would um, assist a, 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 an inspector if we were at appeal um, to be able to say well even if I take the view there are some harmful impacts from this development it doesn't account accord with all the council policies the fact you don't have a land supply um, would outweigh that now this is a total different position and we haven't made that case in respect of this application because it, it's fully in accordance with the development plan to answer the second part of your, your question if in six months, eight months time, we happen to be down the, the road and we were at an appeal, and at that point we re-looked at this and the council you know, didn't have a land supply, it had an adverse appeal decision in the intervening period. It's quite possible we would raise it, you know, we would have to raise it, but it's it's not a part of our case at the present time. It's okay. not what you said before though, is it? You said thank, we thank have you, to Thank you very here. much for that. Thank you. OK, um, do we have any more speakers? Councillor Thane. I have no other speakers listed. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. All right. OK, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a quick one for Mr Watson. Um, just picking up on the point I made and, and Councillor Bradnam made, can I just ask Mr Watson how he would imagine the um, plan for pick up and drop off management and traffic to be enforced? Yes, certainly. Um, well, depending on if, if this scheme went forward and it was, for example, taken up and it was wholly used by Cambridge Regional College, it's likely they would be managing it. And as part of the um, condition that, that Luke Simpson referred to, would we either we or the college or the management company, if it wasn't being run by the college, would have to submit details of how they would cover these points. Now, when I went to university many, many years ago, even then, this was a big issue and you actually had to book a time for your parents to arrive with your car packed up and they would say we've got 10 spaces or we've got five spaces and you had to be there over the weekend whether it was the Friday the Saturday Sunday so I'd imagine something like that would be done where it would be managed so people arriving and leaving would be staggered and if people you know you're going to get the odd person who who, who um, causes the problem and arrives at the wrong time but it, that that's I believe the way they do it all right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Khan and right. Councillor Bradman. Right, OK, and then that's the end of that after that. Thank you. <coughs> so <coughs> Councillor Khan, please. Um, just whilst I've, I've got you, Councillor Khan, are you going to want to speak as a local member or are you happy no, to wait for the debate? I'm not, in, I'm not huh? intended to. I'm not intended to. No, I'm not intending to speak as a local right, member. Right, fine. Thank you very much. But uh, the uh, sorry, I really wanted to. There was I am the local member for for Orchard Park, but I was going to say that the local council uh, community council was concerned about the where the students were coming from, what sort of students uh, are proposed. 
uh, you haven't uh, have you any um, clarity about who would be uh, where the students would come from, what the arrangements would be, who would be the management, or it, um, is that completely open at this stage? Uh, yes, well, Councillor, the, the application was put together with support from Cambridge Regional College, and you'll have seen there is a letter of support with this application that they prepared. Um, they're not obligated to take this if we get planning permission today. We hope, you know, we hope they would still want to do that, and that would be down to uh, the owner of the, the site to decide whether he goes ahead with the bill to rent scheme or, or, or this. But assuming it was. Um, Cambridge Regional College. My understanding is very much that they are trying to boost overseas students to a degree who will come over and when people are coming from overseas they expect um, a proper standard of accommodation. And I think what I was in discussion with them was told that many years ago you could you could get someone, one of the lecturers would, would give someone a room and they would have a, a, a shared property but that doesn't work anymore. If people are coming and paying fees for a course they need proper accommodation. So I believe the majority of people would be would be coming um, from further afield. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Bradman. Um, Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to moot possibly with Mr Watson or. Well, I'll try you to begin with. Um, you mentioned about the fact that the parking would be controlled by means of a tenancy agreement. And as you described, you said, I think I heard you correctly, saying um, that it would they must be they must confirm that they either don't have a car or they won't bring it on site. Now, of course, of course, they're not going to be able to bring it on site because there's only seven car parking spaces. But the concern is whether they bring it onto Orchard Park. And I'm just wondering, is there any scope to say that to extend that exclusion zone because otherwise the police or whoever chooses to enforce will not be able to enforce it. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's probably the way I, I spoke. What I meant was that they should not be coming and taking up a tenancy at this building if they are proposing to bring a car with them and whether that's on site or in the road next door, they shouldn't be bringing it with them. It's, it's a, it, it needs to be framed in such a way that it's enforceable if they choose to park off site, but on Orchard Park. Yeah, I, I suspect there will be a radius of how far away they may be allowed. Yeah. Okay, well, they're not allowed you. a car at all, are they? That's the point. So yeah, uh, no, I just mean if they've got one at home <laughs> at their parents' yeah. house, 100 miles away. Well, indeed, but you, know, you haven't got any answer to that, yeah. obviously. I think. Okay. okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Watson. Thank uh, you. I'll let you go now. Um, and members, I think we'll take a break now for lunch. Um, so we'll take a half an hour and we'll be back again in action at 10 past two, please. Chairman, can I ask, have we not got anybody from the parish council? Uh, no, the parish council chose not, to, uh, the community council chose not to speak. Thank you, Chairman. They were invited, obviously. OK, uh, Aaron, uh, are we closing down, please? Uh, Aaron, have you confirmed closure? Is Aaron still with us? Sorry, Chair, I've been having issues with my microphone.
Thank you very much, Chair. We are now live again. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, we're currently dealing with uh, the application at Orchard Park. Um, we've already heard the officers' reports and the contributions from uh, uh, members of the public and interested parties. We're now moving on to the debate on Orchard Park. So members, uh, over to you. Who would like to start uh, the debate? Do we have any speakers? Sorry, Chairman, I've registered to speak. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Fain, you uh, can I just check if Councillor Thain is operational? Is he been having trouble? I'm with you. I'm not sure if I'm operational. Okay, fine. Noted. Uh, Councillor Bradman, then, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I uh, just wanted to acknowledge um, the 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 fact that we've had one application for one sort of thing um, back in August, which was approved, and now we've got this application. Um, and in many ways, I feel this application looks preferable to the previous one we had, uh, but I think it still has the potential to visit quite a lot of problems on the community at Orchard Park and I think it's a shame that they haven't been able to mm. attend. I quite appreciate uh, they give their time you know, voluntarily and this may not be a convenient time and they've they've given such detailed objections um, on this site in the past. I, I think it's not unreasonable that they didn't attend again, but I just think it's a shame because what we know is that last time they spoke very powerfully about how much they how hard they have tried to build a community at Orchard Park and how difficult that has been when the developments that have been have been approved have encouraged a development of transients and you know they they make a little headway with something like Marmalade Lane and and they've worked so hard on the community council um, and then this sort of application could um, damage that community again, not for any bad wishes of the people involved or living in the development, but just because they won't have a commitment to the community. Um, so I think it's a great shame. Having said that, I don't think that now there are sufficient reasons to refuse this application. Um, so I and because I think it's actually preferable to the one we looked at before. Uh, I think I'm still holding my judgment, but um, I'm hovering in the middle. <laughs> Thank okay, you. We'll leave you hovering then. Um, I can't see any more speakers. So does the local member wish to speak? Councillor Khan again. Councillor local Council member. Councillor Khan. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm commenting. Uh, uh, the um, this application in terms of its uh, physical structure and, and relationship and the problems in the previous the previous uh, appeals which were withdrawn um, meets all the requirements in the same way, uh, way as the one that's approved in August in terms of retra retracting from the uh, development of the south its size and its location uh, and it's having a different orientation most of the concern appears to be the fact that it's student accommodation and um, Yes, we have the alternative of either independent uh, accommodation or for small, you know, small studio flats for working people or uh, student accommodation, which is a, a larger number. Both of these have potential problems with traffic. But we've been told from experience elsewhere that uh, the sort of condition they plan to uh, apply to it is acceptable. So I don't think we've got a grounds for turning down the application on the basis of the type of um, development that uh, the, the, the 
improvement in terms of much better improved landscaping than even the previous one, which has been approved. Um, uh, uh, and the social type of students that you might have is not something that really is a um, uh, an issue in terms of um, uh, plan, planning uh, considerations. So I don't really see what grounds one would have to turn it down. I think uh, uh, it's one that we go, we we would be wanting to approve, even if the local community is is concerned about it, and I know they are concerned about it. Um, so that, that's my, my my view on it. All right, thank you very much. We have Councillor Roberts and then Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my sense of deja vu continues and grows. I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm just amazed that it's quite clear that this is going to cause a real bad slant to Orchard Park. And I've been on the council long enough to remember, like, like you, Chairman, when Orchard Park was basically just still in, 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 in dream shape. And it was certainly not to have it as a, you know, lots and lots of um, very tiny uh, apartment type, uh, one room, be you know, beds, bed sits. It, it was to have a community. And I'm just, I'd be absolutely amazed um, that members uh, are going along with, with this sort of application. Um, it's going to cause problems of that I have absolutely no doubt um, just by the very numbers of students and actually I'm just wondering how many students will actually go here because if you ask any of the uh, private schools who've got boarding in Cambridge now um, all their overseas students most of which are Chinese I think are not coming back they have no idea when they're going to come back so actually, what happens to these uh, flats? Um, should the student population decrease? And I mean, the universities are concerned about this. Who is going to get these places? And because it's not university owned and controlled, it's an, it's a, it's an open area, isn't it? To, to do anything and anything with. They will fill them. This developer will fill them and he will have to fill them. Uh, but exactly with whom is he going to fill them if it isn't students? And the parking, we already heard, we heard at the last time it was for the other application when it came back to us, about the huge amounts of parking problems in Orchard Park. Now, I don't care what anybody says about, oh, well, the restrictions on students, they will ha have cars. They they need to go and see their parents, they need to go and see their friends, they need to go up to London. Um, they're not all going to get on bikes or, or buses or trains. And, and we are going to have a problem. So it seems to me it, it, it's horrendous that a district council um, can actually, not realising the harm that is going to be done with this against any perceived um, good, I mean, it's it's a nightmare. We are going to turn Orchard Park very sadly, and it's all there on the, in the ruins. We are going to turn Orchard Park into the ghetto of the future, and it won't be very far many decades down um, down the road that we do that. I mean, we just shouldn't be allowing this. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Payne. Do we have further? Councillor Heather Williams. Right, that be Heather Williams, please. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I've listened very carefully to the representations that have been made, um, and, and I think the officer's done a good job of putting the case together for us. Um, but I, for myself, I don't think that significant amount has changed in, well, not enough has changed since we originally looked at this. And I'm looking at page 113, paragraph 72, with our reasons for the um, refusal last time, and one of which was that uh, it didn't fit in with the surrounding area because of its height, the three-storey residential development directly to the south of the application site. And, and obviously this is still a, still a very large dominating building for that area. Um, 
it's there are lots of things that are, are undesirable in it for example odors and other things that are referenced with the drainage concerns and and what have you um you know the students having to deal with this just having to deal with the smells that have been warned about that's that's undesirable but they're probably not material um i'll take your steer on that chairman about noise and um levels etc that have been raised through the report but it, it's just it hasn't changed enough it's not good enough in our representation last time we said that it did not represent high quality design um and i still stand by that personally in in my view and i will be voting against um and not putting this on the residents there thank you very much councillor richard williams councillor richard williams please thank you thank you very much chair um, I, speaking for myself, I, I, I still have concerns about the orientation of the building. I'm not convinced it's it's really north south or um, east west rather. I think there is at least as strong a case to argue it's north south as east west. It really is a matter of judgment, and I I I, I make the judgment that it's still predominantly north south. Um, just to go back to a point that that we've already discussed, but to pick up on something that, that Councillor Khan said. I mean, the you know the impact of a development on the occupiers of neighbouring land can be a material consideration. It clearly can be, um, and that can include the impact on the the neighbouring community. So so I think the concern about um, student accommodation and the development of Orchard Park, the Councillor Roberts and Councillor Bradnam and various others I think have, have flagged up, I think it was Councillor Bradnam as well, um, These that, that can be a material consideration and, and that is a consideration for me. Um, I think it's a very important consideration. Thank you. Chairman, I have no other speakers listed. Right, lovely, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, we... Uh, we'll... Chairman, I now have Councillor Nick Wright. Oh, Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. And I just wanted to add, like Councillor Roberts, I've sat on quite a lot of these applications at Orchard Park. And she, you and myself all remember that the point of the buildings at the front of the development against the A14 were to, they were to have industrial use to screen the residents behind. Now, you know, putting students in this is not, a, it's not that sort of use and they will have to suffer the air pollution from the road, the noise pollution from the road, and the argument that CRC have expressed an interest baffles me slightly, as most of their students come from the village colleges locally, and I, I don't understand why they're looking for, uh, you know, accommodation, which, you know, which is slightly baffling. Uh, so I, I have my concerns about this application too, and we'll be voting accordingly. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. That uh, is our last speaker. Yes, thanks. Well, perhaps I might have a word then. Um, members, you have to keep in mind that this has already been through a refusal process, and the officer is very clearly telling us that uh, the grounds for refusal that we have had previously in their opinion, has been have been met. Um, on that basis, it seems very difficult to actually find uh, actual grounds. Now, a number of you are saying that you want to vote for refusal. Um, I'm not clear on what grounds that refusal would be. So, if somebody would like to uh, give me some flesh on that. I'm assuming in part we've had the issue of the height, which you, you still feel um, is um, material here. Yeah, height. Uh, Councillor Williams uh, has come up. Uh, you go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think Paragraph 72, page 113, I think what you're hearing from a lot of us, and, and I'm sure members will correct me if I'm wrong, is that not there hasn't been sufficient change from the application in our view to actually deal with the problems that we faced last time. Um, and our last time we stated, in the opinion of the local planning authority, the scale siting and massing of the proposed five-storey development would not be in keeping the surrounding area 
and in particular the three-storey residential development directly to the south of the application site. It then goes on to reference page 34 of the Orchard Park Design Guidance SPD and policy HQ1 of the design principles. Now, I appreciate that others may have a different view and, and officers have a different view that, that actually that has been sufficed, but for some of us, it hasn't been. And therefore I'd say the grounds are very, very similar. Okay, thank you, got that. I'd agree with that. And I don't know whether we could add pla uh, parking, Chairman, because I think the parking is going to be a huge, huge problem. Well, I, th I don't think we can actually. The highways, people are raising no objections. And yeah, we've been through this a number of times today. Uh, there's clearly contractual uh, arrangements in place that's, that says people cannot have a car there. So it's very difficult. You know, we can't second guess that. If it's in place, it's in place. Um, so, okay, so hang on. Uh, Mr. Carter, perhaps you could give us your advice on this. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Stephen Reid may be uh, looking to make the same point, but um, I think we need to think about consistency in the decision making. And as the case officer set out, this scheme, uh, whilst there are minor differences, is uh, very, very similar to the uh, build to rent scheme that has been approved by this committee on the same site. And the case officer may be able to advise further on the original reasons for refusal of that scheme and, and, and that how they were overcome and whether or not the similarities with this scheme are such that um, you know, a, a similar approach should be taken. But it may be worth hearing what Mr. Reid has to say, say on that point as well, Chair, if you wish. OK, we're we'll here, Mr. Reid. Uh, Chair, um, I was going to make exactly the points that Mr. Carter has made real concerns as to consistency in relation to the uh, the the design and massing. It, uh, what, what you've heard from the case officer is that the um, in terms of design, in terms of height, uh, this is near enough. Uh, I won't say identical, but it, it is in all material aspects. Uh, very similar to the application that you approved as recently as uh, August. So consistency will okay. need to be addressed. All right, thank you very much. Chairman, okay. if you're prepared to take any further discussion, I have Councillor Heather Williams, Councillor Richard Williams and Councillor Roberts wanting to speak further. Well, I didn't really want to open up it all again, because please make it uh, you know, brief. Councillor Heather Williams, you wish to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, so I wasn't present at the meeting. I didn't vote on the previous one. My understanding is that we we cheat everything on its own merits um, and that we are here to make our opinion as local members or planning committee members or whatever position we may hold at that moment in that time. And, and members do change on committees. Um, the important thing is that we judge it surely on its own merits and okay. therefore if we're but not happy we, we, we can have, use it. But we have to be clear on what, you know, if you want to refuse this you've got to be very clear that it stands up legally. Chairman, my understanding is that I have been very clear for this and it's exactly okay, the yeah, same yeah, reasons yeah, as last I've time. Got you've got HG through one, the design. H34 SPD 2011. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I will try and be brief. I, I, I just want to say these are matter of planning judgments. I, I mean, I, I, I don't doubt the good faith of, of officers at all, but we seem to be being told we've got no choice, that we have to vote the way that we're being told we have to vote. That's not the exercise here. There is planning judgment. Reasons have been given and members of the planning committee might just have a different planning judgment. And, and we can't be told that we aren't basically not permitted to make a different decision. I'm sorry. Well, nobody has said that. Those words have not been uttered. They're p merely pointing out the, uh, um, in their, their terms, what the options are. So um, we got, I think I've got one more, is it? Is it Councillor Roberts? Did you yes, ask? Chairman, I'm trying to be quick. Um, yeah, I mean, the inference is uh, that we, we have no choice, but we clearly do have a choice here. Uh, and we are always 
well reminded by, by officers uh, in very good faith that we must judge each one on its merits. Now, uh, as, as far as um, I am concerned, uh, it hasn't been improved on uh, what was before us for a refusal. It doesn't matter about that other application. We forget that. We look at this one. And actually, we could say that if we give this on top of that other one, <laughs> if we were going to that, then we're going to have a bigger... Is now joining. We are going to have a bigger problem uh, now with this. It's an accumulation, actually, of problems. Uh, you know, the bulk of it, the height of it, um, the effect on the uh, community that are already there, the parking problems that we know are there, and a, a moving, continually moving um, group of residents. Um, and I think all those with this application become ever more serious. That is the whole problem here. Thank okay. you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. We got that. Jim, we also have Martin Carnes, Councillor Martin Carnes, okay. local member, wanting to speak again. Last word on this. Uh, uh, it's it. only a point of clarification I want from the uh, from uh, Mr. Carter or Mr. Reid. Um, the the main the point that they make about consistency is understood that we this application in its physical form is very similar to the one that was previously approved in August, uh, in August, and that is a big criterion. We are going to be hammered at appeal if we go to appeal. Um, on the basis of um, factors which we've already decided are acceptable. So the big differences are really that we're having, we're trying to impose a, a no, don't bring a car, and is that going to be enforceable? And are, is it acceptable to have students? Are we, is it a social impact, an acceptable reason for refusal? Uh, and I would like some indication from, uh, from our st uh, planning staff whether in previous situations uh, it has been considered acceptable to um, refuse applications on the basis of the uh, uh, type of user, um, uh, student, and, and their impact <coughs> on the Whether that's something which is normally successful or is failing, because otherwise we'll spend lots of money fighting an appeal which we're bound to lose. Uh, uh, so I, I'd, I'd like to find some information on that. that would be okay, helpful. thank you very much. Uh, Mr Carter, could you help us there? Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Um, firstly, uh, apologies to Councillor Richard Williams if you felt I was uh, trying to dictate a decision. Uh, that certainly wasn't my intention. Uh, simply listening to Councillor Heather Williams' um, reasons for refusal, citing uh, those set out previously uh, in paragraph 72, uh, they seemed to relate to the design aspects of the building. Uh, and I was simply pointing out the similarities between that and the scheme previously approved by the committee. Uh, Councillor Khan is, is absolutely correct. There are clearly other differences between those schemes and members are perfectly entitled to take those into account uh, in their decision making. Um, I, the only word of caution I would express there is that those issues, uh, I don't believe, were cited in the previous reason for refusal uh, of this uh, student accommodation scheme on this site. Uh, so we would need to be able to explain what the differences are are now that would um, suggest that uh, students occupying the building uh, is is a problem uh, at this stage that that wasn't last time. So that would be my only uh, sort of words of guidance in that respect. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Excuse <coughs> me, right. Chairman. Excuse me, Chairman. Is it possible? Sorry, it's Councillor Anna Bradnam. I do apologise for interrupting, but I'm joining you by phone. My um, internet connection dropped out. I just wanted to let you know for the record right. that I dropped out while Heather Williams was speaking. Um, I think I missed Chris Carter's statement uh, and I came back in when Councillor Roberts was speaking um, at 2.30. Uh, so uh, but can I just have some clarification over whether I can still vote? All right. Our, uh, I, th I think the only, it, thing it, might, the, the only thing might be what um, Chris Carter said. OK, Sorry, right, let's that. check with Mr. Reid. Uh, do you have a view, Mr. Reid? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Unless you want to rerun the last five minutes, my recommendation should be that in line with the comments you made at the start of the meeting, um, Councillor Bradman has uh, missed parts such that my view is that she shouldn't, but she shouldn't vote. But if you wanted to rerun the last five minutes, then I would uh, withdraw that comment. All right, thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, so uh, who, who have you actually missed them? It was, I, it was, uh, Heather Williams was speaking, so I missed the last part of what Heather said. And uh, I think I missed Chris Carter if he spoke between Councillor Williams and then Councillor, I, I came back in when Councillor Roberts was speaking. Right, okay. So what do you want to do? What's your preference? Um, well, I would very much like to hear what Councillor Heather Williams, Chris Carter and Councillor Roberts said, please, if that's possible. Chairman, okay. Councillor Heather Williams has asked to speak again. No doubt she could uh, repeat her conclusion and perhaps Chris Carter might also repeat what he said briefly. OK, yes, we'll do that then. So you, you're with us on the phone now, are you? Uh, I am. I am, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Heather Williams, please. Councillor Heather Williams. Could you just repeat what uh, for the benefit of Councillor? Uh, Chairman, sorry, sorry not to interrupt, but I seem to have rejoined you online. So I'll do that and get rid of the echo. OK, great. OK, Councillor Heather shall Williams, please. Shall I go or should I wait? In a <laughs> no, no, she's with us now. I think. She's now exiting. Anna, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Heather. Okay. I'm here online now. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, right. Could so others take, turn their, their cameras off, please? That's Mr. Reid and Councillor Khan. So I'll, I'll summarise and then uh, Mr. Carter's response left me in a, in a quandary of clarification required. All so right. I'll start with what I said, <sighs> which was that I felt that there hadn't been significant change from the previous um, application that was refused by the planning committee. Um, and I referenced page 113 and paragraph 72, and I read some from that. I don't know if Councillor Bradnam needs me to, to reread that. No, that's um, fine, thank you, I've got that, thank so you. So that, that was that. And then following Mr Carter's response about um, the need for consistency, I just I have clarification that I think is important before I vote that as a member sitting here today is that suggesting that I am bound by the decision of other members on previous days because it's not a case of me me having voted one way one day and one way or next I wasn't on the other one so if Mr Carter could please clarify that um, inference which I have perceived from his statement I appreciate that okay that makes sense but um, my understanding is I'm not bound by other members as long as I've been consistent myself yeah fine uh, councillor Car um, Mr Carter please thank you chair um could you just repeat your advice first and then uh, deal with that one well I, I don't I don't believe that I spoke between councillor Heather Williams and, and uh, councillor Roberts um, I, I did speak afterwards um, just to explain that I thought that uh, councillor Williams uh, suggested reason for refusal which followed paragraph 72 as she's just outlined um, uh, it, it was important that uh, we were um, consistent in our decision making uh, in relation to matters of design and then Councillor Richard Williams uh, commented about other factors such as the effect of uh, students on the local area and I was um, commenting that I felt you know that was perfectly appropriate to to take into account as, as something different but that it wasn't cited uh, at the time of the original refusal. Um, coming to Councillor Heather Williams uh, final point I acknowledge you you weren't on the committee as you say um, I, clearly you can you can make your own mind up on this application uh, without wishing to prolong the pain I don't know whether Mr Reid could offer any um, advice on on that point given that Councillor Williams wasn't present for the the previous decision sorry I can't offer anything further there right thank you very much so are you up to strength there then uh, thank you so Chairman. much Chairman thank you, thank you so okay. much um, I in fact it seems perhaps I missed less than I thought so yes, I did yeah. come back in as Chris Carter was giving his clarification so thank you very much indeed for going through that thank you and Mr Reid do you have any further comments uh, no additional comments chair no additional comments thank you very much all right let's draw this to a conclusion then um, the recommendation before you is for approval subject to conditions and the 106 agreement 
Um, obviously, there's going to be uh, some difference of opinions, so I will have a roll call. So if you're in favour of approval, you are for it. If you want refusal, you're against it. Uh, and if you want to abstain, you abstain. So, is that clear? So, um, Councillor Bradnam, how do you wish to vote? Four. Well, Councillor Khan. Uh, four. Four, oh, thank you. Councillor Dalton. Four. Could everybody mute, please? There's an awful lot of background noise. Everybody should mute. What? Right. Thank you. Councillor Thane, please. Four. Four. Councillor Hawkins. Four. Four. Councillor Ripith. Four. Four. Councillor Roberts. Against Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Against. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Against, Chairman. Thank you. And my vote is four. So it's one, two, three, seven, four, and two, one. Seven and four against. So that is approved. Thank you very much. And we now move on to agenda item seven. Agenda item seven is on page 165 of our agenda. <coughs> and uh, this is application 20 stroke 02881 stroke FUL is at Whittlesford. Uh, it's a factory, 84 Duxford Road, Whittlesford. <coughs> proposal is for the demolition of existing factory premises and the construction of seven dwellings and associated infrastructure, including access, parking, landscaping and auxiliary work. Resubmission of application S stroke 0029 stroke 19 FL. The applicant is Mr. Peter Wed, Wed Joinery of uh, Granta Terrace, Stapleford. Key material considerations will be outlined by the um, presenting officer. This is not, this is a departure. And the application is coming before the committee as it has been requested by the parish council and confirmed at the delegation meeting on the 1st of September. It was considered that having regard to the planning history of the site, the previous refusal at planning committee and the policy considerations associated with the site's location in the green belt, that the application does meet the criteria to refer to the planning committee. The officer's recommendation is approval. The presenting officer is Jan Rodens. So uh, over to you, Jan Rodens, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I confirm that you can see the slide? Yes, you can see that. Thank you. Brilliant. So thank you, Chair. This application is for demolition of an existing factory premises and the development of seven market dwellings. Uh, this is the existing site location plan of the site. As you can see, the access to the site is from Duxford Road and leads behind the properties along Duxford Road. These are the current elevations of the existing factory unit on the site. Uh, the building is, is a mixture of heights and scale. The building is in one main block and there are two smaller separate buildings uh, either side of it. Uh, these are the elevations of the separate buildings that are currently on the site. Uh, this is the proposed block plan of the development. As you can see, the houses are set behind Duxford Road. Uh, this is a further detailed block plan of the proposed site. There is two 
blocks of semi-detached houses and then three separate detached houses. And you can see the purple dotted line on the site plan here is the factory unit that currently exists. So here is a site section of the proposal. So the top line is the semi-detached houses with the flank elevation of plot five, whereas the bottom ones are the detached houses of plot six, uh, five, six and seven. Uh, so plots one to four are semi-detached houses. Uh, they're circled in yellow. They're all three bedroom houses. Uh, plots five and seven are the same design. They're both four bedroom houses and they're detached properties. Uh, plot six is a detached house in, in the centre, uh, circled in yellow at the bottom. So these are going to be some slides showing the pictures around the site. Uh, in the bottom corner is a map with an arrow showing where I've taken the pictures from. So this picture is taken from inside the site looking towards Duxford Road. The dwelling you can see on the left is 84 Duxford Road. Oh no, sorry, sorry, no, this is number 86 Duxford Road. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself already. So this is looking further into the site, um, facing the bend in the access track. The dwelling on the left of the picture, sorry, is 84 Duxford Road. So this is number 84 Duxford Road. This is looking towards the factory from just after number 84. The building on the left is one of the small outbuildings and store and the building on the right is the factory. Uh, this is looking towards the east of the site and out of it. Uh, to the right is the boundary of number 84 and the factory is on the left hand side. Uh, this is part of the flat roof element of the building to the east, which also faces the entrance. This is the same area of the building and has access towards the smaller stores. This is a picture of the smaller stores that backs onto the dwellings along Duxford Road. Here it is again and you can see the buildings behind it. So this is the boundary treatment to the back of Dux the buildings along Duxford Road at the moment. So these next pictures show around the rest of the site. Uh, this one is taken towards the east of the site and towards the main entrance. This is part of the larger element of the factory, uh, which is on the western side of the site. This is the same building you've just seen with its boundary and the fence behind uh, the hedge behind it. Sorry. So this is looking out into the countryside from the west of the site. So for a bit of context to the site, the site is in the green belt. To the north is the development framework of Whittlesford and to the south is the, the development framework of Whittlesford Bridge. So this application is for the resubmission of a previous application, which was S forward slash 0029 forward slash 19 forward slash FL. Uh, the design layout form and other supporting information is the same as previous, previously submitted. The previous application was refused by planning committee for being contrary to policy S7 and S10 as it is outside the development framework, also not in accordance with policy E14 due to the lack of supporting information. As part of this application, new marketing has been submitted, which is in detailed in paragraphs 41 to 49 of the officer report. It's considered that due to the lack of interest in the site during the marketing, marketing of it, uh, the previous reason for refusal has been overcome and hence the recommendation for approval. So the key considerations are in front of you. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the previous refusal was largely on, on the um, loss of employment and the fact that the marketing hadn't taken place. Yeah, that is correct. Was it also the case that it, it's outside the village envelope and in the open country? Then? Green. Yes. So that was a, a, a reason for refusal. So the previous reasons for refusal uh, were um, the first one was because of uh, developments contrary to policy S7 and supporting policy S10 of the local plan. And then the refusal reason two 
was the development would involve the loss of employment land for non-employment use and it doesn't include sufficient evidence to adequately demonstrate the site is inappropriate for employment use and it goes on to say this um, doesn't justify this which is not contrary which is contrary to policy E14. Okay. All right, thank you very much for that. Any points of clarification required? Members, you're happy? I can't see anything. Um, Councillor Fane, have we got anybody? I have no request to speak to you. Oh, so no, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Richard Williams is asking. Councillor Richard Williams props, is asking um, to speak. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, I should say to everybody, I'm, I'm the local member, so um, so just, just to make sure He's that that's joining. clear. Um, there, were, there were just just a couple of points I, I, I wanted to, to to ask for clarification on the officer's report. When it comes to openness of the green belt, um, the officer's report lays some emphasis on the smaller footprint of of the houses versus the factory. But I was wondering if the officer could say something about the the ridge height of the houses, because the ridge height of the houses is 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 large if you like because because the, the 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 row of houses at the back is at the same height as the chimney of the existing site so i'm wondering if the officer could say a little bit about that in terms of impact of the green belt um the, the, the larger ridge height um and i did just have one other point of clarification in the officer's report when we talk about policy e14 it, it wasn't in, entirely clear to me whether the officer was saying that policy had been met or or hadn't um because the statement referred to in paragraph two of e14 where redevelopment which proposes that the loss of employment will need to be accompanied by clear viability or other evidence as to why it is not possible to deliver an element of employment um, as part of the scheme i think the officer's report said that that hadn't been complied with um so so but then the, the rest of the report seemed to suggest that e14 had been complied with so i was, I was a bit um unclear about what the recommendation was there okay no problem um i would I'll go with the green belt one first so there will be some height differences between the uh the factory and the new houses in a rather crucial meeting or trying to be part of a meeting can i call you back tomorrow Thank you so much. OK, sorry. Thanks. Bye. Could you turn your m mic off, please, uh, Councillor? Thank you. Uh, so, um, so, sorry, there will be some differences in height that is agreed between the factory and the houses. Um, the factory is quite varied in, in size. In size. Uh, the main reason that there hasn't been a, uh, there's been a recommendation that it's been okay in the green belt is the overall volume of it so the volume of the factory versus the volume of the houses isn't materially different to itself that's why we've recommended that there's no harm to the openness of the green belt in this instance right. and then uh, policy e14 so there was me one second So part two does go on to say about the needs of viability report for it. In the supporting information that was part of this application, uh, as an estate agent did market the site for 12 months. They had very, lit very little interest in the site and the four people that did come and have a look said that they wouldn't be able to take over the site because it needed uh, a lot of alterations to it. So Bearing that in mind, that's why we took on that it wouldn't be viable for an employment use on this site. That's why I put it forward in my officer report in that way. So, sorry, sorry, Chair, can I, I just come back? It was paragraph 48 I, I was referring to, which yep. con concludes by saying this requirement of the policy has also not been addressed, which seemed to suggest that in part paragraph 14, E14 hadn't been addressed, that part A had been addressed, but part 1a but not part two yeah so they hadn't pr produced a viability report but they had done the marketing for it so part two hasn't been addressed but because of the amount of marketing that they provided to show that there was no viable interest in the site as it stood that's why i took it forward that it did meet at least part a of the policy i do understand that there will be a complete loss of employment on the site but then 
taking everything else into consideration in balance. That's why I was recommending it for approval. Fine. OK, thank you very much. Councillor the Thane, do we have any further speakers or seeking clarification? No. Uh, <laughs> yes. Right. Councillor Khan, followed by Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Thank you very much. Councillor Khan, please. Hello. Is this working? Yes. Can you hear me? We've got five. Yeah. Uh, um, I've, changed, I've changed my head gear, sorry. Um, the, um, what I was going to just ask is, the uh, land was employment land, you know, planning to transfer it to residential. Will the residential land, uh, how, uh, properties have been built be suitable for home working? Because that would seem to me the obvious way of maintaining employ some employment and also uh, in this sort of context. What's the position on that? And do we have any policies which would help us in this? Um, home working. They, they do have quite spacious, they're quite spacious internally. They do all meet our space standards. Uh, there could be some bedrooms potentially by the occupants, but that would be entirely up to them whether they want to reuse them for home working instead, instead of a, as I am in, my third bedroom, which happens to be a study for us. We don't need it. Um, there is, there is me. of home working. Don't believe there'd be a policy that would help in this instance. Councillor Bachelor, yeah, sorry Chairman, if, if yeah. I might just, just assist on that point. Um, policy HQ1 uh, does talk about um, ensuring that developments deliver flexibility that allows for the future changes in needs and lifestyles. Uh, that's point K of uh, policy HQ1, page 104 of the local plan. So that, that may be something that assists Councillor Khan. OK, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor uh, Williams, Williams, your uh, camera is still on. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, if I can refer to page 172, paragraph 35. Um, I think the uh, the sort of MPPF requires, um, if we look at it, uh, the view is that if the uh, site would not cause substantial harm to the openness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and contributes to meeting an identified affordable housing need, but there is no affordable housing at all on this site. So how do we justify that? We're recommending this for approval. Sorry, I'm going to get to paragraph 35, bear me a second. So. Because criterion G is not actually met because there is no affordable housing on the site. No, there's no affordable housing on the site, but there is a limited, so part A of 145, the MPPF, says that limited infilling or the partial complete redevelopment of previously developed land where redundant or a continuing use, uh, then where it would not have a greater impact on the openness of the green belt is part one, mm -hmm. would not cause substantial harm. That's the part there that I'm saying that, uh, well, that I recommended that it meets, that it would be the partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land. So this would be the factory site that is currently no longer in use and it'd be redevelopment, redeveloped for housing. And then I was, I've recommended in my report that it wouldn't have an impact on the openness because it's not materially larger than the factory that's already there. Mm -hmm. So I do understand that there is no affordable housing on the site, uh, so it doesn't meet that part, but it does conform to part A instead. Chair, if I if I may, sorry, it's Chris yes. Carter again. That's a that's an either or. If you if you read the wording there, it's um, it's limited infilling or partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land, whether redundant or in continuing use, which would not have a greater impact on the openness of the green belt than the existing development. That's that's Jane's recommendation, or the second point. So it doesn't have to be both. Uh, it's an either or. Okay, 
Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, can we just be clear, Jane, you said in passing that uh, the factory is no longer operational, so there is no current employment on the site. Is that right? Yes, at the time when I did my site visit and at the time when this application was submitted, it was still in use. But then by the time I'd done my site visit, it was not in use anymore. OK. Thank you very much. Do we have any further speakers? No, I think we've done that. So thank you very much. We we'll move on then to the public speakers. And we have uh, a number of those. Um, it's Mr Tim Smith with us, please. Mr Tim Smith. Hello, yes, I, I'm here. Um, I, I'd like to decline to speak, actually. I'm, I'm listening, but not speaking today. Thank you. Oh, yeah, OK, OK, thank you very much. As long as you're happy with that. Um, in that case, is Cass, is now exiting. Is Cass Slater there, please? Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Hello, Chairman. After Can you? Me? Yeah, Hello. excellent. We're yeah, here. Yeah. Sorry All to right. keep you, and welcome to the committee. Thank you. You know, you know the ropes, do you? I I do indeed. I do indeed. All right, when you're <laughs> ready, then. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this application is for a small scale residential development on a brownfield site and it follows a resubmission of a refusal of planning permission last year. As your officer has said, it was refused on the grounds that the site is outside of the development framework and that insufficient information had been submitted to demonstrate that the site is inappropriate for employment use. Members at that time requested a marketing report. The site has since been marketed for over 12 months and no offers were received. The agents marketing the site have advised that the building is specialist with low and restricted head height. It's been especially adapted to meet the needs of a joinery workshop and is considered difficult to convert for another business user. Your officers have accepted the findings of this report and now support the loss of employment from this site. As you've heard, the site is located in the Greenbelt and MPPF policy allows for the redevelopment of previously developed land in the Greenbelt where it would not have a greater impact on its openness. This is the case here. The footprint, the floor space and the volume of the proposed development would be smaller than the existing premises and your officers have, have agreed this and raised no objection on that basis. In terms of the design, the layout and the scale of new development, your officers advice is clear that this is also acceptable. Concerns have been raised by the Parish Council and neighbours about the impacts on residential amenity. The proposed dwellings are orientated and designed to safeguard neighbours amenity and to comply with national space standards. The proposal has been assessed in detail in the officer report and officers have advised that there would be no significant harm to residential amenity. Officers have also advised that there would be no significant adverse impact on drainage or trees. There are also no objections from county highways and it's noteworthy that the existing access serves an existing business use, albeit the building is currently empty, uh, and accommodates a range of vehicles, including articulated lorries. In summary, there was no market interest in this employment site and whilst it is located outside of the development framework and this proposal is a departure from the local plan, it is on the, the edge of a sustainable village. The residential proposal would make use of a previously developed site. It would enhance the openness and the character of the green belt by reducing the amount and form of built development. And it would also benefit neighbours by removing an unrestricted employment use that has in the past caused noise and disturbance. There's no substantial harm to other interests and the contribution of this proposal to the district's housing supply is considered to be a benefit. Overall, it's considered that these matters are important and outweigh any departure from the development plan. And I would therefore ask members to accept your officer's recommendation today and to support this application. Thank you, Chairman. Right, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification required, members? I have nobody asking for that in chat at the moment. I don't know whether Councillor Bradnam wanted to add anything to what she said in chat. I think that's just a matter of explanation. Yes, Thanks. I've got that. Thank you very much. Yep. Just to say that it's a shame because I have visited the site and would have liked to vote, but I shan't on this occasion. Thank you. OK, just to explain that uh, Councillor Bradnam's uh, IT contacts have dropped out for 10 minutes, so she's not going to vote. 
Councillor Khan uh, would like to speak. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. I just, I just wanted to ask uh, whether the uh, whether the applicant had considered uh, producing uh, special design work, uh, uh, home uh, uh, residential work, homework unit, uh, rather than uh, straightforward simple residential. Plan. No, I mean, this is this is not a sort of dedicated uh, live work unit scheme, but as your officer said early, earlier, you know, these are a mixture of three and four bedroom homes that are proposed and there is flexibility within each of those homes for rooms to be used in any which way they're required. So that could well mean home offices and home working. Excellent. Oh, thank you very much there. I don't have any further speakers. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And I'll move on then to the Parish Council. There's Councillor Winterbottom with us, please. Councillor Winterbottom. It's Councillor Winterbottom there, please. Nope. I know, we have heard him coming in and out on his phone. That, uh, is he on our list? Is Councillor Winterbottom? Uh, sorry, Chair, if, if I may, um, he, he's in on his phone, but but it is on mute right now. If, if he hits uh, star six and then the hash button, that, that should unmute him and allow him to, to speak into the meeting. Right. He, does, he does appear in the list. I hope he's heard that. So we'll give him a minute or two to try and make contact. All right, uh, Chairman, you have Councillor Richard Williams wanting to speak as local member. I don't know whether you want to take him first. Yeah, well, we can do. Uh, Councillor Williams, so do you want to speak at this stage? Uh, well, I, I just wanted to, to flag up a few points that, that I, you know, as a local member, obviously, you know, approaching this um, as a member of the planning committee afresh, but just to flag up the points I thought were important for committee members to to, to bear in mind. I think the, the green belt and the openness issue. Um, uh, the loss of employment, I think, is 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 still an important issue for us to consider. The, the affordable housing question, Councillor Hawkins raised. This has not been brought forward as as an affordable housing site, but there is an acute need for affordable housing in the village. Um, yes, policies S seven. Policies um, S seven um, and S ten. I note from the officers. Um, report um, are, are still not met because this is outside of the um, green belt. Um, so the, these are the points that, that, that I think are, are particularly Im important on this. I've already raised the issue about openness. Um, I think affordable housing is, is, is an important issue to discuss as well. So I, I look forward to hearing um, members um, discussion of the application. OK, thank you very much. Let's just check if uh, Council Winterbottom's managed to make contact yet. Uh, Councillor Winterbottom, are you with us? In Winterbottom? I, I think Jay you might have just left the meeting. You might be trying to come back in. All right, we'll give him a second or two. I mean, if he, if he rejoins, I'm perfectly happy to come back to him um, during the Chairman, debate. can I just um, make a contribution on behalf of Councillor Winterbottom? It's not obvious how to unmute yourself when you're taking part by phone, so it might be helpful if Aaron could repeat the instruction that he gave earlier. Uh, Aaron, can you do that, please? Uh, yeah, Chair, I'd be, I'd be very happy to, but as, as uh, Councillor Williams stated, he, he's left the meeting, so uh, I, I mean, uh, if, he's what, if, you, if he's watching uh, and, and he needs to know how to unmute himself on the phone, it is star six okay. and the hash button. But, ah is now joining. Uh, is that Councillor Winterbottom joining us? Mr Winterbottom, Ken Winterbottom, is your stage if you're with us? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Oh, right. Um, well, thank you, Chairman, for your, uh, your patience. Uh, I've only got <laughs> no one problem. further. Hang, hang on a, a bit. There's just a bit of process I have to go through first. Since you're representing the parish council, I, I have to ask that you have permission to speak on their behalf. I have, yes. Lovely. OK. Um, OK, you've got your three minutes whenever you're ready. Go right. 
Uh, I've only got one further point to add to the Whittles Parish Council's objections to this application. And uh, that is that the emerging Whittlesford uh, neighborhood plan seeks to increase and preserve employment opportunities in the village. And the uh, South Cam's uh, local plan of 2018 uh, also has policies which mirror th these objectives with the aim of reducing the need for people to travel long distances to their place of work. The granting of planning commission for this uh, application will remove uh, a very long established uh, site of employment, which goes back at least 70 years, and I think near 100 years, and will be to the disadvantage of the residents of Whittlesford. I think that's all I've got to say on this. OK, thank you very much. Hang on a minute and we'll see if members want to. Any clarification on that? I can't see any comments coming through. So thank you. Councillor Hawkins would like to speak. Would you? OK, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's a it's a brief only to um, the issue of losing a long standing employment site. But if, as has already been presented to us, the site has been marketed for employment uh, for over 12 months and there has been no interest in it at all. Um, therefore, I just wanted to know um, what Mr. Winterbottom's view is or the parish council's view is in you know trying to keep on a site that is no interest for employment. And also, I don't know whether or not their um, uh, emerging neighbourhood plan has that area as being what one they want to keep for employment. But I just wondered as to the reasoning to carry on keeping it if no one wants it. Um, Thank I you. Don't know a question of uh, wanting a site is often uh, judged by how much it's going to cost. And I would estimate that the costs uh, that were wanted for the site as an employment were, were equal to those for residential use at about one and a half million pounds. Uh, if that's any uh, help for you in terms of information. May I come back this chair? Yes, please do. Thank you. So what you're saying is you feel that the price that the site was marketed at was too high for the yes. function for which it was being marketed. Uh, uh, it, the price was too high. Right. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradman would like to ask a question. All right. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is not quite been asked by Councillor Hawkins this time, but um, I wanted to ask um, if it was uh, being envisaged as being included in your neighbourhood plan as a um, as a site for employment, Mr Winterbottom, in the parish view, what sort of employment did you think might usefully be located there. Had you a vision of what you thought might happen there? Uh, not, not no particular uh, type of employment, but something we could obviously fit into a residential uh, locality. Mm. Uh, 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 nuisance to neighbours would be the last thing that we uh, that we wanted of any employer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I don't have any further speakers. So, uh, Councillor Winterbottom, thank you very much for your contribution. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we move on then to uh, debate. Who would like to open debate? Anyone wish to speak? Chairman, can I seek clarification? Um, it's Councillor Anna Bradnam. If am I permitted to take part in the debate if I am not able to vote? I believe so, yes. OK. Um, I just checked that. Um, Mr Carter, are you aware of the rules there? Thank you, Chair. I, I'm not certain of the rules there, I'm afraid. I don't see that there would be any harm, but possibly Mr Reid may be able to advise. Mr Reid. Chair, I would have no objection to Councillor Bradman uh, being involved in the debate. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you wish to speak then, Councillor Bradman? Yes, 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, one of the things we've talked about is that in villages, um, and I'm sorry if somebody's already mentioned this in the discussion or part of it that I missed, but one of the things people need is um, offices where they can work from an office, but uh, not in a great big office block. And I just wondered, um, given the, the preference that the parish council had for a, an employment use that would not disturb the neighbours, I wondered whether a small, as it were, what do you call it, um, touchdown base for working where people don't have enough room to work from home. No, might... no, 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 council, I'm going to stop you there. Okay, right. You, you... Can't, we, we're not creating a new application. We can only deal with what's in front of us as always. So no, all I was thinking is that it would be a shame to lose the employment land, given that it's been well, allocated that, that, in the neighbourhood's land. That's the point then, isn't it? So yeah, that, sorry, that's, I was getting that's the balance actually. that you need to think about. Yeah. OK, uh, who else would like to Councillor speak? Councillor Ripith and then Councillor Heather Williams. Right, thank you. Councillor Ripith, please. Um, I think one of the main points about this, um, going back to page 172 with the either or, where ov obviously the officer thought on point one um, about the not having a greater impact on the openness of the green belt than the existing development. I'm feeling a little bit more towards point two, where it seems an absolute shame if you're going to lose that employment site that there isn't any um, affordable housing involved in the development. I know they don't have to do that, but that makes me feel um, slightly uncomfortable. All right, thank you. And Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we. I can see how, as it's on the edge of the parish, how it could be suitable for some form of development if the um, if it's been satisfied that there can't be an employment use. However, the fact that there's no affordable housing, I just find unacceptable. If this was an exception site, then completely different conversation. But as it is, you know, it's, it's seven houses in green belt with no affordable and that to me is is no sorry okay. departure and okay. so it shouldn't be allowed okay thank you very much uh any further speakers no i don't have any further um councillor richard williams did you want to come back at all um, well, yeah, if there are no other speakers. If, if I could just, just say some things. Um, uh, there is an acute need for um, affordable housing within the village. I mean, for the information of members, there was a, an ACRE report in uh, 2017 which identified a need for affordable housing of, of one and two bed units. So that, that certainly is a, a key concern locally and obviously there is no affordable housing here. I mean, to my mind, the pol policies S7 and S10 are still not met um, and there's no no, no debate about that, and and they were the the um the, the first reason why this was rejected last time. Um, in terms of policy E14, I mean we've we've heard what the parish councillor said. I mean I'd, I'd also note that a lot of the marketing took place during the the the, the COVID outbreak, and I'm not sure it's quite true from the officer's report that there was no interest. There was there was some interest, but there was no offer made. I don't think, or well, certainly it wasn't sold. Um, but but it's not that there was no interest and this was being used for employment up until um late july um so um so on on that basis i i i do have real concerns about this um it, it, it's an unfortunate lost opportunity for affordable housing and also note which we haven't mentioned yet actually there there is overlooking which the um which the officer's report does note um there's overlooking of the properties um number 102 and 100 and uh, number 100 of Duxford Road. Um, so, so there is a residential amenity um, issue here as well. But the, the affordable housing thing and the, the lack of it is important, given that there isn't a need for that. OK, thank you very sure. much. I and think Councillor Khan and Councillor. OK, Councillor Khan, please. I feel very betwixt and between by this. I'm, I absolutely agree we need affordable housing. 
uh, uh, this is general everywhere. I can see the uh, uh, need to keep some form of employment use. Uh, I, um, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any attempt to try and get some employment interest, uh, uh, adaptability when they design, they just submit to the previous residential development. However, the, the other side of it uh, is, I think clearly the rather awkward shape buildings, employment buildings beforehand were ugly. But if any residential use is likely to be less inclusive or more open. And it does appear to meet one of our, one of our planning uh, policies uh, in terms for the green belt, in other words, redevelopment of, of previously developed land. Uh, which, um, so, I, uh, and it's a smaller number of houses that we cannot insist upon the affordable housing element, though, however much you may desire. So I feel that I'm, I'm happy about the thing, the lost opportunities, but we have to deal with the application as it comes, and it appears to me to meet, meet our policies. Um, I'm betwixt and between, I still haven't quite decided. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to... You're muted. Sorry, but the further point of clarification I would like to know is, are there any conditions we could do uh, impose if they did give permission um, to ensure that adequate provision was made for or, or that the adapted adaptation is made for home working? I'm not sure we have a policy for that, do we? But uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. I've still got more speakers. Um, is it Councillor Roberts? Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming more interested in as we go along and as we all put in our 10 pennyworth, but I'm afraid I don't think I can support it either because I think that um, it doesn't comply with uh, Green Belt policy really. And I'm really concerned again, it's outside the village development line. We really do need to hold true to that policy. Um, it's, it's one that over the years has always been pressed and pushed. And I think it's really important that we, we keep to it. If this had been an affordable housing, yeah, we would have all absolutely loved it and said, wonderful, nice little group uh, here for this, this small and important village. But it doesn't, and Sir Chairman, but you will have to have reasons. We'll have to give you reasons uh, because obviously some of us are going to be wanting a refusal. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. OK, do we have further? Right, hang on, I'm just getting some advice from Mr. Reed that um, because this has gone on so long, we have to actually uh, officially have a vote about continuing with the meeting. So uh, members, um, we have been going now for uh, five hours, I believe. Um, do you wish to continue? So agreed. this is my affirmation. Is anyone yes. against? Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So no one's against. Agreed. All right. We labour on them. <laughs> Thank you. OK, our next speaker. Is... Chairman, I think I'm probably the next speaker. Peter oh, Fagia. Yeah. OK. Um, yes, this is in the green belt. It is uh, out Although it is a vacant site, although it's a vacant site and so far as we can tell, there is no interest in buying it. As Councillor Richard Williams pointed out, it's rather difficult to be sure about that in the current circumstances, given the price being sought. Um, now, obviously, this would be, could be considered as an exception site, which would, of course, include market housing. That is not the application which is before us. But I think we need to be very careful to ensure that uh, all options are considered before sites in the green belt are allowed to be converted. Um, and I'm not sure that those tests are yet met on, the, on this one. All right, thank you. So are, are you uh, suggesting refusal? If so, we'd like some guidance on the grounds. Uh, Chairman, if we were to refuse it, it would be on the grounds that this is located outside of the development framework and in the green belt. Right, thank you. Good. Uh, 
and with no affordable element, Chairman. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, I mean, there's, part, no, there's, yeah, no, there's no obligation. Affordable. But uh, oh, the next speaker, I think, is Councillor Daunton, is it? Um, it is, yes. Thank you, Chairman. I think um, I, I, what I would have said would be more or less exactly what Councillor Peter Fain has said. Um, okay. I would just, uh, I would also reiterate what Councillor Richard Williams has said about the marketing of the site, both the time at which it took place, the marketing took place, and uh, the level at which it, the site was marketed, um, taking up uh, Councillor Winterbottom's remark earlier on. OK, thank you very much. Um, Mr Carter, can I just consult with you? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, it, so, there so were two... Well, that green belt out of the side of the village envelope. Yeah, so there were two reasons for refusal given um, last time by the planning committee. Uh, and to my reading of them, um, it sounds like members uh, consider that both of those reasons still stand. Um, I don't believe they're set out in the officer report, but it may be that the officer can just uh, either share them on the screen or, or read them out for us. Uh, yeah, I can share them on the screen over two seconds. Can I confirm that you can see the screen? Can you see that one? Yes, we can, Jane, yes. OK. Yes, thank you. Chair, would you like us to read them out? Or are you happy that they can be read um, on the screen? I'm just reading it. So it's one that, that, that may still apply, is it? Yes, number one is for being outside of the development framework, S7 and S10, and the number two would be inappropriate for the loss of employment, um, contrary to policy E14. Right, yeah. but the market has been dealt with, yeah. But, we, but also there was the point about the lack of affordable housing. If this had been come forward normally outside the village framework, it should have been an exception site and that would have been 100% affordable housing. Yeah, but that's not what's in front of us. It's, we can't deal with that. All right, OK, so um, we, Mr Carter, that, uh, so item one would essentially remain the reason should uh, people wish to refuse well, it. Well, I, I think I think, Chair, from what I've heard, that item two would stand as well because yes, members are not, satis not satisfied that the marketing information uh, is sufficient to demonstrate that there is no uh, interest or requirement for the site for employment purposes. So I think you would have both reasons still remaining. OK, all right. Yeah. Uh, they're, still, they're still with us then. Um, so. Let me just get that right. OK, so we're going for a vote then. So the re officer recommendation is approval. So if you but those who wished to refuse it, we uh, essentially um, do not think the current, the refusal of the previous one has been met and we um, would put up the, the same reasons. So if we're clear about that, um, I'll do a roll call. Um, so if you want to approve it, you are for it. Uh, if you want to refuse it, you're against. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. So, Councillor Bradnam is not voting as. I'll abstain, a, having missed some of the discussion, Chairman. Okay, that'd be noted in the minutes. Uh, Councillor Carl, please. Again, again. Against. Councillor Daunton. Against. Against. Councillor Fain. Against. Against. Hawkins, please. Against. Councillor Ripeth. Against. Councillor Roberts. Against. Councillor Williams H. Against, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Uh, 
that was the right. Against. Okay. Uh, and my vote is against. So that is unanimous. Ten votes against. It is refused. Thank you very much, everyone, for that one. And we move on to the next application, which is agenda item. Ken and is now exiting. And it is on page 193 of your agenda. So this is application S3215 stroke 19 stroke DC uh, at Long Stanton, the retreat Fuse Lane, Long Stanton. The proposal is discharge of condition four, foul water drainage, and five, surface water drainage of Planning Commission uh, S2937 stroke 16 stroke FL. The applicant is Mr. Jerry Cadu of uh, Landbrook Homes Limited. Key material considerations will be uh, dealt with by the presenting officer. Um, this is not a departure. Uh, the officer recommendation is to approve both conditions. The application is brought to committee because this application has been referred to the committee on the basis of parish council objection, third party objection, and the public interest in this application. The presenting officer is Lewis Tomlinson. So over to you, Mr. Tomlinson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Thank you, Chair. So the site is the retreat, Fuse Lane on Stanton. Um, the application site. Hang, hang, hang on one, one moment. I'm sorry, Mr. Tomlinson. Councillor Roberts, Thank you. To say something. Is this? Yeah. Can, can, I, can I ask a question, Chairman? Um, uh, we received um, over the last few days correspondence in written paper form, about six pages, um, on uh, this application, regarding this application. Now, the correspondence and stuff is within the agenda. I, I don't think that this is within the agenda. I wonder whether the uh, Parish Council and the objectors have been made fully aware of the content. I'm also very concerned about the content. Well, hang on then. I mean, I, I'm aware that the legal officer has seen all this, so mm -hmm. we'll get his view on it first. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reid, do you have a view on that? Uh, Chair, the um, correspondence has been seen by the Director of Planning and he felt that uh, it was such that uh, the matter could proceed. Right, OK. So, Chairman, can I just quickly come back? Given that, uh, in my opinion, a lot of the content in it uh, is um, very personal, um, uh, seeming to be um, intent on um, making comments about the uh, people who were against it on a very personal I, note. I, yeah, I th well, I think I need to stop you there, uh, Councillor Roberts, because uh, we're being told that it, it's not relevant to this and that they were sent to individuals. These are not necessarily public documents. So I think we're... Well, in, that case, in that case, if they're not public documents, we should ignore them completely. Shouldn't absolutely. We? Thank you, Chairman. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Councillor Williams, Heather Williams, did that answer your question? Chairman, yes, we, if we're um, having to ignore them. That suits me fine, having never received any. I was just worried <laughs> there was something I hadn't received. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not missing out there. <laughs> you're not one of the chosen then, Heather. <laughs> no, so as you see, not everyone has actually had it. It's, it's not a part of the presentation here. Uh, so um, as far as this process is concerned, it doesn't exist. Right, Mr. Tomlinson, if we can, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, back to you now, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Is my microphone muted? No, we can hear you. Great, lovely. OK, so the application site is within the development framework boundary of Lonstanton Village. It lies outside of the conservation area and sits to the rear of the retreat. So the retreat is this property here. There is planning permission for the demolition of this property and the replacement of two dwellings. To the west of the application site, just here, are two recently constructed dwellings. And the um, application site, the in reference to this DOC, is just here. So the application site is currently a residential garden, which was associated with the retreat. And as I said, benefits um, from a planning consent for two dwellings here, but also a single dwelling back here, different consents. The application site, as you can see, is um, access of the high street via Fuse Lane and on an unadopted access drive and public right of way. Immediately to the north of the garden lies an existing watercourse ditch, which, full, uh, which outfalls into Lonstanton Brook. So the ditch just runs along this boundary here. It's worth to, it's worth to note that the site falls within flood zone one and therefore has a low probability of flooding from rivers and sea. The Environmental Agency Service flood water map also shows this site is an area of low to very low service water flood risk. And on Stanton Brook is shown nearby to be a medium to high risk of service water flooding. So that's just an aerial view of the site. As you can see, there's the existing bungalow and the recently constructed dwellings to the west and the brook just runs alongside here. So there's a bit of background to this application. So um, previously the plan permission for the erection of the dwelling, which is the DOC that relates to the application, that was uh, allowed on appeal back on the 27th of September 2018. The current application seeks discharge of condition four, which requires submission of full details of the full of the foul water drainage strategy for written approval by the LPA. The application also seeks discharge of condition five, which requires submission of full details of the proposed service water drainage, both from the building itself and from the proposed driveway area for, wit for written approval by the LPA. Both conditions were imposed by the plan inspector on the previous um, appeal decision and the reason for these conditions was to prevent flooding. This application was submitted to and validated by the Council on the 16th of September 2019. A delegated decision was issued on the 28th of October 2019 confirming discharge conditions 4 and 5. Subject to systems in accordance with the approved details. This decision was subject to judicial review from an interested third party who wished to submit comments on the proposed foul and service water drainage scheme prior to the local planning authority's determination of the application. A consent order was issued on the 12th of May 2020, quashing the council's delegated decision to discharge conditions four and five dated 28th of October 2019. The application has now been passed back to the local planning authority for reconsideration and to allow for third party comments to be submitted. I can confirm that these third party comments have since been received and are summarised within the officer reports. Officers can also confirm that this application has been subject to reconsultation, including further reconsultation following receipt of additional submissions from the applicant. This application has been referred to planning committee on the basis of a parish council objection, third party objections and the wider public interest in this application. These are just the approved plans for the dwelling in question. As you can see, it's elevations in front of you now. And an approved floor plan as well. So this is a approved site plan. So I just want to point out a couple of points of interest. So you've got the area to the front, which is permeable block paving, and the garden to the rear, and the, the attenuation tank we located here, which would discharge into the brook, but we'll go into that further detail later on. 
So the foul water drainage proposal is to discharge foul drainage into an existing foul sewer infused lane. And the service water drainage proposal is to discharge service water into an attenuation tank located in the rear garden of the dwelling, which is approximately here. A hydro brake flow control chamber is shown at outfall to the proposed storage attenuation tank, which discharges to the existing watercourse ditch to the north, which is just here. The driveway serving the dwelling is proposed as a gravel driveway operating as infiltration feature and that is just this element right here. So the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service has appointed expert advice on drainage matters to allow the local planning authority to fully consider submission of details provided by the applicant, also to consider any third party comments and to assess the proposed scheme for foul and service water drainage at the site having full regard to adopted national and local planning policy, as well as published and acknowledged approaches and best practice. A full copy of the report prepared by the appointed consultant, Santex, is provided at Appendix A, which also includes details of the qualifications and expertise of the consultant providing advice to the local planning authority. That consultant is also with us today in the meeting if there's any technical questions that members are required, um, required to be answered. So local, um, the local parish council on Stanton objects to the discharge condition five. Third party reps have also been received objecting to the discharge of both condition four and condition five. Numerous concerns have been raised as summarised in the respect of technical details relating to proposed foul water and service water drainage, accordance of the details with the service water drainage hierarchy, accordance of the proposals with adopted local plan policy CC slash seven, CC slash eight and CC slash nine, as well as national policy and guidance lack of information that the proposals will increase water runoff into Lonstanton Brook, increasing flood risk. Also that the proposed <coughs> surface water runoff will be greater than the existing runoff rate for the site as undeveloped and the proposed outfall into the existing watercourse is outside of the red line application boundary. Both officers and the appointed drainage consultant are satisfied that the proposed submission details in accordance with adopted national and local policy and guidance, which is outlined in detail in the officer report. It is considered that it's been satisfactorily demonstrated that the scheme provides a viable and fully justified foul and service water drainage strategy that will not increase flood risk elsewhere. In the officer's judgment, the extension, if any, of the development beyond the red line boundary would be de minimis and in any event into an area within the same ownership as the site. Even if the development could be said to extend beyond the red line boundary, it would not be appropriate or proportionate nor in the public interest to require public uh, to require a planning application to extend the red line in those circumstances. So in conclusion, officers recommend that planning committee approves application to discharge conditions four and five attached to planning permission S slash 2937 slash 16 slash FL as outlined in the officer report. Just got a couple more slides to just show you. So this is the full wording of the conditions which is outlined in the officer report. The just the drainage details proposal summary which we've already gone over but this is the very kind of basic of it. So foul water drainage discharges into the existing foul sewer and fuse lane. Surface water drainage is discharge of surface water to attenuation tank located in the rear garden of the dwelling. A hydro brake flow control chamber shown at the outfall to the proposed storage attenuation tank, which discharges to the existing watercourse ditch to the north. And the driveway serving the site is proposed as a gra gravel driveway operating as an infiltration feature. So this is sorry, it's a bit blurry, but as you can see, this is where the attenuation tank would be, just in the rear garden and discharging into the brook to the north. And this is a section through where you can see a pipe here that would discharge into the brook. Thank you, Chair. That's everything. Thank you very much. Um, just before we move on, can I ask officers, I understand that the public video has frozen. 
Is somebody dealing with that? Aaron, for example. Sorry, Jay, could you repeat that? There's a note here that says uh, the video for public watching has frozen. Oh yes, that's been uh, that's been resolved. Thank you, Chair. I so, apologize. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Right. Sorry about that, uh, members. Any points of clarification required here? Just bear in mind that all we're dealing with here is the discharge of two conditions, foul and surface water drainage. Um, Councillor Fain, do I have some speakers? Councillor Roberts would like to speak. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I would refer the officer, I mean, obviously we've taken uh, separate advice ourselves, but the uh, the input from the Longstanton Parish Council is really, um, you know, really detailed and there's an awful lot of in it. Um, are we absolutely convinced that uh, every concern that the Parish Council have put down in writing uh, has been um, put put aside as as, as OK and, and no problem? All right, thank you. Mr Tomlinson, could we respond to that, please? Thank you, Chair. So um, we went out to an independent uh, drainage company to review all the information. They've come back and advised us that everything is um, OK with the application and it complies with local and national policy. Is there anything in particular, Councillor Roberts, that you'd like to question? No, but uh, the Longstanton Parish Council on page 196 they talk about there that um, they support all the comments that have been made by neighbours. Now, the comments by neighbours are many um, and 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 often um, and go on to you know pages and pages. Now, I'm no drainage expert, um, but I, I do need to feel that uh, this is not that problems are not going to occur here because. Um, I think that we are setting ourselves up to um, have future claims made against us. Uh, so, Mr. Tomlinson, I think my colleague. I'm sure you probably Carter, don't have a comment on that. Uh, Mr. Carter will probably help us here. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, the, as Lewis explained, the purpose of uh, appointing the independent consultant was to review both the information submitted by the applicant, but also the comments of both the parish council and third party representatives. Uh, and that's that's what the report does uh, in order to advise the council on the acceptability of the information to discharge the conditions. So officers are satisfied that those points have been considered in that report, uh, hence the recommendation in front of you. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradnam wanted to speak. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave shortly. Um, I don't want to curtail discussion, but I'm I'm satisfied by the comment made at number 14 by the independent consultant. Um, and so I wondered, unless you want to have further discussion, whether we could move to the vote? No, we have public speakers. Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Yes, of we're, course. We're only on the initial presentation. Okay. So when, when are you going to go, Councillor? I what? have to leave at about five to four. All right, <laughs> so well, I'm afraid, afraid you won't be here for the vote. Then. I think um, I'll, if I, I'll, I'll write at the point at which I leave, but I don't think I'm going to be able to vote on this. Okay. Um, uh, Chairman, um, Chairman, it's Councillor Daunton here. My yes. I come in, please. I think you do know because I warned you in advance that I have to leave at four o'clock. I have a 4.30 yes. appointment, um, right. so I'll be leaving at the same time, more or less. OK, got it. Been noted for the benefit of the minutes. Uh, we still got uh, speakers, I think. Councillor Fane. Uh, yes, I think we do. We have Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. So it's, it's a question for the officer. It, it, I don't know if, if Longstanton Parish Council is going to speak, so it might be better to uh, uh, direct this to them. So, so please tell me if so. But I was just wondering if there are any problems with water courses in the area. Um, 
I mean, obviously, you know, maintenance of watercourses can can be an issue in a lot of villages and parishes. So I, I was just wondering if that was if there were documented problems with that in in this area. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tomlinson. Thank you, Chair. It's not something I have in front of me, so it might be better to aim this question towards Lonsanton Parish Council. Well, and they will be speaking, though. They're on my list. So. OK, thank you. Is that all the speakers? OK, we go to the public speaking then. Um, and can I ask uh, Mr Fulton to come forward, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello. Yeah, you, you know uh, the form. <laughs> yes. So when you're ready then. Uh, um, as the committee knows, um, the council's decision to approve this application was quashed by the High Court on May 13th of this year. The reason for that was because the council promised to undertake a public consultation. It then failed to do so and issued a decision anyway. Since the decision was quashed on the 13th of May, no public consultation has been undertaken since then. Sending me a letter and sending an email notification to the parish council does not constitute a lawful public consultation. I am incredulous as to why officers have brought this to the committee today, knowing that no public consultation has been undertaken and knowing that the, any decision taken by the committee today will be undoubtedly be quashed in the high court. Um, the Stand Act report, frankly, isn't worth the paper it's written on. I will not miss waste the committee's time refuting it today because the decision can be quashed on other grounds. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Uh, anyone wish to ask Mr. Fulton any questions? No. Nope. OK, then thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Uh, can I then call the applicant. Uh, Pardon? Councillor Williams, Heather. Heather Williams, Williams would now like to speak. All oh, right. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Said with such enthusiasm, Chairman. <laughs> it was just, the, I think the reason my uh, request was in late was because I didn't catch right at the start. Um, I had a bit of breakup of internet connection and to avoid me having to not be able to vote, could Mr. Fulton repeat the start of his? Um, I, I got everything, and then I heard the word consultation. Then it flipped out a bit, and then I heard High Court quashing. That's okay. about all I got. Okay. Sorry, Chairman. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Fulton. Would you mind? Yes. Uh, the High Court quashed the Council's previous refusal on May 13th of this year because the Council had promised to undertake a public consultation and failed to do so. Since May 13th of this year, no public consultation has been undertaken in regards to this application. Um, sending a letter to the Fuseling Consortium and sending an email notification to the Parish Council does not constitute a public consultation when the Council has published a notice on its website that says that there is no public consultation underway and the comments are not being accepted. So uh, I'm incredulous as to why this application is before the committee today um, because the committee has no lawful basis on which it can proceed to approve the application at the present time. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much for repeating. My apologies. Right. Thank you. Councillor Thane, do we have any other? We have none showing at the moment, Chair. No, all right, we'll move on then. Chairman, just, just to save time, sorry to interrupt, but just to save time, as that statement has just been made by Mr. Fulton, um, I think we ought to get um, the right. legal view of, of Mr. Reid and Mr. Carter on this one because. I will do. I will do. I'm intending to do so, but I'm giving I, the other public speakers the opportunity first to make their own points. We will come back. To that. Thank you. We'll come back. Thank you very much. Is Mr. Cadu there, please? Yes, indeed, I am. All right. If you'd like to put on your camera, please. Here we go. Can you hear me? All right, yeah. Uh, welcome. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you know the form. You, you 
got three minutes. Three minutes. I won't even take up three seconds. Uh, I've just thank you to the address by the planning officer, and I, I think it covers all the points that I wish to raise today. So I've got no further comment to make on this application. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you so long today. Okay. Um, the parish council have. Um, a representative is uh, Libby White with us, please. I am. Good. <laughs> right. you well, well, welcome to the planning committee. Thank you, Chairman. Keep, keep you so long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've got three minutes to address us. And... That won't be very long, don't worry. <laughs> okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so, long standing parish council have asked me to come today to speak to you. On their behalf, um, I'm the parish clerk. If you don't know who I am, I think I've um, spoken to you all before. Um, the reasons for objecting to the um, application originally made in September 2019 was to do with the discharge of water, surface water drainage into the watercourse, um, which they felt was in contravention of planning condition five. Um, comments um, from Longstanton Parish Council stem from concerns raised by residents and councillors alike, and they're based on the limited planning knowledge that they have. It's understood that parish councils are statutory consultees and believe this is to help you as a planning authority by being the local knowledge, the eyes and the ears on the ground, so to speak. With this in mind, Longstanton Parish Council expects that having been consulted on this application no less than seven times, they would have been asked to review the expert evidence submitted in the Santec report, especially due to the sensitive nature of this application. I would like to stress that at no point has this been made to, available to Longstanton Parish Council and to understand what the expert is suggesting or to allow local residents the opportunity to comment. Councillors have asked me to stress their, stress their frustration at the number of times this application has come forward and it has wasted a considerable amount of precious parish council time and assumed it would have done the same for the planning team too. We would like to ask that the planning authority refuse the application or at least defer allowing local residents the chance to have a say following sight of the Suntech report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there may well be some questions for you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, I think you want you had a one uh, for the PC. Yes, I'll just ask. Thank you, Jay. I'll ask the same question to the to the parish council representative. Really, it's just whether um, there are problems with watercourse maintenance, or there have been problems with watercourse maintenance in Longstanton that you know about. Um, I was speaking to um, the Pat Matthews yesterday, actually. So um, we have ongoing issues with them not being maintained, and we had flooding a few years ago. Um, when there's been heavy rainfall. Okay. Thank you. So, in in your sorry, Jay, if I can come back. So, in your view, would that is that something that that, that affects this this application? Part yeah, of the flood? It, it concerns residents. They're very concerned about what what will happen if uh, there's extra water put in. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. So, uh, thank you for your contribution there. Thank you. Uh, can I go to Mr Carter? Um, uh, I would like to comment on Mr Fortin's comments. Please. Yes, perhaps if I uh, say my piece and then Mr Reid may have comments to add. Um, so uh, my understanding of the uh, quashing of the original decision was that the council had uh, instigated a public consultation uh, but then made a decision prior to the conclusion of that public consultation. So there was a legit legitimate expectation raised that the public would be able to comment uh, on, on that condition. Uh, and because a decision was made in advance of the conclusion of that consultation, that was the, the reason for the decision being quashed. As members will know, the council does not, um, as standard practice, consult on the discharge of planning conditions uh, by way of public consultation. And so uh, that there has been no uh, formal public consultation in this case. However, uh, as Mr Fulton pointed out, the Fuse Lane Consortium and the Parish Council have been notified. Uh, turning to the Stantec report, the purpose of the Stantec report is to advise the local planning authority um, as to the, uh, the um, adequacy of the information provided in order to discharge the conditions. 
Uh, it's not a document on which a public consultation was required. Uh, it's a document that's used to inform the decision making of the council. Uh, and hence, uh, it's been used by us to make the recommendation that you have with you today. I don't know whether Mr. Reid would like to add anything further to that. You may wish to speak to him, Chair. Right, but from your point of view, there's no reason for us not to proceed. No, I don't believe there is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reid, do you have anything to add there? Uh, Chair, if I may, um, just a, a point of clarification in relation to the uh, quashing of the original decision. Um, you've heard from Mr Carter that um, discharge of conditions is not the subject of public consultation, but you then heard Mr Carter say that actually we made a decision prior to the e end of that consultation. So the point of clarification is that uh, Mr Fulton indicated to the officer that he would wish to comment. The officer wrote back and advised Mr Fulton of when um, the period for reviewing the information uh, would run to. And then before the date given in that letter stroke email had been reached, the conditions were discharged without letting Mr Fulton know that effectively the date had been brought forward. Mr Fulton argued that the letter straight email from the council gave rise to an expectation that he would have the full period referred to in the letter straight email in which to comment. And in those circumstances, the council took on board that he uh, uh, had an expectation that no decision would be made prior to the date given in the in the letter. So it's just a few little nuances there in relation to the um, opportunity for people to comment uh, as opposed to being subject to a formal consultation. I hope well, that's helpful. All right, but as far as the committee is concerned, uh, are you agreeing with uh, Mr Carter that there's no reason for us not to proceed? Uh, I fully support that the planning offices are satisfied that uh, the matter should proceed on the basis of the information that they're able to put forward to you today. OK, thank you very much. All right, members, it's a debate now then. I think we've got some speakers, have we, Councillor Thane? Uh, just trying to find it, if any are coming up at the moment. Yes, I think we have Councillor Councillor Roberts. Roberts. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Heather Williams first, please. Yes. Uh, right. OK, so we have Heather Williams, Are Anna Bradman has left this, us, Peter? then Councillor Roberts. OK, all right, I've got it. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank, Thank you. you, Chairman. Um, so I, I understand what the officers have said, but given the representation that's been made and with reference to the parish council, I'm going to ask this from a slightly different angle. So take on board that what they, the officer said was that we there was nothing to stop us to turn this today, OK? But given how sensitive this site is and given the views, the local views and the parish council's views, is there anything that says that we can't just defer and allow people to have a consultation in this situation, given the sensitivities of the site, um, because it just feels like unnecessary pain to be putting people through. So while it might not be a requirement, is there anything that prohibits us from doing that? Thank you, Chairman. I, I think the answer is that the committee can do what it decides it wants to do. But, you know, this has been going on a very long while and it's really unfair that uh, 
the matter shouldn't be brought to a conclusion. So I'll be very reluctant to do, do other than make a decision today on this outcome. Chairman, that may be your view, but if, if I'm in my right to, to suggest a deferment, then I'm, I'm going to do so because um, I just think it could actually create more long term pain than the short term of allowing people to. Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, if you're making that as a proposal, then I've got no choice but to take that. Is it a proposal? Yes, Chairman, the for and for the Council to actually do a consultation on this discharge of condition. All right, can I have a seconder for that, please? I will second it, Chairman, but I'd like to speak as well still. Yeah, OK. Thank so you. So we have a proposal before us from Councillor Williams for a deferral in order to allow further consultation. Um, Councillor Roberts, please, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, and I'd like to explain why I think that's very important that we do so. Uh, yes, it has obviously become a very contentious issue, and I'm not saying who is right, which side is right, which side is wrong, which professionals are right, which which experienced villages are right. I just don't think I know at this moment in time. Um, however, I think it would have been circumspect to have actually made sure, given you know just how um raw this situation has become that we went back to the parish council in particular and explained and, and sent them the the details from the uh professional uh report that we had taken the fact that we haven't done so and the fact that they are supporting so many concerns and they're saying that you know they've had pat matthews down there um very very recently but we know that Pat is our drainage expert, so you don't pull Pat Matthews out to a village unless you've got real problems. And I think so in these circumstances, it will hold it back a little longer. But I think we have to get this right because um, I, I do myself think that there is, you know, the law can be interpreted by different people in different ways. And, and it seems to me that uh, Fuse Lane have taken some advice. Uh, our legal people have a different a different view of it, uh, but I don't want this one. I mean, it's it seems to me quite it would be quite out of you know comprehension with its size and importance if this was to go yet again to the High Court for a judicial review. It doesn't even whichever way it went, it's not good. It's not good for the council, and it's not good for parish councils and residents. So I, I would just ask my colleagues just let's just calm this one down let's send the information out in full to the parish council okay. and bring this back next month thank, thank you chairman you. right thank you does anybody else want to speak to the proposal for deferral yes please chairman councillor wright uh councillor wright please thank you chairman my name was down to speak anyway but i'd like yeah. to speak to the proposal um I don't feel, having listened to our officers and Daniel Fulton, that we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think we should defer it. I think, you know, having offered Daniel Fulton a, a consultation just to, you know, to delay it going to the High Court again, you know, for a month, um, other than delaying it for a long decision from the High Court, let, let's go to consultation you know, with the Parish Council and Fuse Lane Consortium, hear what they said, bring it back next month, and let's be open, let's have some open stuff, let them see the Stans Stantec consultation report. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have anything to hide, it's an independent report, it's not just there for officers, it's there for us to make the decision on. Long Stanton, you know, the, that brook in the centre of Long Stanton has been a long standing problem. It floods every few years. It's piped where it shouldn't be piped. The pipe's blocked up on the award drain and flooding occurs. So it is a very sensitive subject that we need to get right. So that's my opinion, Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think Councillor Fain wants to speak to this. Yes, Chairman. I am. Um usually against deferrals. I think enough time has been wasted, uh, as we heard from the Parish Council and others. And indeed, the Parish Council and uh, 
Mr Fulton himself, have been further consulted. That is not the problem. However, it's quite clear or seems clear that the Parish Council have not seen the report that was commissioned. This is clearly a sensitive issue, so unusually in this case, I would support a deferral. Okay. And then a proper consultation of not just the Parish Council and Mr Fulton, but a proper wider consultation because of the sensitive nature of this issue. All right, thank you very much for that. Any other comments? No, if not, I don't know if Mr Carter wishes to comment. Just so I'm clear, Chair, um, members are moving a deferral in order that a public consultation may take place uh, on the Stantec report. That's the reason, isn't it? It is, yeah. That's it, yeah. OK, all right, members. Uh, I'll take a roll call. Uh, just a note that we've lost two members who, who have already gone, and that's Councillor, Councillor Bradnam and Councillor Daunton. So um, what we're voting on is for deferral. So if you're in favour of deferral, you're for it. If you're not, you're against. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. So Councillor Khan, what's your view, please? For, please. For deferral. Thank you. Councillor Thane. For deferral. For Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, for. For. Councillor Ripith. For. Councillor Roberts. For deferral, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. For. for. Councillor Richard Williams. For. Councillor Wright. For. Thank you. And I will vote for. So that's uh, two, four, six, eight. Nine in favour of deferral, no votes against. Item eight is deferred. Thank you very much. We then move on to item nine on the agenda. Uh, just before we do that, would members like 10 minutes break? Is that a yes? Oh, yes, for me. Yes, please, Chair. <laughs> please, Chair. Well,
Okay, Chair, we are now live again. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to uh, South Cairns District Council Planning Committee. Uh, we are now on agenda item nine, which is on page 213 of uh, our agendas. Uh, this is application S0150 stroke 20 stroke FL at 11 home close Swayze. The proposal is a construction of a two storey and single side extension. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Kevin Sherwood. The officer will take us through key material considerations. Uh, the application is brought to the committee because Swayze Parish Council requests the application is determined by a committee. The presenting officer is Lorraine Casey and the officer recommendation is for approval. Uh, Lorraine Casey, could you give us your presentation, please? And Thank you, Chair. And you've got your camera on. Thank you. OK. Right, I'm sharing my screen. Can you confirm, please, if you can yes, see this? Yes, see it. OK, um, so as described, this is a proposal for a part two storey and part single storey side extension to number 11 home close in Swavesey. So the site is part of a small scheme of 20 affordable dwellings that was approved as an exception site on land sited outside the development framework back in 2013. This is a two storey semi detached house that sits in the middle of the, of the site. The proposal is for a part two storey, part single storey side extension um, that would be sited on the east side of the building between number 11 and the adjacent property at number 10. So this shows the proposed floor plans. Um, the proposed extension would be set back from the front elevation of the house. Uh, so the single storey element would be set a metre or so back and extend the living accommodation at ground floor level. The first floor element would be set even further back, roughly in line with the central point of the house and would increase the number of bedrooms in the property from two to three. So this shows the existing and proposed elevations existing at the top, proposed at the bottom. Um, the proposed extension would be set approximately a metre lower than the ridge line of the existing house. And you can see from the side elevations how it's set well back from the front of the property, so two storey dropping down to, to single storey, with that still being set behind the main front elevation of the, of the house. So the key considerations are the principle of the development, um, loss of small units of accommodation, the character and appearance of the area, including landscaping impact, access to the rear garden and residential amenity. So we haven't had any neighbouring third party representations at all, but the Parish Council has raised a number of concerns with the, with the proposal. So firstly, in terms of the loss of a small unit of accommodation, the Parish point out that the um, house forms part of the development that was approved as an exception site um, specifically to provide small starter homes for local residents and that this proposal by adding a third bedroom would compromise that. Um, the second issue they've raised is that this proposal in adding a two-storey extension to the side of the property would result in the loss of a rural vista to the open fields that lie beyond the site to the rear straight north. And they uh, point out that this would be contrary to the Swayze Village Design Guide, which was adopted earlier this year. 
Um, the parish has also raised concern about the loss of the previously grassed front garden area to create parking and consider that the loss of this greenery would affect the character of the area. Um, and their final concern relates to uh, the loss of access to the rear garden area. Um, I should, as an update, point out that since the officer report was written, Councillor Ellington has written in to record her concerns on the grounds, um, the same grounds that the parish councillors raised, that the development was built in as, as an exception site for people with the Swayze connection. She is concerned that this extension would set a precedent um, for the loss of small units for accommodation and change the character of the de development that was carefully planned to include views across the fence and space for children to play. So turning to the main issues that I've identified here, firstly, in terms of the principle of development, the site is outside the development framework. Um, extensions to existing houses are supported in principle by local plan policy H13, subject to a number of criteria. I think the main criteria that this picks out is the impact of development on the character of the area. And we'll look at this in further detail a bit later on in looking at the scheme against context of the uh, village design guide. In terms of the loss of small units for accommodation issue that the parish has raised, um, it is the case that this development um, was approved as an exception site, um, specifically on the basis of the local needs in Swayze. Now that approved scheme was for 14 rented houses and six intermediate houses. In those intermediate houses, um, included potential arrangements for the occupiers to um, to own those properties at a later date. Um, and in this instance, for this property, the the owners have exercised their right to buy, and the applicant's agent has provided details of the title deeds to show it's now in their their ownership. So the um, increase in the number of bedrooms for the property isn't something that's controlled with Section 106 and there's also no local plan policies that seek to prevent small units of accommodation being extended. So also officers views are that um, this proposal wouldn't raise any uh, policy conflict um, by increasing from two bedrooms to three bedrooms. The next issue to look at relates to character issues and particularly to look at it in the context of the village design guide. Um, the parish councillors referred to two paragraphs in the village design guide. Um, there's home close falls within a section that relates to mixed linear development. Um, and two paragraphs say that the aim in these areas are to maintain existing landscape features and that new development should take cues from the street section, hedges and verges, off street parking, views through to the landscape and the harmonious variety of houses. I think I'll show you the overall extract from the village design guide. Um, this is a plan that looks at the landscape edge and key views, just to show you the, the context that the site sits in. So the, the village design guide um, talks as a whole about the character of the village being a, a linear village, but with close visual linkages to the countryside beyond and with a number of existing farms on the edge of the village with views through that provi provide that visual connection. Now on this, um, hold on a moment, I'll just, I'll just put the laser pointer on so that I can show you this. So the dots here are the farms that lie on the edge of Swayze. And then near to these farms, you have some arrows. Um, there's 15 important viewpoints identified altogether within the village design guide. 
where um, the design guide identifies that these key views through to the countryside need to be maintained. Now home close, the site that we're looking at sits here, um, so it's not affected by any of the farm sites or key views identified in the design guide. There are two sort of more minor views um, which are identified as valued landscape gap or view and I'll go on to the next slide just to show you this in in more context. OK, so this next slide shows the identified open spaces within the village design guide. Home close sits here and there's a green area here identified as incidental open space. And then we have a close up of home close here. Now this shows all this green area here was approved as um, sort of landscaping for the development. This shows one of the identified views on the previous uh, plan, which is across that open space through to the fields beyond. Then the other view shown on that plan was more this, this open space here. So that's the context of, of the village design guide. The parish councils raised concern that by extending at two storey level um, to the existing house that it would compromise the aims of the village design guide. Officers' views is that it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't encroach into any of the key views identified in the design guide, um, nor the key views sort of across um, to the fields beyond next to this site. And I think look, looking at the photos, um, it's just to demonstrate this further. The other point to mention is that uh, there is also a gap. Uh, between the site and number 10 to the to the east. So um, the proposed extension would be, as I showed you in the plans of the development, it would be set back uh, quite way behind the front elevation of the house. This gap where number 10 is would still be maintained. So there would still be a gap in that building line and views through uh, beyond I'll just run through the other slides. Um, again, this shows the context of the site and number 10 uh, next to it. Um, you've also got a slight stagger in the building line, which would help to break out that impact as well. And again, looking uh, toward the site from, from the east shows the stagger in that, that building line. So as mentioned, officers views is that um, the the proposed extension wouldn't uh, compromise the, the aims of the village design guide and that the, the extension is uh, very much subservient to the design of the existing house. There are concerns that have been raised that the front garden has been paved over. Now, this was done before the application was submitted. Um, and being a permeable surface is permitted development. Um, so these works don't actually specifically require planning permission. I think because I showed you on a previous slide as well, the key green areas identified in the village design guide are the main sort of structural landscaping and setting to the development rather than the the small grass frontages to the uh, to the front of the houses. Um, another issue that's been raised by the parish council relates to the potential obstruction of access to the rear garden area. I'll scroll back here to the block plan. So this proposal would reduce the gap uh, at the side of the house to 0.4 metres. Um, that isn't enough space to, to drag bins from the rear garden, so to compensate for this, 
the application shows um, a small bin store located to the front of the extension. Um, officers have also recommended a condition requiring details as to where bikes would be parked. Um, and the final issue to mention is one of residential amenity. We haven't had any third party objections but this proposal involves two storey extension coming towards number 10 to the east. Number 10 has no windows in, in this elevation, so officers are satisfied that the development wouldn't harm their amenities through loss of light, uh, overlooking or overshadowing. Thank you, Chair. So this Thank Just you. to conclude, the, the recommendation is one of um, one of approval subject to conditions. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Any? We're getting an echo for some reason. Uh, or anybody wish to? Yeah, we this? have Councillor Heather Williams wanting to speak. All right. Okay. Councillor Williams, please. I hate to uh, contradict the vice chairman, but he definitely had a question in first. But I can go. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Just get on. He, he can okay. Question in a minute. Um, so it's just about the. There seems to be a bit of concern from the parish council that this was an exception site, and I'm just wondering if um, if Lorraine, if you were able to just explain how we can balance that and whether the fact that it was an exception site is no longer a um, a material planning consideration or not. Because obviously the, the purpose of those houses being granted permission was that they were small and that this would make them not not then in relation to their original purpose potentially. Thank you. Yeah, um, through you, Chair, I think to to respond to this, um, I don't see that there's any um, policy basis for being able to sustain an objection to the number of bedrooms being increased within this proposal. Um, although it was part of the original remit for the um, home close being approved and that it was specifically designed to meet the uh, the needs of the village at that time. Um, there is no requirement either within that planning permission, the 106 or within planning policy um, to protect those units as effectively as they were built in perpetuity. Um, the other point I would make is I think that um, policies have evolved since to look at uh, sort of lifetime homes and to consider homes being suitable for um, living in in the longer term. The original occupants have exercised their right to buy and I think are proposing a, a modest extension to it that would enable them to, to continue living in the house. Okay, thank you Chairman, I must apologise. I had missed out both Councillor Deborah Roberts and Councillor Judith Rippith, who I thought were in relation to the previous item. I'm wrong. So they're both down to speak, if they may. OK, fine. Uh, so Councillor Roberts, then, please. Are you with us, Councillor Roberts? Sorry, Chairman, it's all that noise <laughs> they're talking behind. Uh, my question is being asked by Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. OK, lovely. Thank you very much. Councillor Ripeth, then, please. I think my question has been asked by Councillor Williams as well. So looking at the material considerations, are you saying that actually loss of small units of accommodation is no longer a material consideration? Because it's been superseded by other other newer policies and the fact that they've exercised their right to buy. If you can confirm either way. 
Yeah, th th through you, Chair, um, whilst it is a consideration at the time that um, exception sites are, are approved, um, there is no ongoing control in terms of planning policy that specifically protects small units for accommodation. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, and surprisingly, um, not for doesn't protect them from right to buy either, which uh, is something of an issue, but nothing much we can do about that. Uh, do we have more speakers? Councillor Riffith wanted to speak, Chair. She just has. I just have. <laughs> and then I think the You're next one is me. Attention, it's Councillor I mean, well. Since I'm down, I might as well speak, Chair. Uh, yeah. I, I, me? No, she. Councillor Thane's got his name down before you. I will in. come to Councillor Hawkins in a minute. Yes, uh, going back to the question of viewpoints, which was the uh, one of the key concerns of the parish council, we saw a photograph taken pretty well direct on from the front just now, which showed not only a, a, um, a white, what looked as though it could have been either a container or a lorry, which of course would be temporary, but behind that another permanent building uh, it did seem to me that the view to the extent it was important or had been one of those protected was obscured anyway. Um, is that correct? Uh, through you, Chair, if I may, um, it is compromised to some extent by the um, photo that I showed you, which has a domestic outbuilding to the to the rear of number 10. Um, but I was looking more at the, the sort of higher level and first floor views above that building. Thank you. We then come to Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Chairman. All right, thank you. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if I can refer to the Village Design Guide uh, 4.1 and um, I think it's 4.4, 4.5. The idea of that is, I mean, I was one of, I had the pleasure of sitting through um, listening to all the, I think it was seven or eight uh, Village Design Guides when um, went to the Design Enabling Panel. And I know that uh, Swavesy was very, very keen on keeping uh, the gaps in between, uh, you know, the houses and the buildings um, so that, you know, they had views out into the countryside. Now, obviously, in this case, uh, 4.1 says to maintain the rural gaps and important views. Um, again, you know, through controlling tree plants and alterations to buildings and 4.5, 4.5, you know, sort of go on to emphasize that. So in if we're looking at this, how do we justify the fact that the extension is to the side and will block some of that view? I know, it's, you know what's before us is on a side extension. Surely a rear extension would have been better, but then that's what was before us. So I take that point. But my my feeling is that if we begin to encroach on the views in this way, it's only a matter of time before everybody wants a side extension and then it's all blocked. So my question, how do we justify the side extension in this? I don't see how we do. I might be wrong. For, for you, Chair, if I may, can I um, share my screen again and show the plan up of the uh, village design guide extract? Yeah, please. C can you all see the plan? Yeah, got it. OK, so the paragraph that Councillor Hawkins has referred to, so paragraph 4.1 of the design guide, um, says that the intention is to maintain the rural gaps and important views identified in figure 10. Now, the um, plan in front of you is figure 10. Um, and then it goes on to say, including through controlling tree planting and alterations to buildings and boundary structures. Now, this paragraph relates to um, 
those important landscape gaps and views that are specifically identified on on this plan. I may put the laser pointer back on here just so you can see it more clearly. Um, as mentioned, there's 15 identified important viewpoints. Um, so starting from the north, um, coming down, they're quite hard to see on, on here, but there's another one here near to the site. You've got uh, one in here um, and then a number of others at the points where you have um, particularly have sort of farms that are directly next to the to the village framework. Now they're the um, important gaps that the design guide identifies that need protecting. Um, my view is that if we did have applications for extent, side extensions to buildings um, that included tree planting and that included boundary alterations that would uh, fill in those gaps and conceal those views through to the countryside, um, that that would raise conflict with the village design guide. In this instance, um, officers' views are that the, the proposal doesn't raise conflict. It isn't one of those views identified as being important within the, the village design guide. And the, um, the valued landscape gaps and views that the village design guide does identify um, in Swayze, uh, which we can see in further detail um, in this picture here, um, covers the views to the to the open fields across this parcel of land. So I think would you know would be a strong reason in addition to the landscape value for um, resisting future development of this space here. Um, but our view is that. The side extension for this dwelling here doesn't raise conflict with the with the aims um, and specific guidance within the village design guide. Thank you, Chair. Thank can you I come back to this, Chair? Yeah, briefly. Uh, please, can you go back to that uh, that drawing? Thank you. Because further down in the design guide, it, do, it does talk about the bricks. In fact, you can see that it says bricks in the building line. There's a reason for that. Um, you know, it's a linear development popular to the main road, but those views are still important to those who, um, you know, put the uh, design guide together. So what's going to be happening is you have this linear development. You have the build, the, you know, the bricks in the building line, which are deliberate. But what this particular one is going to do is going to start blocking that up. That is my point, and you will find it in 4.5 as well. So that's right. my concern. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, okay councillor. Then you know you bring that into your consideration. I don't think the officers actually can tell you anything much more on that. No, that's it. That's my contribution. Thank. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Any more questions, councillor Thane? No. None listed, Chair. Excellent. So we move on then to the public speakers. We have two public speakers here on this one. Is uh, Sophie Mason with us, please? Hello. Yes, I am. Hi. All right. Uh, welcome. Sorry to keep you so long. No problem. Thank you. I'm, I take my hat off to you doing this for a job. I've listened all day and it's very hard work. <laughs> it is. And we're not finished yet, Sophie. OK, so yeah, the system, you get three minutes to make your point. Uh, and then I, I'll, I'll ask you to wind up if you're still on and going. So when you're ready, you've got your three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding my home extension, which will, will provide an additional bedroom uh, for our son. He's now at the age where he can no longer share a bedroom. We have a two bed house currently. Uh, and three boys. We're a family of five. We, we've we been working very closely with the planning department on this project to ensure that the design was kept, was, was within keeping with the existing property whilst not being obstructive or having a ne negative impact on the neighbouring properties. We have ensured this through design by not, by not having any overlooking windows, any privacy or loss of light issues. 
This design meets the relevant planning policies as highlighted within the officer's report and as such planning permission should be granted. I'd like to thank the planning officer for her assistance during this planning stage and, and thank you all you know, for your comments and commitment. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any points of clarification members that you want for Mrs Mason? I don't see anybody. OK, well, thank you very much indeed for your contribution there, Mrs Mason. And we're, we'll move on to the Parish Council then. Is Councillor Wright with us, please? Councillor Wright. Councillor Will Wright. I can't hear him. Don't know if he's still on the list. He is with us, Chair, uh, on the phone. Um, it appears that, that he is on mute um, and wouldn't have been here earlier on. So, uh, Councillor Wright, if you can hear me, uh, if you try to, on your keypad for your phone, click uh, star six and then the hash symbol, that should allow you to unmute and speak. Uh, I also sent the instructions to your email. All right, thank you. We give Councillor Wright a couple of minutes then, see if he can manage to make contact. How's that? Hello, yeah. Is that Councillor Wright? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can do. Ah, OK. Good. Is that the chairman? Yes, the chairman speaking. Yes. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good, Mr. Good, Chairman. Good afternoon, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to keep um, you so long. That's uh, OK. And me members of the council, I'm, I'm normally sitting in there when all these things happen, but uh, unfortunately I've had to resort to a telephone today because of the uh, uh, teams. I can't get on there with my laptop, but never mind. No. OK, fair enough. Now, as a member of the parish council, I, I just need to ask you that you have the permission of your parish council to speak on their behalf today. I do, yes. I think Good. an email was sent. Yeah. Right. OK, you've got uh, three minutes to make your point to us. So whenever you're ready, uh, please go. OK, thank you. Um, Ten years ago, the home close site was a paddock on the edge of Swavesey. And then in 2013, an outline planning application was granted uh, on behalf of a housing association to build 20 dwellings for social housing, which would be uh, maintained uh, directly for people that lived in the village and uh, either or either that or had work in here so they could be close to home and work. Um, when permission was granted, the housing association dropped out of the project and South Carroll District Council Housing took over the building thereof. This development was an exception site and still is outside the village development boundary to provide smaller properties for local people to live close to their families in the village and of their place to work. Uh, the parish council was extremely disappointed that the right to buy was not withheld from these properties so as to keep them as low cost housing in perpetuity. As residents purchase and extend these properties, the original purpose of their origin will be lost as market values and larger dwellings would never have been approved on this site. Just 200 yards from this site across the road, Raw Homes are currently marketing uh, 100 homes. The current price for a two bedroom house over there is 300,000 pounds and the current price for a three bedroom home is 360,000 pounds. This is not affordable housing, but reflects the price of housing in our village. The village design guide was adopted in January of this year and clearly states the need to maintain rural views and gaps between the dwellings where these exist and to protect the landscaping of front gardens. What this does not mean is really the positioning of refuse bins and two or three vehicles in front of the dwellings. Were this or any similar extension on this site to go ahead, it would effectively be in total contradiction of the design guide, which is an integral section of the emerging neighbourhood plan. 
uh, the parish council, as I say, the parish council was very disappointed that the right to buy it was not withheld. We feel, we feel that if a precedent is created, then before we know where we are, there'll be developments everywhere on this site, and that is not what it was intended to be. And we would like to think that the original idea of maintaining this as an affordable housing unit for people directly connected to the village uh, would maintain as it is without further development. And that's all I've got to say on it. Um, if you've got any questions for me, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, are there any matters, matters that members would like to raise with this? I haven't seen anybody so far. Councillor Thane, do we have anyone? No one listed at the moment, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, thank you for your time and your contribution. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank members. Um, open for debate. Who would like to kick off, please? Right, is there no, no one wishes to speak to this? No, I think we have uh, Councillor Heather Williams wants to oh, speak, right. and Councillor okay. Toomey Hawkins, and now Councillor Richard Williams, too. Fine, okay, thank you very much. So, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it's been it's been really helpful hearing from all the speakers and I and I can understand the situation the applicant finds themselves and, and why they want to do what what they do. Um, obviously from from our position we have to look at the the uh, material planning considerations and I just feel that the extension with it going sideways as opposed to going to the rear um, for me there is a lot of uniformity in that road and I think that does create a disruption to the street scene as a whole um, so I I will listen to to others of course but I am minded that that the extension in its current form is not really suitable for the for the road itself and I would be on the if I was looking to refuse it on the grounds of street scene and policy HQ1 of which that falls in um, but you know we'll be listening to others because I can see it's uh, very much on balance. Thank you chairman. Thank you. Uh, can we go then to uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins I think. Yeah, Councillor Hawkins thank you. Uh, thank you chair. Um, I think I, I wouldn't live by the point what you heard what I said earlier on. Um, I believe that the uh, the proposed extension where it is is out of keeping, out of character and um, will affect the way that development looks and, and the views that um, it has through the gaps in the building. So it's uh, it's appearance and uh, character. I think for me, I will completely understand where the applicants are coming from, but I think uh, it's an extension in the wrong place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Councillor Richard Williams. All right, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, I, I find this a really difficult application. Um, I hear what the parish council says and I understand the points Councillor Hawkins has just made about the street scene. I, I can also very much see it from the applicant's side and, and, and I do note something the parish council said about the affordability of housing. I, it, it, it's a catch-22 really because yes you want to preserve affordable housing within the village but equally people who bought those houses and maybe can't afford to move to a bigger house but need a bigger house if we cut off their ability to, to extend their house too, we're, 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 we're just creating a slightly different problem. Um, so so I, I, I'm very on the fence about this one. I, 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 can, I can really see it both ways. I've got great sympathy with the applicant. I can see the parish council's point of view. I'd be interested to hear what other members think. We then have Councillor Martin Khan, Chair. Councillor Khan, please. Thank you. 
I don't really think that the view between uh, these houses, which were line of, uh, of very typical uh, semi-detached houses uh, in the countryside, uh, uh, sorry, coming out from the village, is a really major impact, and the design and material seem to be to matching quite well. Uh, it's not going. It's the, these we've got five, uh, three children. It's five-person house, and, and two bedrooms is acceptable. And I cannot see that the people who live there are likely to be able to move to one of these 300 or 300 or 360,000 pound houses in the village. I think actually uh, helping them to stay in the house is um, is uh, meeting part of the need, our social need. And, and I will be voting. Uh, my general feeling in this particular circumstance, I'll vote in favour. If we wished them to remain rental houses, we should have found a system by which we did, but we've allowed right to buy, therefore we have to accept what happens with that. All right, thank you. And Councillor Ripeth, please. Part of my points have already been covered, but I just want to emphasise that when we went on a housing trip um, organised by Judy Fletcher, these, this is one of the places we saw, and I was struck by how you had that view through and the larger gardens and if we allow this although i can completely understand the applicant's reasons as as to why it is actually over development of the site you can't get round the sides of the house and it will set a precedent because why wouldn't everybody else want to do the same and block in that view block in the gap okay thank you very much Councillor Fain, any further speakers? Councillor Nicholas Wright. Thank you. Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, my feeling on this is that the planning officer, Lorraine Casey, has been absolutely forensic in her going through each item very, very clearly. And, you know, it's tempting to look at the site as a whole, but she's dealt with each objection very, very clearly. And um, the I, I do know the site well. It, it does have that combs teeth views through it, but this doesn't, this extension in its own right, doesn't completely block up the view between the houses. It blocks one side of it, um, so it is fairly minor. And anyway, it's not one of the main uh, views that are covered in the design guide. So um, tempted as I am to go with my heart and uh, defend something which I don't think is defendable, I think you know the planning officer is right on this, and um, that. Uh, Although the, the principles were there in the original design, that has been eroded with time, unfortunately. And um, you know, each application has to be taken on its merits. And on this application, on its merits, I think we should grant it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I think Councillor Fain, you wanted to speak. Yes, quick word. Uh, I think Councillor Wright has just said it. I, I accept what the uh, Planning officer said that this uh, does not compromise the village design guide. Uh, the village design guide does not say there should be no further extensions to houses within the village. Um, I think I take on board entirely what Richard Williams was saying about the need for families who come into affordable houses to be able to grow, to accommodate in this case their three boys, although the personal circumstances are not what we're looking at here. And also what Martin Kahn said, and so I am satisfied that the planning officer has given us the right advice in her very clear presentation and that we should therefore approve this application. Right, thank you very much indeed. Um, I agree entirely. We have every sympathy with the uh, parish council, but the, there seems to me that to be no legal basis to do other than allow this. This is not a major view and uh, I don't think that argument stands up. So without further um, speakers, I will take this now to a vote. So the proposal before you is for approval. If you want to approve it, you're for it. If you want to refuse it, you're against. 
And if you want to abstain, you're abstaining. I will do a roll call. Councillor Khan, please. Uh, approve. Thank you. Councillor Fain. For approval. For. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Against. Against. Thank you. Councillor Ripeth. Against. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. For. For. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Against. Councillor Richard Williams. For. For. Thank you. Councillor Wright. For. Thank you. And I'll vote for. So the outcome is two, four, six in favour and three against. So this application is approved. Thank you very much. We move on then to our next application, which is our agenda item 10. It's on page 221 of our agenda. Will Right, Swabersea Parish Council. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, we have is now exiting agenda item 20 stroke 02217 stroke FUL. This is a Cottenham 8 mill field. Proposed change. Could, could everyone make sure that they are on mute, please? There's a lot of background noise going on. Thank you. Right, the proposal is a change of use of land to form part of residential curtilage and the erection of a double garage. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Paul Levitt. Uh, key material considerations will be outlined by the presenting officer. Uh, this is a departure. Uh, the application is brought to committee because of departure policy S stroke seven. The recommendation is for approval and the presenting officer is Rebecca Clayden. Rebecca Clayden, would you give us your presentation, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Good, I can see that. Wonderful. OK, so the site is 8 Millfield in Cottenham. The proposal is for the change of use to land southwest of 8 Millfield to C3 residential use to form part of the residential curtilage of the property, as well as the erection of a detached double, double garage. The land sits to the southeast of 8 Millfield. The key issues to consider in the determination of this application are the principle of the development and the impact of the proposal to the visual amenity of the area and encroachment into the countryside. Um, the development sits outside of the development framework, um, which is this black dashed line here, um, but it does not sit within the conservation area or the statutory green belt. The land is 0.05 hectares in size. Whilst its lawful use is for agricultural purposes, the land is not currently part of a wider agricultural land holding and is therefore not in active use. Um, an application for eight millfields so for the site for a two storey side extension, single storey rear extension and loft conversion was permitted earlier this year. The site itself sits on its own and is surrounded by fields on all sides except the northwest. However, there is a stretch of large semi-detached properties which face 8 Millfield, um, and these properties do benefit from a considerably larger residential curtilage than the site. This is the view of the site towards Longview, which faces away from Cottenham. The site is situated to the right of the image, so just here. And this is the view facing Cottenham. Um, and this is the site to your left here. And this is a proposed block plan, the site outlined in red here. Um, as you can see, there's associated landscaping, including planting and hard standing as part of the proposal. There's also the addition of three parking spaces. 
um, as well as the development of a new detached double garage. And these are the proposed, these are the elevations of the proposed garage. And these are the elevations of the long elevations of the proposed development. So the the incorporated cartilage there. This is eight mil filled, and this is the new garage. And here as well, so eight mil filled and the garage. The parish council have objected to the proposal on the basis that the proposal would be contrary contrary to neighbourhood plan policy COH21 and local plan policy S7. Um, due to the location of the site, which is outside the development framework. Whilst the proposal does sit outside the framework and would be contrary to the aforementioned policies, it is considered that the extent of conflict with the local plan would be limited due to the size of the site and the presence of the dwellings opposite, um, and that therefore there would be no significant visual or encroachment harm on, uh, arising from the proposal. It's also considered that the proposal would preserve the character and appearance of the area in accordance with policy HQ1 of the South Cambridgeshire local plan um, and officers are therefore recommending this application for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, any points of clarification members? Chairman, can we ask? Could we ask to have a look at the um, the drawings again, please? Of course. Yeah, is there a specific point you want? Yeah, because there's a big gap between the house and the um, intended garage. Yeah. Okay. Could we illustrate that then, please, Rebecca? Yeah, of course. Um, so this is the front elevation of the proposed uh, of the of the long elevations, um, and this is the side and rear. Is there any particular one you'd like to see, Councillor? That actually showed from the front, which showed a green area between. It, it's not this one. Previous one. Yes. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. So how, how far away from the house is it, is this? Yeah, I mean, why why is it being placed so far away? It, I mean, it's got the potential. It's a, it's almost like a dare I say it a separate dwelling. Is this in reference to the to the new to the proposed garage? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure why it's it's been placed so far away. Um, to, to be honest. So how far away is it actually then? Um, I don't actually know off the top of my head. If you give me a couple of minutes, I can I can I mean, find out. What's that? 50, 20 yards or something like that? You wouldn't expect a garage to be so far away. I mean, you're going to get absolutely drowned, drowned through to the skin if it's raining. <laughs> to try to get to the house. OK, all right. Well, looks, it looks a bit iffy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thane, have we got speakers? Councillor Wright would like to speak. Councillor Wright, please. Councillor Wright, uh, Councillor Roberts has made half my point that it is such a long way away and also you're creating an infill site between the, the garage and the house looking at the gap. It, it does seem very surprising that we should uh, even be considering this. All right, thank you. Well, on what basis wouldn't we be considering it, Councillor Wright? Could I ask you? Well, well, no, no, let, let Councillor Wright explain himself. Yeah, but this is open countryside, it's outside the village framework, and you're busy creating for an applicant an infill site with a gap between two buildings. Right, well, yeah, we, as always, we can only judge what's before us, isn't it? So we, we can't surmise what might or might not uh, happen else in later times. But anyway, I'm sure we've all noted that. Uh, Councillor Thane, was, did you want to speak? No, Chair, I don't need to speak myself and I don't see any others who are. Okay, great. So oh, we now have Councillor Khan wants to speak. Oh. Is it Councillor Khan, the last minute speaker again? I'm only going to make a little comment that when I was uh, 
uh, in my teens, I lived in a chartist, uh, former chartist settlement in the Midlands, which was a house very similar to this, a former, uh, a former horticultural uh, house. And the garage was all at a, a little bit further distance away from the house. So I don't, in that sort of location, it's, uh, in a rural area, I don't find it particularly unusual. So whether it's convenience or not a matter. Okay, thank you for that. So no actual question. So I go to the public speakers in that case. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, we have a written statement um, from the applicant, which you've all had a copy of. That's from Mr. Levitt. Um, I'm sure you've all uh, read that. Um, can't actually be with us today. The parish council, I believe, is being represented. Is Councillor Morris still with us, please? Councillor Morris? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, well, yeah, I'll well, keep well, well done, still with us. <laughs> Good. Yeah. OK, sorry for the long no, don't worry. time today. Um, but I'll, leave. I'll, help you, I'll help you a little bit by keeping the front end short because it would be quite repetitive compared to what I said earlier. Sure. Um, but one thing that is important is to remind us that a neighbourhood plan is the voice of the local people, the local community, in terms of where they think new homes, shops and offices are to be built and what they should look like. Um, having said that, um, we also have local knowledge of the site. Um, Millfield in particular, some years ago, was the subject of a demolition order where a, an owner, and it's not directly relevant to this site, but it is in Millfield, constructed a substantial building that had to be demolished later, partly because of the traffic problems it was causing. Millfield is a privately maintained road with a very narrow access entrance with limited visibility displays that often cause accidents and uh, road traffic situations. So Millfield is unable to support safe, segregated pedestrian access and in our view, any development is unwise. And the suggested conditions, while perhaps necessary, if it was approved, don't really address the two key concerns. In our view, policy COH 2.1 was there for a reason, the development framework, which we extended as part of the neighbourhood plan. And it does say that development proposals outside the development framework will only be supported by the design to provide appropriate facilities for rural enterprise, agriculture, forestry or leisure, or where they otherwise accord with national or local planning policies. So as Councillor Wright said, this application should not even be here. There's no attempt been made to demonstrate how a detached garage, which I think in the design and access statement is acknowledged not to be a garage at all, it's a storage facility um, located some considerable distance from the residential premises. Um, and again, uh, the distance is such that it's um, practically unusable in, in rainfall and such like. And unlike one of the councillors suggested, the Councillor Fane, I think it was, garages in Cottenham, generally speaking, are not that far away from the property that they're serving. It may have been the case in some council properties from the 70s, but they caused their own problems, of course, clusters of council houses detached from the properties. So in summary, because there's been no attempt made to show how um, the detached garage located some distance away from the premises complies with any of the allowed purposes under the neighbourhood plan policy, so H21, how it delivers any planning benefit it's not a house, it's a storage facility, it's not an affordable homes, it's not an exception site, none of the kind, and how that could outweigh pedestrian safety concerns in the road. And it also doesn't comply with local plan policy S7. So permission should be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Councillor Morris? I think Councillor Fain, you, you got a question? Uh, yes, perhaps I should just stress that I haven't made any comments about the distance between uh, houses and garages anywhere. 
Um, I just wonder to what extent this is likely to create traffic problems when it looks from some of the pictures we've seen as though the owners of this house already have cars. So presumably it wouldn't affect the number of cars actually going up Millfield. I think it will. Um, the layout plan shows two additional cars, if you like, in front of the storage facility. Um, and a car alongside the house. Um, inevitably, there will be more more traffic. It's a small amount, but given that the access is only four meters and there is a conflict over the final 20 meters going out of the site into a very restricted area of Rook Street and that area where the visibility displays are very short. Um, in this case, it will increase the probability of accidents. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, I don't think we have any further no, members of the committee okay. seeking to comment. Okay, we can let Councillor Morris go then. <laughs> thank you very much for your yeah, time. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, anyone wishing to make a statement on this one? No? All right, do so you want to go straight to a vote then? I will uh, we have Councillor Roberts wants to contribute to the debate, okay, Chairman, right. and I'd quite like to do so myself after that. OK, Councillor Roberts, please. Um, thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my feelings are I'm always so uh, appreciative of Cotton and Parish Council, and they do an awful lot of very uh, informed checking before they come to see us. And they have their facts, um, like we used to say, ducks in a row. And, and I think that the fact is that this is, is not compliant with um, any of the allowances that would be made for this particular site. Um, it should clearly, in my mind, remain as garden land. Um, I am very concerned about the, the distance that has been put between it uh, this building because it's not a garage it really does not appear to be a garage i think um cotton and parish council have called it a storage facility um and the the present house uh, we appear to be um going down the route of you know making a a separate plot here and giving it a, a residential use so i i think on all the planning criteria and grounds that were put by the um cotton and parish council representative uh, we should be refusing it Thank you, Chairman. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thane, please. Yes, yeah, me again, Chair. Um, I think we may wonder why this garage is not being placed next to the house. We may even have our suspicions as to its real purpose, as to whether it is intended in the long term to create a separate unit. I think there's nothing unusual in saying of all garages that they're effectively storage areas but they are nonetheless ancillary to the existing use of the building if in due course a garage placed on this site the owners then owners were to seek conversion to a house they would of course need planning consent and that would be considered in the light of the neighborhood plan but this is a proposal an application for a garage on a site just next door to the house and I don't think it's for us to judge how far a garage should be from the house and whether somebody's going to need an umbrella to get from one to the other. Chairman I'm sorry but that's incorrect isn't it? No, no, no come on no no interruption thank you if you want to speak just put your name down again we've got another speaker it's thank you, Chair. Councillor Wright please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to differ from Councillor Fane in that I think this is going to cause problems. It is you know, a design feature that it is too far from the house and it should be adjacent. Uh, I can see no reason why it shouldn't be adjacent uh, if it's going to be acceptable, but I'm absolutely with Pat Cotton and Parish Council here uh, and it should be refused, I believe, with uh, the neighbourhood plan policy COH2 and local plan policy S7 being taken into account. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. 
thing up. Okay. Did the officer, Toby Williams, wish you to speak to us, I believe? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to say in the, re the report, actually, the distance is referenced by Rebecca between the garage and the house as um, about 17.8 metres, so it's some distance. Um, also in Rebecca's um, PowerPoint presentation, there are views looking up um, Millfield and you can clearly see that there are side windows in the existing uh, property, which is presumably why they have set the, the, the garage away from that property. What I would say in terms of kind of members approach to this is that the scale of the garage is domestic scale. We're not prejudicing the council's ability to kind of determine kind of any other kind of applications that might come forward on that land. And you'll see that the officer recommendation seeks to remove part E of the permitted development rights for the erection of any other um, outbuildings on that land. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I think Chair, we, we have, have Councillor Khan wants to speak. All right, Councillor Khan, please. Well, I understand the uh, Cotton Parish Council's uh, concern about it being a uh, development in the countryside. But this seems to me relatively small scale. I'm sorry I mentioned earlier on in the questions about the uh, distance, but I've commented that it doesn't seem to me exceptionally distant uh, uh, for that sort of rural location. Um, the question is whether we're willing to extend the curtilage. I should point out at the moment the land is in agricultural use uh, and uh, you could build agricultural buildings without uh, with permitted development rights, which would, might be well much more ugly. By doing this, we take the land, with, which I don't think is a terribly intrusive building, into uh, into control because we're removing all permitted development rights as part of a residential curtilage. I think that I'm, I I don't really see enough reason to, to to refuse it, and I shall probably support it. All right, thank you, Chairman. Councillor Roberts would like to come back at us. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Please. Many thanks, Chairman. Uh, the, the thing, Chairman, that I'm reading is. That what we have uh, got here is land outside the village envelope where you wouldn't allow development and what it clearly states here is that they are asking us and what we would be giving is a change of use to residential on that piece of land so oh, the talk about we can stop it at some um, later stage if it morphs into something different we're halfway down the line um, if we go along with this and, and I'm sorry chairman it seems to me in thinking back to what uh, the parish council um, chairman stated, it doesn't fit in with any criteria. We're asking to change a piece of garden land outside the village envelope into residential use. And once we go down that road, and, and chairman, there are sites like this in every village in South Cambridgeshire. We are setting a dangerous precedent here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Carter wishes to have a word. Um, Thank you, Chair. Before you quite do that then, yes. uh, I mean, obviously a, a number of members are likely to be looking for a refusal. My understanding of what they're looking for is that this is an inappropriate development in the open countryside. It's against the design guide COH stroke two and it's outside the village envelope. Uh, yeah, uh, may I return to that in just yes, one moment, please, Chair? Yeah. Um, so just just for the clarification for the committee, uh, following Deborah, Robert, uh, sorry, Council Roberts comments, my apologies. Um, when we say change of use to residential use, we mean domestic residential use. To change to a separate residential use, i.e. another dwelling, would require a new planning commission uh, in its own right. Um, so that's just for, for clarification. In terms of uh, potential reasons for refusal, yes, I agree, Council uh, Chairman. Uh, what I've heard is that uh, by virtue of the location outside of Cottenham uh, development framework, the proposal is inappropriate development in the countryside, uh, contrary to policy S7 of the local plan and uh, policy COH2-1 of the neighbourhood plan. That would be my reading of what's, what I've heard from the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 
let's just get that going. OK, so I don't have any more speakers, so I'm going to go to a vote. So the off recommendation before us is for approval. So you are for it if you want it approved, you're against it if you want it refused. We've got the grounds outlined for refusal if that's what you want. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. Um, somebody else has turned up. Could you turn your uh, camera off, please? Thank you. OK, so we're going for a, a vote and I'll do a roll call. So, Councillor Khan. Four. Four. Councillor Fain. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Against. Against. Councillor Ripeth. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against. Eight. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Eight. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you. And I'm four. That's two, four, four, and two, four, five against. So that is refused. Thank you very much, everyone, on that one. And we move to our last uh, planning application, which is agenda item 12. No, it's not. It's agenda item 11, isn't it? Let's, let's get that. So agenda item 11 on the agendas, it's two, page 227. It's uh, application 20 stroke 03308 stroke CL2PD, and it's at 51 Brookfield Way, Camborne. So the proposal is for a lawful certificate for a proposed single storey side extension to both sides of a detached house. The applicant is Miss Eyre. Uh, the key material consideration is whether the proposal constitutes permitted development. Um, it's not a departure. It's coming to us because the applicant is a member of staff at South Cam's District Council. The officer a recommendation is approval. The presenting officer is John McAteer. Um, so over to Mr McAteer, will you give us your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, give me a moment, I will share my screen. Could you confirm you can see that for me? Yes, we got that. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, councillors. My item is an application for a lawful development certificate for two single storey side extensions at 51 Brookfield Way. Uh, normally this would not require uh, committee deliberation, but circumstances are different here as the applicant is a member of staff at South Cambridgeshire District Council. I'll move right on to the site location plan. We can see here 51 uh, Brookfield Way uh, on the road there. Um, no conditions have been applied to the property which would uh, remove permitted development rights, uh, and this is not a conservation area. I'll move on to the uh, proposed plans. We have existing elevations above, uh, proposed elevations below, and we can see the uh, proposed side extensions here and here. Uh, those dimensions are quite small, uh, but they will be 2.6 metres in width and 2.6 metres in height at the eaves. If I go over to the floor plans, again, we can see the extensions on the side of the building there, and they are 7.7 .7 metres in depth, which matches the uh, depth of the existing house. I've uh, summarised the uh, pertinent details for permitted development. 
Neither of the extensions would exceed a height of four metres. You've seen that. Neither extension would be greater than half the width of the original house. Both extensions would be single storey, as you recall from the elevations, and both extensions would be constructed with similar materials to match the existing house. So the uh, proposal would appear to comply with Schedule 2, uh, Part 1, Class A of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order 2015. Uh, therefore, I recommend that a certificate of lawful development be granted in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, well, members, uh, it's before you simply because it is a member of staff. It's been pointed out to you that uh, it meets all the, the requirements. Uh, can I go straight to a vote on this one, please? Agreed. Yes, Agreed. So can I take it by affirmation? Is anyone against? No one against. So that is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Quick thank, one, thank God. <laughs> OK, we move on. We're now on agenda item 12. On two, page 231 and it's the enforcement report. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> right, anything uh, to report? Uh, I've got um, no uh, updates in respect of the, the report submitted. There are things going on, but there's nothing I can report on at the moment. At this moment. OK, fine. fine. Uh, anything, uh, anything members would like to raise? Uh, I know uh, yeah, Councillor Heather Williams will probably be, like to thank you for Appendix 3, which is uh, the enforcement activities in her ward. Uh, if, if I may speak for myself, Chairman, if that's OK. Well, all right. Um, thank you, Chairman. Much appreciated. So yes, thank you very much for sharing the appendix and I think that's very much helped uh, some local residents as well to understand exactly what's been going on on the site. There has been one thing subsequent to that which is in the report which was the tarpauling incident but um, I contacted Gordon and he was out the same day and it um, definitely has made a, made a difference some of the measures that have been taken of recent so my thanks to all the enforcement team for your support doing that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Right. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing thank me to much. thank them for myself. Right. <laughs> Do we have any further speakers? Councillor Wright wanted to speak. All right. Thank you. Councillor Wright, please. Chairman, through you, could I request an update on Cotton and Smithy Fens and our progress through the courts there at the next meeting? Yeah, thank you very much. Is that all right? Uh, yes, I know that. Like the, is there actually going to be something to update on? Uh, there, there, will, there will be. We've had um, a recently aerial photographs of the site taken, which we'll be uh, comparing with uh, those which were taken in November and see what changes have taken place. Excellent. OK, thank you very much. So if we're going to have that at the next meeting, that would be great. So, so I think we have. I hope you haven't sat there all day, have you? Well, yeah. I've sat here, but I've been doing other things. Yeah. You've been in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman, right. I hate Thank to you. stop you in mid-flow, but I see that Councillor Ripith would like to speak. Oh, right, OK. Councillor Ripith. Yeah, I apologise. Sorry, Chairman. Um, just a thanks. It's not yet made it onto the report, but um, thanks to the enforcement team for sorting out the issue on Fen Road in Milton, which I dare say will come onto the next agenda. OK, good. Thank you very much. So you've only got thanks today, so uh, well we're done. OK, I, I, we'll move on. I won't need too big a drink tonight. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, just as you say that Alistair only has thanks, we have a question from uh, Councillor Williams, please. Oh, no, it's on the peels, I think, isn't it? 
Um, no I see appeals yet. Yeah, that I was I was preempting that we might move quite quickly onto the next one. Yeah, we're, we're, we're about to go there now. So thank you very much. We've done the agenda at item 12. We're now on 13 appeals against planning decisions. Um, uh, Councillor Williams, you want to raise a point? Thank you, Chairman. It was just the new appeals that are in and the dates. Could officers just let us know in any of these applications of our five year housing land supply being tested, please? Or are they other grounds? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Carter, can you enlighten us, sir? Yes, Chair, if you can just bear with me a moment. My computer seems to think it's had enough, so <laughs> just one moment. It's probably not just your computer, Chris. I think we're all feeling like that at the moment. Uh, so looking at those appeals received, um, given the scale of development we're talking about, um, I, I mean, I don't know for sure I can check for you, Councillor, but uh, it doesn't appear to be the case uh, that that would be a factor in any of those appeals. Uh, let me just <laughs> very slowly scroll down to the final page. Chairman, as it's been a long day, I'm happy for yourself. I'm happy if um, if they want to get back to me outside the meeting. Um, because it, it might be that it's not one of those and it's something different. Happy to take it offline. If Chris yeah, doesn't as I say, I'm not aware of any uh, ongoing appeals that do raise the issue of five year by, but I will happily find out and update the committee to that effect. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So any other points anybody wants on appeals? I see that the current ones are all dismissed or withdrawn. Very well done there. OK, so if there's no Further questions on that, we come to the end of the meeting. Yeah, the dog agrees with that. I hear in the back. Dog says go. <laughs> yeah, dog says go. Let's go. So thank you for everyone who has attended. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you, officers. Another long day. What are we? Seven and three quarter hours. Uh, so well done everybody and I'll see you again at our next meeting which I think is on the 11th of November okay thank you very much we're finished thank you chairman thank you, thank you chair. well, thank you.